good to go, Mr. Chair, if you are. Okay, thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Planning Committee. It's June 16th. And there is a tornado advisory, so we'll hope to maintain power throughout all this and that everyone stays safe out there. So we'll jump right into our first order of business, which is a public meeting on uh, 4085, 4091, and 4097 Bath Road. And before we do that, I'll read the notice of collection, which outlines how all of this takes place. And then we'll get into the file. So notice of found on page two of your agenda. Personal information collected as a result of the public meetings are collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to uh, assist in making decisions on this matter. Persons speaking at the meeting are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Additionally, interested members of the public can email the city clerk, who we just heard from, uh, Ms. Fawcett, or the assigned planner, who we'll hear from later on, if they wish to be notified regarding a particular application. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning Services, Mr. Park. And I realized uh, we didn't uh, hear from the clerk about us tonight, so we'll do that in a moment too, so the public is aware of the staff who are with us helping with the meeting. Public meeting reports. The first portion of tonight's meeting is to present planning applications in a public forum as detailed in the public meeting reports. These re reports do not contain a staff recommendation and therefore no decisions will be made this evening. Following presentations by the applicant, the meeting will be open to the public for comments and questions. Comprehensive reports on the other hand, which is what we're dealing with uh, in the second portion of tonight's meeting uh, is containing a staff recommendation and the recommendations typically go to approve with conditions or to deny. After the planner's presentation, committee members will be able to ask questions of staff, followed by members of the public. Following the question and answer period, this committee then makes a recommendation on the applications to city council, who has the final say on the application. Following a council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the Ontario Land Tribunal, but the person or the public does not make oral submissions, so present here tonight at the public meeting, or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. So, Madam Clerk, can you uh, give us a rundown of who we have with us tonight, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, just to check again, you can hear me? I can. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, joining us this evening, we do have our full retinue of the planning committee this evening. From staff are Tim Park, Director of Planning Services, James Barr, Manager of Development Approvals, Lindsay Lambert, Senior Planner, Mike Slaggy, Planner, Jenna Morley, Director of Legal Services and City Solicitor. We also have uh, Blair Johnson as our meeting host, and I am Elizabeth Fawcett. I'm the committee clerk for planning committee. We also have with us currently eight uh, consultants to assist with the files this evening, and we have 49 members of the public watching from the gallery, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And with that, we will call this public meeting to order on those addresses already mentioned on Bath Road and turn it to staff and the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to this uh, public meeting this evening for 4085, 4091, and 4097 Bath Road, I can confirm that notice was given in accordance with the Planning Act as detailed within the public meeting report. We have received approximately eight pieces of correspondence to date, and they are included in Exhibit I of the uh, public meeting report, as well as the correspondence section of the main agenda and the addendum. This is a statutory public meeting held under the Planning Act, and the purpose is to, uh, for the applicant to present their proposal and for, uh, to Planning Committee. Uh, the format of the meeting allows members of the public and planning committee to ask questions of the applicant regarding their proposal and gives the applicant an opportunity to respond to those questions. As part of this public meeting, planning staff has prepared a public meeting report summarizing the proposal. It should be noted that no recommendations or decisions are being made this evening regarding this report. <laughs> planning staff are in attendance this evening to record questions 
being asked of the applicant or to address technical questions regarding the planning process. The questions asked by the public and planning committee, along with any written submissions will be addressed by planning staff within a comprehensive report. After the technical review and assessment of the proposal by the city has been completed, planning staff will bring a comprehensive report with recommendations back to planning committee at a future date. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lambert. And we'll look for the applicant to pop up. Uh, hello, good evening. Hi, good, good evening. evening, Ms. Powder. Thank you. After you. Uh, my name is Latoya Powder. I am the planning consultant for Armitage Homes Limited. Uh, today, I'll be presenting to you our uh, proposal for an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for 4085, 4091, and 4097 Bath Road. Uh, tonight with me, I have uh, John Armitage, uh, the owner and operator of Armitage Homes. And I also have uh, members from our consulting team to help uh, answer any questions once we get to the question and uh, answer period. Next slide, please. So to give you a little background, uh, on June 7th, last week, we had a public, uh, public open house to kind of get feedback from the from members of the public. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, people from the workers at uh, Edith Rankin Church for being able to accommodate us. And thank you to everyone who showed up. We had about 50 people uh, in attendance, uh, mostly residents from the surrounding area. And we were also able to have people who work in the area but could not afford to live in the area. Uh, in general, there was support for residential development here. There was support for the form of housing that we're trying to provide. And there was support to have more neighbors in the community. Some of the recommendations and comments that we did receive was uh, concerns around traffic, number of vehicle spaces, uh, housing affordability, lack of a second access to Bath Road, removal of trees, and placement of the stormwater pond. Next slide, please. To give you an overview of where our site's located within the city of Kingston, it is within the urban boundary. It's located within District 3, Collins Bay, Bay Ridge. And it's primarily, uh, and right now, Collins Bay, Bay Ridge is primarily uh, housing forms of low density and it's uh, wooded areas. Next slide, please. And so when we zoom in, you can see that the site is located close to transit. It's within uh, 600 meters to the community, uh, commercial, commercial uses to the west, just uh, to the east next to Collins Bay. And then again, it's kind of surrounded by uh, low density residential to the north, to the south, and to the west. At the moment, the forms of housing in this area are primarily like one to two story dwellings that are primarily single detached housing, semi detached forms of housing. And there are also two bus stops that are located just right on uh, Bath Road. Next slide, please. Currently, the zoning on the site, it's general commercial, residential type one, and D for development. Next slide, please. In context of the official plan, the site is designated residential, and it does have an environmental protection area along the uh, Collins Creek area. And under the Natural Heritage B map, there are significant woodlands, which is located uh, again along Collins Creek. And then the remainder of the site is under a contributory woodlands designation. Next slide, please. So the intent of our application is to rezone 8.5 hectares of land to allow for future residential development and an official plan amendment to also remove a site-specific policy designation from the 4085 Bath Road. This would allow for 4085 Bath Road to retain 1.23 hectares uh, fronting onto Bath and then it would allow for 4097 Bath Road to retain approximately 10 hectares which would be south of our development and north of the CN Rail. Next slide please. So here we could see that you know we're trying to propose 19 single single 19 zero lot line single family homes 
14 single family homes and 138 stacked townhouses. There would be 306 parking spaces for the, the residents, and there would also be a park and a stormwater management facility. We would also provide improvements to Station Street, and in addition, the intent is to allow for future residents to be surrounded by trees. So this development does provide a unique opportunity where we could have new housing, but it will be surrounded and by existing trees. And again, the intent is to try to provide a diverse form of housing types so that this helps with affordability and being able to attain housing. Next slide, please. So for the next three slides, I'm going to show you examples of the type of houses that we're proposing. So this is the zero lot line single detached. Uh, the idea with these is typically it's a smaller single family home. So typically they are 17 to 1900 square feet. They do have a one car oversized garage and it also provides a one car parking space. And usually these units are three bedrooms uh, and, and it's usually like a, and it also has a 1.5 meter side yard and a zero side yard to the other side. Uh, next slide, please. So we're also proposing these single unit stack townhomes. And the idea with these is that it's a three bedroom unit or a two bedroom unit. And then there's also space for a two car garage along with a two car parking space. Usually these units range from 1,200 square feet to 1,500 square feet. Next slide, please. And these are the three unit stack townhomes. And the idea with these is that they provide more of a, a two bedroom unit on the ground floor and then another two bedroom unit kind of underneath. But there's also an opportunity for a three bedroom unit to uh, occupy the top two floors. And the thing with these ones is they don't have an attached garage. So instead, a resident would have to kind of have a surface parking space or they could choose not to have a car at all. Next slide, please. So some of the benefits of condominium ownership is um, there are fewer maintenance and repair requirements for, for, for tenants or for residents. Um, they also allow for higher architectural guidelines and finishes. So not everyone would have um, something that's kind of out of place. And then the other thing is affordability. So compared to fee simple ownership, where people are required to purchase their house and the land, condominium residents, they own the home, but then they share the cost of the land with their with the neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. And some of the and this was kind of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment that we're looking for. So the reliefs being requested are uh, permitted uses, lot area, frontage, uh, side yards. And the reason why we're requesting these uh, requesting these reliefs is because the zoning bylaw doesn't contemplate this form of compact development. So, for example, under permitted uses, what we're changing is we want to add stacked townhomes. Under lot area, the zoning bylaw requires 2,500 square feet minimum for a townhome. We'd like that to be 1,000 square feet. And then when it comes to lot frontage, uh, the bylaw requires like 50 feet, uh, 70 feet, and 38 feet for uh, a single family or a road dwelling. And so the idea with this is we'd like to amend it so that minimum single families could be 37 feet and a stacked townhome could also be uh, 37 feet. Next slide, please. So under the official plan, uh, these are just some of the schedules that we would uh, compare the proposal to to kind of ensure that we are meeting and complying with these policies. And this proposal does comply with the policies uh, listed here in, from the official plan. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to kind of reiterate, the, the official plan amendment that we're requesting is to remove the site-specific policy designation from the 4085 bath. Um, the site is already designated for residential use. Next slide, please. And then under the provincial policy statements, this is a sample of the policies that it supports. So it supports efficient developments and land use patterns. It supports compact forms of development. It supports density for new housing being close to transit and other public infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, so to summarize, this, in our opinion, this is good land use planning as it, you know, provides a compatible form of development in the area. It's within proximity to transit routes, schools, uh, church, 
and other commercial amenities. And it supports the guidelines of the provincial policy statement. Next slide, please. And that's everything for my presentation today. Uh, looking forward to taking any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Powder. So indeed, what we'll do now is turn to members of the public. Each individual who wishes to speak can have five minutes to do so, and I'll time that and keep a strict limit on it just so we make sure we're fair for everyone. And after, let's say, five folks have spoken, then we'll give the proponent and Ms. Powder an opportunity to respond to those questions. So members of the public, there isn't crosstalk with the planner here tonight, but definitely we're taking into consideration everything you say and you have up to five minutes to say it. Madam Clerk, is anyone registered at this point to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, we do have a couple hands raised already, but for those uh, who are joining us this evening that would like to speak to the current application on the floor, we do require you to raise your hand in Zoom so that we may call on you. This is found in the center of the Zoom window when you move your mouse over the screen. So with that, Mr. Chair, um, I will start with Celeste Booth. And I'll quickly jump in in a, a friendly reminder from the notice of collection that we do require a name and address to kick things off for every speaker, please. Okay, hi, my name is Celeste Booth. My address is 815 Wartman Avenue. And I'm here to speak about how this, uh, this development is an opportunity to take a balanced approach to development. Next slide, please. So what is a balanced approach to development? Well, it prioritizes intensification, affordable housing and protecting natural heritage features. Our official plan and our provincial policy statement say that these policies are all important and all must be given to weight. Next slide, please. What approach has been taken in Kingston? And instead of a, a balanced approach, um, intensification has been prioritized over protecting woodlands. In fact, a recent staff report has advised council to do so. In the last one and a half years, approximately 20 woodlands have been lost or will be lost in the development. Is this a legacy that council wants to leave for future generations and to be remembered by? If we have any hope at addressing the climate emergency, we must prioritize both intensification and protect our remaining forests, not one over the other. Next slide, please. Why is this woodland so important? Well, this woodland is connected to other natural heritage features, including water, waterways, Collins Creek and Lake Ontario, and is part of the larger significant woodland and wetlands called Mile Square Block. The woodland size should be considered part of the adjacent significant woodland across the railway and not as a separate entity. The Conservation Authority comments support this, and certainly birds and mammals use this ecological corridor and the tracks is not a significant barrier. Another reason it's important is that these trees are likely to be much older than they appear. Um, Queen's ecologist, Dr. Rudolf Harmson walked Miles Square Block years ago and commented that this is likely old growth forest and that these trees may appear smaller due to the shallow soil and the limestone base. As you may recall, woodlands need to meet only one of five defining criteria to be deemed significant and thereby unsuitable for development or site alteration. This woodland meets more than one of these criteria. It meets three, and it should be considered significant based on its size and its connectivity to other natural heritage features and likely also age. So it's going to be important to have these trees core sample to determine the age. Next slide, please. Please consider this important statement by Greta Thunberg. Forests are not renewable, whatever the industries may say. Trees are renewable, not forests. Next slide, please. Remembering Greta's statement, why does Kingston consider saplings to be equivalent, equivalent to mature trees and forests? It seems preposterous to propose a one-to-one -one or even a two-to-one replacement value of a sapling for a mature tree, which is the approach we take in Kingston when we clear mature forests for development. All of the assets that forests provide, including shade protection, carbon sequestration, air pollution filtration, energy savings, mental health benefits, not to mention their ecological values, will take saplings decades, if not centuries, to be equivalent, if ever. Many saplings do not even survive, not to mention the loss of habitat for wildlife and biodiversity until the saplings become mature woodlands. Next slide, please. And at this property, the tree inventory has identified 738 mature trees, including sugar maple and white elm, 
in a diverse forest ecosystem, which would be lost to the, due to, to the development. And our tree bylaw would require only 945 saplings to be planted on the property. Or if that's not possible, simply a fee would need to be paid to the city. That is not even close to replacing the ecological function of a mature woodland. Next slide, please. Kingston's forest cover targets in our official plan. We have committed in our official plan to doubling our forest cover by 2025. This means approximately trying to achieve a 40% forest cover. Our most recent studies show that we are at 21% cover, forest cover, but in fact, that number does not include the 20 forests that have been lost in the last one and a half years. So we are not increasing our forest cover, we are losing, we are decreasing it. Environment Canada guidelines say that we need a minimum of a 30% forest cover to maintain our watershed health. So it's not only forests at stake here, it's our watershed health. So we can no seconds, please. afford to, to clear contributory or significant woodlands. So suggestions for this development, keep the existing woodland intact, including a surrounding buffer to be consistent with our official plan requirements, increase proposed density of the housing units in the non-forested area, and ensure at least 25% is affordable housing and rent controlled to meet our official plan requirements. Thank you for listening to my concerns and I've included some additional slides for your review. Thanks. Thank you very much with one second to spare. Very well timed. Thank you for the slides. Clerk, who's next? Mr. Chair, through you next to speak is Kathleen O'Hara followed by David Cubito. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Kathleen O'Hara, 91 King Street East. I'm with No Clear Cuts Kingston, founded last year to stop Jay Patry from cutting down 1,800 trees on the former tannery site. That is still our main focus, but as Celeste Booth stated, we've uh, identified 20 areas across the city with past or proposed clear cuts. Tonight, we are dealing with one of these, of course, um, where 700 plus tree mature trees are threatened. Um, yes, first slide, please. Thank you. If you look at this map, you can see where there are woodlands of over one hectare in Kingston. It's not very impressive. And the green areas are private. At the rate we're going, how many of these will be threatened? City planning isn't just about facilitating private developments. It's about creating a safe, livable city. Next slide, please. Many of us have heard about the recent study by the Intact Center at the University of Waterloo. It warned of future extreme heat deaths due to the climate crisis and said Kingston is one of 15 areas most vulnerable. Next slide. It talked about nature-based ways of preventing and mitigating this heat rise. In other words, trees. Next slide, please. We should heed this warning because a year ago, 619 people died from extreme heat in BC. Next slide. Do we want Kingstonians to be faced, forced into cooling centers or even die? Next slide. Or would we prefer to depend on the efficiency and effectiveness of trees? Next slide. Please note these numbers. Trees make a difference. Next slide. Summer hasn't even begun and look how many people are already suffering south of us. You Miss O'Hare, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we've lost sound for you. So I'll just pause your, your time for a second here and give you a moment to try your mic again. Hello. Oh, there we go. Yep, you're back. So I, I had stopped your time. So maybe pick up from where you were about 30 seconds ago, please. And you can have another three minutes. Okay. Next slide, please. Most clear cutting in Kingston is done in the name of intensification. I also oppose the 4085 Bath Road proposal because there are virtually treeless properties closer to downtown and services on or near Montreal Street. Why are we ignoring these potential sites, some of them city owned? Next slide, please. And where there are trees, we should be insisting that developers build around them as much as possible. Next slide. 
uh, a little humor. We can have we can have homes and trees. It's a matter of political will. We have to develop a whole new way of thinking, one that will help us survive the climate crisis. Other societies managed to do it. Next slide, please. We simply can't continue with business as usual, where, for example, this lovely woodlot at Princess Street and Sydenham Road was turned into this. Next slide. But it looks like these clear cuts will continue. Next slide. On Portsmouth Avenue, where development is proposed. Next slide. And 1177 Montreal Street. Next slide, please. And of course, there are the 1800 trees plus wildlife on the tannery site. Next slide, please. We need these threatened trees and those at uh, 485, et cetera, Bath Road. They are tools for our survival. To destroy them is to betray the very citizens you have taken responsibility for as leaders. I'm sorry to sound alarmist, but these are alarming times. Next, um, this slide. This is a tree that was trimmed by the, sorry, can you go back? This is a tree that was trimmed by the city beside my apartment two weeks ago. We have to do something differently, things differently. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, who is next? Mr. Chair, next to speak is David Cubito, followed by Nick Stefano. Good evening, everybody. Maxine and David Capito, 4105 Bath Road. So our, our concerns is, has the developer thought about the Bath Road residents as a subdivision? We are a subdivision. We are no different than any other subdivision in, in this area. Our difference is that we have a highway going through our homes. Our neighbors all want to be safe. We don't feel safe. We don't feel safe now. When you're adding 300 cars onto a very busy highway, how are those cars going to be controlled? I've worked, I've worked in, in construction for many years. When I go out my driveway, I have to be very careful that I don't get hit. Built. I'm not sure if you're aware of that Amherst U has expanded greatly and is still expanding uh, in the lower parts, which is dumping on an excessive amount of cars now. So I literally have to wait in my driveway I do usually start early, but if I start at 7.30, I could wait my driveway up to five minutes to be safe to go out onto Bath Road. And my, note, my neighbors are very similar. One of my neighbors has actually been hit and I was almost hit about three weeks ago broadsided because I thought I would try to get out. So we're unsafe now, but as the developer thought about how he's gonna protect our neighborhood before the subdivision is put in or the city. There, it was suggested that there might be a new set of lights at Station Street. That would be detrimental to what we're doing. We're waiting to get out of our homes now. By putting another stoplight within footage of Collins Bay, all you're gonna do is plug traffic more. So with the increased traffic of Amherstville from Fairfield and all those new subdivisions, with this increase, you're gonna paralyze us as neighbors paralyzed. And when this community decides to have younger families move in with younger children, what's going to stop them from being hit and killed with this increased volume of traffic? Again, please understand the area. If you do put a set of traffic lights at Station Road, you will then plug Collins Bay Road. There's 100 trains per day that go through Collins Bay you will be plugging traffic past Taylor Kid for us to access to our homes. Asking people not to block our driveways won't help, but will help is to protect us by new signs, by slowing the speed down, by the police monitoring it, by putting cameras in. What, what, what are the plans to help 
us as neighbors in our community. I haven't heard of one in this report. The wildlife has been discussed by a couple folks tonight. We can only stand beside them. What's gonna to happen to our coyotes, our raccoons, all the animals, our deers, where are they gonna go? You know that some of these animals can be rampant. What's gonna to happen to our children? Coyotes have attacked young children. So what's the plan to protect us? And what's the plan to direct nature to continue to live? The light pollution, which will increase to the outdoors. None of this has been considered by the developer. What is MTO's plan to handle this increase of traffic? Turning lanes? So we, we as Maxine and I, don't see any of these considerations. We see a developer that's gonna work within a bylaw to put in an additional 300 cars on the bath road and not considering one of this, one of the bath road community people for their safe health and safety. Thank you for the time for listening. Very much. We'll have two more speakers and then we'll take a moment to go to the proponent to hear responses to these comments, concerns, and questions. So Madam Clerk, can you remind me who was next? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through your next to speak is Nick Stefano, followed by Stephen Kelly. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Nicholas Stefano, and I look at I live at 683 Elmer Crescent. That's K7M6L7. Um, I previously submitted a letter to the city that outlined some of my concerns in more detail, but I wanted to take the time to reiterate those concerns and ask some questions of the applicant. My concerns are primarily related to the environmental impact of this proposed development. Um, if we can move to the next slide, um, to start, uh, the scoped environmental assessment is, in my opinion, severely lacking. Um, I, you can see the section on fish habitat up there now, which was kind of particularly upsetting to read. I have a few, uh, I have a few uh, lines highlighted there, but really the entire section was, was troubling, in my opinion. Um, I'd like to take the time just to share a few images of the fish that, that do spawn in Collins Creek when, in the spring and fall when the water levels are high, despite what the environmental assessment uh, says. If we can move to the next screen, um, there's a salmon. Um, next slide. Uh, trout and pike, and the next slide, um, bowfin and white sucker. And, and I want to point out that all of these images were taken in Collins Creek. Uh, the first image of a salmon was taken approximately 30 meters from the proposed stormwater pond. So these aren't just images off Google, you know, Google images of what a salmon looks like. These are actually from this area. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, this is uh, kind of my first question. And, and is the developer able to share a more detailed plan for the environmental work that they intend to undertake? And I understand that there is plans, for, that there are plans for more work, but it hasn't really been outlined as far as timeline, you know, months of the year, number of days, level of involvement from CRCA. I think that would all be helpful information uh, for residents. Um, if we can move to the next slide, um, the second issue that I'd like to raise uh, is that a portion of Collins Creek flows underground through the development area. And as evidence of this, this is another image, uh, roughly 30 meters from the development site, um, planned development site um, uh, of water coming out of those limestone cliffs where the development is proposed. Um, for those who are familiar with the area, there's a cave just north of the proposed development where water enters. Uh, and it comes out at numerous points uh, along these cliffs. And, and I think there seems to be this suggestion that, you know, the creek is over here, the development is over here, and that they're completely separate. And I don't know that it's that simple, uh, you know, in particular when you have an applicant planning to put in underground infrastructure, water mains, gas lines, uh, sanitary sewer. Um, and that brings me to my next question, if we can move to the next slide, and that is, has the developer done any study of groundwater in the area that they want to rezone? Uh, you know, has the impact uh, of this underground source of water, including risk of contamination, changes to the flow of water in the above ground uh, sections of Collins Creek been considered? Um, I think this is something that warrants review, and I haven't seen anything about it in the application documents. Um, if we can move to the next slide, uh, the other area, and, and I'm kind of, uh, you know, I know some others have already mentioned this, is the significant loss of trees, in particular in, in close proximity to Collins Creek. You can see how heavily wooded that area is. I mean, I know the environmental assessment points out that the houses are fairly far away from the creek, uh, but the stormwater pond certainly is not. 
um, and there's a significant number of trees being removed to put in that pond. Um, the assessment points out that there's a cliff between the, the development and, and the creek, but I don't really see the relevance. Water flows downhill, contaminants flow downhill, erosion happens downhill. And, and I mean, particularly when you've got bare or almost bare limestone, um, wouldn't a greater setback be beneficial? Uh, and if uh, next slide, please. Um, that's my next question is really just about the setback. I mean, right now it's 30 meters, maybe even less. You know, would 50 meters, 60 meters maybe be more reasonable a rework there to kind of move things back and save more trees and, and increase that buffer? Um, if we can move to the next slide, uh, I had a few questions just about the northern parcel. I know this isn't specifically being developed here, but I, I think it is relevant. And since we're talking about zoning, and if we can move to the next slide, I had two questions related to this. The first one is what kind of construction activity is expected on the parcel that's north of the CN rail line? I see that the application documents do show that there's, it appears a water main being extended under the CN tracks. So presumably there's some construction, would like to better get a better idea of that. And my, my last question, this is really probably more for the city, but what are the long-term plans for the parcel north of the CN rail line? Uh, some, but not all of the properties uh, zoned EPA. Um, has the city ever considered pursuing an extension to Lawrence Park? I understand it's the same owner. Three so seconds, please. Thank you. Uh, south and north. And, and, you know, if the owner's willing to sell, I mean, maybe something can be worked out there. I think an extension to Lawrence Park would be fantastic. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to you as well. And we'll have one more set of questions from the public and then Ms. Powder will turn to you. Mr. Chair, next to speak is Stephen Kelly. Um, good evening, people, uh, councillors. Uh, Councillor uh, Kylie, how are you? Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to call into this meeting. I've studied the proposal. Um, I don't see anything here that's inconsistent with much of how the city has been developed over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years or so. In fact, I find it largely consistent with how suburban development has taken place in the former township of Kingston, where considerable development took place in the Reddendale area, Henderson, Old Henderson, etc. And then over time, um, large areas of land, smaller areas of land were developed uh, in, in large scale infill, small scale infill. And it, we've, we've seen this done in this area. Uh, we've seen it done well, and I think that's the intention of the proponent and the landowner. Um, and the our, our Armitage uh, developments have uh, have done some great developments in Trailhead, for example. There was considerable controversy around the development, but I think after 15 or so years of it being in place, I think it's it has enhanced the area. Similarly, with Smuggler's Cove. The development at the top of Collins Bay at Princess Street. Uh, so I think you'd expect to see a replay of those developments and they're fine and they're, and they're done appropriately and mitigated appropriately in terms of uh, the city staff and bylaw and planning, etc. Uh, as for some of these other issues, uh, you know, traffic on Bath Road, it's going to be a big problem, um, particularly when people are uh, in a hurry to get home in the evening and it becomes a racetrack. Uh, I think that's you know more of a law enforcement issue, perhaps dealing with some traffic analysis to see what can be done to essentially slow people down. But that's not the, that's not the fault of the developer. Uh, it'll play a role, I'm sure, in the, in the context of the signalization issues at Station Street. Um, but that's not something that I don't think needs to be a barrier to this development. Uh, so I would encourage the city to approve this uh, approve this application, you know, subject to the uh, to the appropriate oversight by staff, etc. Um, and if there was other things that the city needed to do on traffic, I'd urge them to do that. Uh, at the end of the day, there's just a couple of other things I'd mention. First of all, these infill type smaller micro developments. The city should be working with developers like Armitage to find other locations for these kinds of developments. They make a whole lot of economic sense from a capital phys physical infrastructure point of view. It also uh, helps uh, with the uh, terms of housing variety 
um, whether you're a track developer, you build a certain type of house, but if you're in this kind of business of infill on a smaller scale, you'll, you'll build a different product and a different product is always better in the, in the marketplace than just, you know, one product to select from. Uh, so I would work with developers such as John. I would also encourage the city to start to get ahead of some of the really significant issues dealing with future development across Collins Creek in land that is all privately owned and land that will be subject to development pressures, increasing development pressures going forward. And as soon as we get to those issues, and mycological issues, species issues, the, 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 the tree canopy, for example, um, the better as far, I, as far as I could tell, um, because they're, uh, they're gonna come at the city fairly, fairly soon and you know, ignoring the issues that are there are just, just not, I don't think is a, a prudent thing to do. So I like the seconds, development. Please. I think it should be uh, approve the development and, and get on with all this, this other important work in terms of traffic and what happens to Collins Bay or Collins Creek over the, over the course of the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. So we will look to Ms. Powder to comment. And usually what I do, Ms. Powder, as you know, I believe, is I'll give you the equal amount of time as the public had if you need to take it all. So we've had five speakers at five minutes, so up to 25 minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the comments and feedback. Um, again, we're here to listen and understand the, the concerns from the public and from committee members. Um, so to start, Celeste, uh, thank you for coming to the public open house last week. We appreciated the comments that you provided and the recommendation to go out and do tree coring. So that was one of the first things that we did do uh, after the public open house was we did send out our ecologist to go and do some tree coring. And what he kind of came back with was that uh, a lot of the that he was able to find 47 trees that met the criteria of uh, the for it to be considered a significant woodland. So he was explaining to me that the threshold for the number of trees to be significant is considered to be 10 or more trees. And unfortunately, our site didn't have that. He said that we would require to have at least 70 trees in our site that would have been that would have met the 50 centimeters DBH or over. And our site had 47 trees. And he kind of commented to me that, you know, 20 of our trees were, 20 of these trees were in good health and 21 were in moderate health and the rest were in uh, poor health. So one of the reasons how we were able to pick this site specifically and the area was that, you know, we kind of recognized that the majority of the mature trees was kind of further south of, of where we're proposing to, to do development. And so, so again, like uh, we, we thank you for, for that comment and that recommendation to go out and, and do the tree coring. Uh, for Kathleen or Hera, thank you for your comments. Uh, so we're not ignoring the vacant sites that are on Montreal Street. We, we don't own those sites. And if, if we did own those sites, we, we would work with the owners to kind of see how we could develop them. Um, and typically if a site is left vacant for so long, there's typically some type of reason or why that site has not been been developed. Uh, for David Cupido, uh, I was going to have our traffic engineer, Cassell Prince, kind of respond to comments regarding traffic and, uh, and, 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 and signalization. So I was hoping, Cassell, if you could uh, raise your hand so we could unmute you. Okay, Cassell, are you there? Yes, um, can, can you hear me? Um, yes. Pleasant, pleasant good afternoon to members of council and all those in attendance. So I'd just like to start off by trying to alleviate um, some of the concerns of the residents with regard to the amount of traffic being generated from this site. One of the correlations that most of the individuals have mentioned with regard to traffic is the 300, um, 300 trips or 300 vehicles coming or going the site. What has been what has taken place here is that there's been a direct correlation by residents with what I would like to believe would be the number the number of parking spaces proposed for the development. Unfortunately, although there is some correlation between parking and trips, there isn't the direct correlation that is being made. So, the number of units as presented today 
we would see that there's 164 units being proposed for the development. As such, if it is that you do um, tip, um, apply typical traffic engineering practices to forecast the amount of traffic that will be generated, what we see is that the site will, in fact, during the morning period, generate 77 trips, and in the afternoon, generate 98 trips. And the periods that I'm talking about would be the times along the roadway that you would see the highest amount of traffic on the roadway. And this is what we typically assess to determine um, the, the most significant impact that the development would have on the surrounding road network. So although the site does propose 300 plus trip um, parking spaces, this does not equate to 300 um, vehicles leaving the site. In addition to that, they also will need to take into consideration the development as a whole would be gradually brought on stream in phases. So all the development would not take place at the same time. As such, over time, as residents move in, they would gradually become acquainted with traffic patterns in the area. And as everybody can attest, everyone doesn't leave to go to work or come home at the same time. So as such, although you have 164 units for the development, when you do look at that peak period in terms of that maximum amount of traffic being generated from the site in a one hour period, you're gonna have, we're seeing, uh, we, we are forecasting 77 trips in the morning and 98 trips in the afternoon. So that was, that's one of the key things that we would like to highlight as it relates to the traffic. Taking a step further with regard to the operation of Station Street, all traffic is going to access the site via Station Street um, via two access points, one north and one further um, south on Station Street. As such, once we look at the distribution of this traffic at the Station Street and Bath Road intersection, um, we understand that some of this tra traffic would go east towards Collins Bay and some of this would go west. Once we've assessed the turning movements of this, of this traffic in addition to um, other development in the area based on the information that we have been provided, we've seen that the analysis indicates that currently for this access, given the, um, the level of development, we would see vehicles needing about 16 seconds to exit Station Street onto Bath Road. Under future conditions with the addition of site traffic from the proposed development, this will increase to a peak, a peak delay of a, approximately 20 seconds. So the change in delay for vehicles to access Bath Road from Station Street will not increase significantly. And based on this analysis, we've um, determined that the, the future operation of this intersection is going to be acceptable. As it relates to signalization of the intersection, there, there's a process to determine if an intersection should be signalized. And one of the two, um, one of the two key things that are taken into consideration would be collisions at the intersection in addition to the amount of traffic at the intersection. Now, given that um, you know, there isn't a lot of development within Station Street, we're working with historical information, which indicates there is not um, significant, any type of significant collision history at this location. So the next thing we would also look at with regard to signalization would be tra traffic volumes. Based on the analysis on the process for determining if a signal is warranted at this, that, at this location, those warrants haven't been met. So taking into consideration on the unsignalized conditions and forecasts for future operation that the delays the traffic is going to be 20 seconds to act to turn onto Bath Road from station and the volumes themselves do not trigger warrants for a signal to be implemented. We recommended that future operation continue under unsignalized conditions. And um, we also have not recommended any turning lanes given the volumes of traffic turning from Bath onto station. I hope this would have um, answered or addressed comments that would have been, um, that would have been provided to the council today.
Thank you, Casal. Um, so I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Stefano's comments. Uh, there will be a more detailed uh, plan. We have worked closely with uh, CRCA. I understand that um, a member of CRCA and our ecology team were out on the site last week, uh, walking around to observe um, the characteristics on the site. Uh, at the moment, we, we are considering a greater setback from, from the Collins Bay, but that would be in consideration with um, feedback from our ecologists and uh, members of the CRCA. Uh, and then when it comes to the fish habitat, so we do acknowledge that uh, the Jason Creek provides a water route for upstream and downstream fish movement, and that all aspects of fishery ecology will be provided in the final EIA. We, we do note that, you know, there will be a separate, clear separation between the creek and the development, and there will also be uh, of intervening woodland. So there would be a portion where it would be left natural between the development and, and the creek. And so this will not degrade fish habitat uh, in, in, in the creek at all. Uh, and another thing that was kind of mentioned to me was about the salmon and the trout. So swimming upstream to spawn, he noted to me that all the species that swim upstream kind of wouldn't, would, it would end in failure because the creek temperatures would well exceed uh, temperatures thresholds for the baby fish to be able to, 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 to grow. So this is kind of one of the reasons why he, he kind of thought that the salmon, which also is kind of a non-native species and was stocked into the lake, would probably try to would, would learn the local conditions and probably wouldn't swim upstream because it knows that the water, the temperature doesn't work for being able to, to lay eggs. Uh, when it comes to construction activity uh, on the CN rail line, uh, yes, we are proposing to, to bring uh, a water line below underneath the, the CN line. And uh, I kind of have a, a member from our civil team who could speak more to that if I still have more, more time, uh, Chair. Let's say, Ms. Powder, you have about no more than 10 minutes. So okay. if that's uh, appropriate for you, that's fine. Okay, Dan, Dan LeBlanc from our engineering, uh, Mer Jocelyn Engineering will be able to kind of speak towards the, the water being, being brought and how the construction activities would be. Uh, Dan? Yeah, hi, councillors, public, and uh, I guess other members of the team. Uh, the purpose of the water being bored underneath the CN rail is that there's a 300 millimeter water main which has higher volumes and pressure than the existing 150 millimeter water main on Bath Road. And the purpose of this is to help our efforts in fire protection for the buildings and all the units. Um, I did note that there was a comment regarding the hydrant matrix, I believe from David Capito. Um, and in our servicing reports that are quite detailed in the city reviews as well as the fire department. Uh, there's different ways to reduce the required flows for fire protection, whether that be through the construction materials used in the building uh, itself, uh, things such as firewalls, and we'll address all of that and ensure that the fire flows are met for the development uh, at a time that all of these materials and flows are decided upon. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, and finally, to Mr. Kelly, thank you for your comments. And we'll definitely be taking the feedback that we've been hearing regarding traffic into consideration. Uh, and I think that's everything. That's everyone. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, Madam Clerk, do we have uh, further hands up for this portion of the meeting, this public meeting? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, we do have a number of hands still raised. And just a reminder to members of the public, if you'd like to speak during this portion, we do require you to add your name to the list by raising your hand in Zoom. With that, Mr. Chair, we'll begin with Bill Campbell, followed by uh, Philida Hargreaves. Perfect. And Mr. Campbell, before you go, I uh, hope the committee permits me here, just briefly, as Chair, I'll say, if folks have comments that have already been made, we obviously want to hear that you support that. And maybe would just encourage you to say, we also support the comments about trees that have been made previously because we've heard now Ms. Powder's response to some of those concerns. So, I mean, you're welcome to say what you want in your five minutes, but for everyone's time and the efficiency of the meeting, just an encouragement to consider lending support, but not repeating what's already been said. So 
Sorry, Madam Clerk, maybe I uh, threw folks off. Can you remind us who's speaking next? Mr. Chair, next to speak is Bill Campbell. Okay, don't hear Mr. Campbell, so we'll go to the next person and we'll have to swing back if we need to. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chair, he was still on mute. Um, Madam Clerk, you can't unmute him? Uh, unfortunate, oh, there we go. Can you hear me all right? Now I can, yes, absolutely, go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. As my submission is included in the agenda of this public meeting, I intend to summarize my comments uh, as much as I can. This proposed residential subdivision will generate 300 plus vehicles daily. <clears throat> vehicles will be directed through the subdivision road network to a relatively small municipal road, Station Street, to eventually spill out onto Highway 33. This anticipated traffic will pass directly by Collins Bay Public School. Herein lies my concerns. I'm in favor of residential development in the city of Kingston of uh, reasonable residential development. My opposition to this proposal is based on several features directly related, related to safety and traffic as outlines as follows. One, a single intersection along Station Street to Highway 33. Two, the magnitude 171 residences with 300 plus vehicles attempting to access an extremely busy Highway 33 during AM and PM rush hour periods. This will become even more dangerous, in my opinion, without traffic lights at this intersection. Three, the traffic impact study indicates that this residential subdivision will generate traffic to and from the highway based on traffic counts, et cetera. I know that this study was completed during the COVID pandemic and may not accurately predict the future traffic patterns along Highway 33. Many residents in Kingston and to the West may now be working from home and not traveling the highway on a regular basis. The traffic impact study should also consider the impact of the new highway bike lanes on both sides of the highway. Also, the public lot, boat launch ramp located across from the development, which is quite busy fall, well, I guess most of the year by uh, fishermen and et cetera. Number four, the close proximity of Collins Bay School must be a consideration when monitoring the traffic and school safety. The school has a public enrollment, I'm told, of 85, an after-school program, and a resource center. Staff and parents access the West School parking lot located directly beside Station Street. There could be safety issues related to traffic and parking. These issues should be resolved with the developer and the school board. Number five, the developer's plan. Sorry, one minute left. For more time? You developer, have two minutes left. Thank you. The developer's planner has suggested that potential traffic problems can be solved without traffic lights. The plan involves vehicles exiting Station Street easterly along Highway 33 as they enter the left turning lane before crossing into the drive through lane. This is going to create a problem, a number of problems. Right now, the traffic heading west in the middle lane will meet traffic heading east in the same lane. There are those people who will be traveling to Edith Rankin Church. They will be turning left, meeting residents from this subdivision, driving along in front of them. It, it, it's not a good situation. It's a terrible situation. Initially, the draft plan of subdivision showed two entrances, Station Street entrance, and a second entrance westerly. The second entrance is now being eliminated in favor of an interior cul-de-sac. This to me is a safety issue. And this, oh, and 
Actually, it has been eliminated, the safety issue that should raise concerns for everyone. Three subdivisions in our neighborhood, Homewood, Lawrence Park, and Ridgewood Estates each have three established neighborhood subdivisions and each has two entrances. 30 seconds, please. The second entrance is the safety valve. This is a very, very important issue. I am very concerned with the traffic issues and I'm gonna point out, I am not a traffic expert and nor is the developer's planner. We are not traffic experts. And I believe that we should have likely a, a, a second traffic uh, study completed, an arm's length study, because this is gonna be a problem likely for decades, unless it's resolved at this stage. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Campbell, that's five minutes. Mr. Chair, next to speak is Philida Hargreaves, followed by Jason Harris. Do you hear me? Um, thank you for um, the time tonight. Um, I live at 4060 Bath Road, which is on the south side of Bath Road, very in very close proximity to this development. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to um, applaud the comments from Mr. Stefano about the um, importance of Collins Creek as a, as a natural resource. It's certainly some, uh, it's an area that um, we all love and value highly. And I'd also like to point out um, that there are numerous under, underground streams going through this area so that the, um, the treatment of groundwater is um, is a particular concern for this development. The, um, and that leads to the points that I, I really want to make. I have two concerns about this development, which have, both have to do with how it is serviced. Um, the first concerns the treatment of stormwater. Um, I note that the gradient on the site is from essentially from north to south, but the Stormwater man Management Pond is on the, um, the north end of the lot. And the um, consultant's reports does, does, do actually admit that this pond is not going to deal with all the stormwater that this, um, this site will generate in, in terms of runoff. Um, and that's a concern for me, since even now we know that the drainage area along Bath Road is inadequate. Um, the, uh, in any heavy rain event, the, um, the, the water from Bath Road actually channels down our driveway and floods our garage. So um, I'm concerned about the, the amount of storm water that is, is, is not going to be uh, properly filtrated and um, simply dumped onto the Bath Road area. That's number one. The, the, second, the second concern has to do with sewers. I note that the, um, the development is, is ex, um, um, planning a link to um, the sewer that runs along the, the south side of, of Bath Road, which actually um, runs um, right within the property lines of the homeowners along that along that portion of, of, of the residence. It's, it's called a local sewer. Um, and I am concerned about the, the density of the of the proposed population um, and whether or not this sewer um, is actually going to be able to cope with the um, increased um, um, activity. Um, that's it. I don't need to take five a full five minutes. Thank you for your contributions, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chair, next to speak is Jason Harris, followed by Jeffrey Salter. Thank you for your time this evening, councillors, the applicant, and other people on the call. Um, I just wanted to weigh in and uh, say that I would like to acknowledge all of the contributions about the ecology, the wildlife, the traffic problems that are perceived 
and the safety issues associated with the school. Um, I live at, sorry, I live at 580 Rankin Crescent. I should also add that. Uh, and I frequent the corridor almost daily, uh, walking up and down along the creek there. And um, I would add that we see, we, we moved here eight months ago. In that time, we have seen 35 bird species. Most of those are fairly frequent, but there's quite a few rare uh, birds that we only see, you know, once every two months or only at certain times a year. So environmental and ecological needs to consider those things. In addition, there are bats, reptiles, snakes, or snakes are reptiles, and lots of small mammals in the area. This has all been uh, discussed by some of the other members of the public. What I'd like to discuss is the twist that the developer or the applicant is putting on the concept of affordable housing. A $500,000 house is not affordable. A $300,000 house is not affordable for people looking for housing. Two bedroom units are not houses that people are looking for. There's lots of studies, well known, that shows that affordable housing needs to have multi-bedroom units. And I often wonder why we're putting 306 parking spaces in for people who need affordable housing for 164 units. People who need affordable housing cannot afford two cars. I'm a graduate student at Queen's University and the transit in this area is simply inaccessible. There's a bus that goes by down Bath Road once every hour. This is not accessible transit. If you don't have a car, or I guess you have to have two cars here, or they're planning for two cars per unit, uh, there's not really any accessible shopping and uh, retail space nearby by transit. These are all things that are being put on for a facade to push development through in this area. If there were these kinds of supports in place, I'd be entirely in favor of this kind of development. It's needed for our society, but this simply isn't the place because of the ecological importance it's been highlighted through a report through, uh, from Queen's University that this is one of the most ecologically important zones of the entire Collins Creek drainage basin that covers some hundreds of kilometers of drainage for this part of Ontario, all funneling through this very narrow, soon to be, if this development is approved, 60 meters of creek corridor. It just doesn't really make sense given that the city is spending $400,000 just to the north on turtle fencing to protect turtles that thrive on the wetlands that are supported by this creek. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I, and again, I don't need to take five minutes either. So uh, hopefully we can let some more people speak. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I'll look for two more members of the public and then back to the planner. Mr. Chair, next to speak is Jeffrey Salter, followed by Chris Hargreaves. Yes, it's actually Anne Salter's his wife. We're on the we're both listening to the um, the conference, and we're at uh, four zero nine zero Bath Road, so right across from Bayview Farm right now. Um, one of the uh, concern is that the tree canopy area with the tall trees also if, is going to affect the um, uh, wildlife on the lake as well. Because um, in winter, for example, we've seen deers cross from Lemoyne's Point, walking across the frozen lake um, and they cross the street and they go onto uh, Mr. Clark Day's property and in that area close to the creek. So it is gonna have an effect on wildlife, not just in that area, but that's a lot of the surrounding areas and uh, any species that migrates through that area. Um, in terms of traffic, one of my concern, I'm an educator, is a lot of these uh, families in the proposed development 
a lot of the uh, kids are probably going to attend Collins Bay Public School, but they're going to have to cross Station Street, which is going to be filled with traffic. Um, so that's one of the concerns is that and right now when um, the bell rings at 310 or so out of Collins Bay Public School, we see a lot of kids crossing Station Street before they reach the sidewalk a little bit further down. So that's going to be an issue with a lot of traffic and we can't just leave the responsibility to the school board. Um, it's a very, very busy intersection already. Um, is making it worse with people having to cross the street from where we are. If our children went to Collins Bay Public School, they would be bused because uh, Highway 33 is too busy for them not to be bused unless I'm willing to walk across the street for them. Um, is there a plan for a sidewalk on the south side of Bath Road in that area because of increased traffic? That's a lot of walkers as well. So that entire new development is going to want to walk along Bath Road. They're going to walk on both sides, especially if they're going to fish or they're going to have um, a canoe and that sort of thing. If they're going to cross at some point, they're going to be walking on Bath Road on the south side and we might need a sidewalk. So I think the city has to plan for that as well. Um, is the public pier going to be serviced more right now on because I'm our property is right next to the public pier on the side opposite of the church uh, the amount of garbage we have to pick up from people boating um, it's left there is one garbage can which is probably emptied every other week in the high season if that um, there's a lot of garbage there are trees growing and the city probably doesn't have the manpower it's probably expensive and Honestly, I know they don't have the manpower to service it very well. Um, so that's going to be another issue. And people in the new neighborhood are, may decide to live there because of the proximity to the public pier, which means they're gonna go across with a heavy boat or a somewhat heavy boat, which means an extra car, right? And they might not go back to park where they live because they're gonna be there with a the trailer. And it, it's, a, it's a tricky intersection right where the pier is now. Um, in the summer, especially, well, actually from March to probably uh, the end of October. Um, and there's a lot of people fishing and it is very, very busy. The weekends are horrible. Traffic is backed up all the time and people are impatient and they're um, passing whoever is trying to get their boats backwards where because they back into the, the pier area, the pier parking lots. So it's extremely busy. And finally, um, um, Ms. Powder, you mentioned that you are considering a greater setback from the creek than 30 meters. Does that mean fewer units or does that mean higher density? Because if you're, if you have a bigger setback, you, you need either one of those, right? So I'd like to know which one you're considering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Final speaker before Ms. Powder. Uh, Mr. Chair, next to speak is Chris Hargreaves. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Hargreaves. I am, my address is 4060 Bath Road, right opposite this development. I'm also speaking as the chair of the Kingston Field Naturalists Conservation Committee. Um, so sort of a dual role as a resident, I share the concerns that the other residents have expressed. I'm also rather intrigued by the traffic engineer's comment that after careful analysis, the average waiting time to get out of Station Street to Bath Road will be 20 seconds. It takes, often takes me longer than that to get out of my driveway at the moment with the current levels of traffic. Um, and I am the husband of Philida, so it is our driveway that the stormwater comes down at the moment. And we are on this narrow sewer. I noticed in the submission to the city and the servicing report, there was a very careful calculation about how much sewage would be produced by the new development. There was absolutely no mention of how big the current sewer this is all going to go into is. Now, given that this sewer was put in about, uh, well, actually 45 years ago to serve a dozen houses, I 
surprised if it was over engineered enough that it can now be expanded to take the sewage from an extra 175 units in addition to the 12 it was designed for. The other concern I have is the stormwater management pond, which has been put in the northwest corner of the development, which is a very strange place to put a stormwater development pond, as basically they are putting it at the top of a hill in order to catch water going downhill. This area it has been put into is also described as a significant woodland by the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority. And I have spoken to the planning committee many times in the past, trying to get protection for small areas of woodland. Time and again, I have been told they are too small to be significant. This time we have a large woodland. It is part of a large significant woodland, according to the CRCA. Is it protected? No. Now we are told it is part of a big woodland. So if you develop a little piece of it, it doesn't really matter, which means that all woodland is either too small to be important or part of a big woodland that doesn't need to be important. If you decide to let this development go ahead for the stormwater management pond to be put in an area of significant woodland, what area of woodland in Kingston will then be protected? You will have opened up every tree to be cut down. Thank you. And thank you to you and everyone who gave their questions and comments. Ms. Powder, would you care to respond? And not everyone took their five minutes, so we'll keep your time a bit shorter if you would as well. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, so to address Mr. Campbell, one of the first uh, departments that we reached out to was the school board. So we've been working closely with the school board to kind of understand what the current utilization is at Collins Bay uh, School and also what the past utilization of the school has been and if there would have space to be able to accommodate future uh, kids that could uh, live in this development. Uh, in terms of, of traffic, you're correct. I am not a transportation engineer. That's why we hire transportation engineers from uh, Macintosh Perry to kind of provide our, our our reports and to kind of confirm that what we're looking at is is would be suitable for for the for this area um we did make sure that they reached out to the school board to understand what their uh school traffic needs are and what and kind of how their buses uh utilize the site uh to answer phil 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 uh, philita's question um I was going to ask Dan to kind of answer the servicing questions because I, I'm not a civil engineer. We, again, you know, we hire civil engineers who are well versed in, in these in these reports. Uh, Dan. I think you're on mute. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm already unmuted. Hi. Uh, sorry. I, I didn't get to write down the names beside each uh, comments, but it seemed that the stormwater pond was one of them. So I'll uh, start with the servicing comment, and then if it's all right with you, Latoya, I'll just uh, work into the stormwater comments. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're currently investigating the municipal capacity of the sewers. As part of our detailed sewer design, capacity will be ensured not to be exceeded by the development. This is uh, very common. It's the purpose of the servicing report to determine what developments will be able to go forth uh, prior to it very detailed development application by the owner. Um, that's the whole purpose of the servicing report. Um, as far as grading of the site, uh, when a site's developed, uh, grading can be manipulated to get stormwater into sewers. And that is why we have storm sewers throughout the development. Um, where these storm sewers go 
is to the stormwater pond, which the purpose of the stormwater pond is typically to meet the quality and quantity controls, which are determined by the government bodies, uh, such as the CRCA, which has been mentioned multiple times. And upon the review and the recommendations of the development application and the detailed design, uh, including the stormwater management report that we prepare, we design these developments to meet those requirements that are set by the governing bodies, which are the experts that everyone has been referring to up to this point. Um, the stormwater management block typically is at the end of the collection of all the stormwater uh, runoff. And the purpose for this is so that it can be treated and the quantities also can be addressed at the outlet, which is the furthest point in the system. Uh, I believe those were the questions. Uh, Latoya, you can okay. keep going. Thank you. Um, to address Mr. Harris's uh, uh, communication regarding a twist on affordability. So the way that affordable housing or attainable housing works is by providing a diverse form of housing options. So currently in this area, there's only single detached housing. And at the moment, no one can afford the single detached housing that's further uh, west on, on about Bath Road or or even further north. So the idea here is that something that attracted us to this site was that it was close to Collins Bay School. So we kind of had an idea that, you know, young families would be interested in this area. The different forms of housing that we're providing, the single detached zero lot line, the stacked townhomes, the way that works is that they compete against each other so that if you have a so a single detached zero lot line home if someone wants to purchase a stacked town home instead then that's how a developer prices their housing in developments and currently the majority of developments in kingston seem to be uh one form of housing so i've seen where it's mostly like 160 townhomes just brought on and typically they're fee simple and again that's where people have to buy their house and they have to buy the land or it's a development supporting 100 single family homes only so there's no diverse housing forms that's really being brought on and that's kind of where our development will be able to provide and kind of capture that niche market for people who don't want a 2400 square foot home or someone who wants to purchase a 1500 square foot uh, stacked townhome uh and to answer miss salter's questions regarding um is there a plan for a sidewalk on south on the south side of bath road um at the moment we haven't received any communication from the city regarding if that's something that they're looking for uh mto does kind of uh handle this seconds this handles bath road so they're the ones that we have to go to in order to be able to get our to to, to be able to get like our development uh, past their approval line. Um, and then to answer uh, Mr. Hargreaves question, uh, and I think Dan actually answered Mr. Hargreaves questions regarding uh, the current storm and the, and the storm pond placement. Uh, and one question I did want to uh, answer from Ms. Salter was if it's because we're considering a greater setback, does that mean fewer units? If anything, it would require maybe the reduction of the size of the storm pond, but it would not require fewer units or taller units. One of the reasons we stuck to three story stacked townhomes is because it fits in with what's kind of around in the neighborhood. The Bayview farmhouse is currently a three story, uh, is about a three story home. So we didn't want to overpower that with a four story apartment building or an, another form of housing that would not be compatible compatible in this area. Um, and I think that's all the questions, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you for the responses. Madam Clerk, do we have other hands up for this proper? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, we still do have a, a couple of hands raised. So again, I'll just remind members of the public, if you have not had a chance to speak yet and you would still like to do so, please add your name to the speakers list by raising your hand. Mr. Chair, we'll start with Gordon Bell. Thank you, uh, committee and uh, councillors. Uh, my concern is specifically safety. It concerns the alignment of uh, Station Street and Bath Road. Uh, currently, it's- Mr. Bell, sorry to interrupt. I'm just gonna ask for your address, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's uh, uh, 937 Lincoln Drive. 
Thank you. As I said, my concern is the angle at which uh, Station Street meets a Bath Road. Um, I frequent the uh, church across the road and uh, the middle uh, entrance. I've sat there numerous times and watched traffic turning in and out of uh, Station Street. The problem is where the way it is, comes into Bath Road at the angle Anyone, especially a school bus, turning from Bath Road onto uh, Station Street has to turn back on itself, which is a very slow maneuver. And in the case of people coming down uh, Station Street, it's at the end where they have to right, uh, square themselves to Bath Road, which means they come across the center line of uh, Station Street such that they can look left and right if they don't they have an obscured vision of traffic on Bath Road. The simple solution is at the bottom of uh, Station Street, realign it, uh, there's space there, and granted it's a school board, but you have to work with the school board, align it with the middle entrance to the Edith Rankin Memorial United Church. That way you have a, a safe entrance. It's a 90 degree for those uh, uh, going in and out of Station Street. And for those uh, uh, entering uh, Bath Road, from the, the church parking lot, they can look at the people and know which way they're going. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, next to speak is Colleen Murphy, followed by Joyce Houston. Hi there. Um, I wanted to speak today just to support some of the comments that have already been made by people like Bill Campbell, Maureen O'Hara, Nick Stefano, David Cupido, Philippa Hargreaves, Gordon Bell, and, uh, and others. Um, I have been impacted by some of the City Planning Committee's decisions in the past, and uh, I would just like to um, comment on the importance of what I think community involvement and resident uh, feedback that is um, made during these meetings. Um, and the importance of, you know, balancing the needs of the many over the needs of the few. And uh, I grew up in a green space. Um, my mother's from Collins Bay. Um, I, I value the natural environment. I fight to protect my neighborhood. I fight to protect my community. Um, and I've seen other proposals that are still under planning um, for the Davis Tannery. Um, the one at Portsmouth Avenue in Woodlands, um, the one that was part of the CKGS um, for our area, the Portsmouth Corridor. Um, you know, all these decisions affect a lot of people in this community. And, you know, I value what the other people and their, their skills are in commenting on the different factors, whether it's green spaces, trees, um, hydrology, um, safety. Um, these are things that affect people day in and day out. The short-term profiteering um, to sacrifice all of their rights and responsibilities in the name of the city development or intensification. I just want council to think and planning committee to think about the impacts they're having on people's lives, the stress that is um, in incumbent with this pro planning process and this densification need this push down from the province on the cities to do all of this work. I just would love to see planning committee listen to people um, and not, you know, there are some impressive names on here. There's Jay Patry. There is Jocelyn Engineering, there's Macintosh Perry, like we're talking about a lot of money and a lot of money that is on the table. And I just wish the engineering and the surveys and the value of the environment that is being put at stake is weighed as much as the check that's going to cross the table at City Hall. And so I'm speaking to this and um, I'm passionate about it, and I really hope that, you know, the people who speak out are heard because there's a lot of people that don't have the time or energy or the, to say anything, and I, I'm not one of those people, and I support my community, fellow community members, um, and I would like to support them 
right through this process. And I know there will, will be more and that's basically it. So thank you for your time. And just before you ask Murphy, sorry, I hope you're still there. I didn't get your address at the beginning and I'm not sure the clerk did either. If you could just state that for the record, please. Colleen Murphy, 9 Dickens Drive, Kingston, Ontario, K7M, 2M5. Um, I'd say that all, I'd like to add that this is, um, since we had the public meeting notice in November, this has become a part of my week, my month, my year, to sort of hope that there's some oversight and guidance and good common sense included in this process. Thank you. Thank you for being here and your participation. I know that committee and staff do not take lightly uh, the dedicated residents that we have in this community and the care that people like yourself um, show in coming out to, to these times. So thank you for that. Madam Clerk, are there other hands up at this point? Mr. Chair, next to speak is Joyce Hostin. Hi, thank you. Joyce Hostin, 764 Meadowood Road. And I actually walk near that on Collins Creek almost every day. Yesterday on my walk, I discovered a um, um, eternal, eternal nesting in the playground at St. Lawrence Park. This came across my Twitter stream today. It feels like I'm drowning, drowning in heat, but there is nowhere to swim, no surface to break through the air, the thing that chokes. This is from Spain, but this is the type of extreme heat that um, Kathleen spoke about next slide. Actions by communities. In that report, one of the major things that they recommended that we do is green infrastructure, which is working with nature by planting and maintaining trees. So, so that means preserving the trees that we have, that significant woodland is there. And also thinking about this development as a potential for a green infrastructure project. Next slide. So the current proposal is really gray based. It's great that it's medium density housing. I think we need so much more of this. So it's really wonderful to see a proposal like that, but it's taking conventional planning practices, which currently our city doesn't have a strategy around green intensification. But I think what if, what if this project looked at green intensification and say, how can we do it differently? How can we greenscape it instead of grayscape? Next, next slide. We're already facing undoing decades of mistakes, unrolling a lot of the grayscape that has been done. And what if with this new one, we start it from scratch in this development by greenscaping? Next slide. So green infrastructure, this is an example from Vancouver where there had been a stream there and now they are undoing that. They're putting back a stream and a wetland. Think about the cost of that versus thinking about what's there right now, preserving what's there and building upon it. Next slide. So green infrastructure for a changing climate, one of the best things we can do. Our city doesn't have a strategy, but uh, you know, the applicant perhaps could think about this and it could influence next year's city official plan. But what if we had a rain city strategy like Vancouver does? Next slide. So that's green infrastructure. That's preserving what we have, the riparian area, expanding and keeping that riparian area like some have spoken about and preserving that forest, but also in the development, including things like forest pavement, bioswales, green roofs, rain gardens, and the streetscaping. Next slide. These are all the possibilities that are listed in green infrastructure, greenscaping for medium density housing. You can see that there's very, very, so many of them. Next slide. This one is a nice summary and almost every single one applies to this proposal that could be done if the landscape architect and if the green infrastructure experts were brought in now and the design was thought through this lens. Next slide. This is an example from BC. There is a street that I understand has to be there for emergency vehicle access. In Coquitlam, BC, they did a green street that was for bikes, for walking, and the emergency vehicles could access, and it captured stormwater. So one of the issues is the size of that stormwater pond that's, that's requiring the woodland to be cut down, but all of this softscaping could potentially even alleviate the need for that pond because the land itself captures the water. Next slide. 
the, see the permeable parking spaces there. That is a possibility. Next slide. The really dense landscaping along each side, those multi layers capture far more stormwater and cool far more than our conventional landscaping. And I think grass is actually in our development guidelines forced upon developers, and it shouldn't be. Next slide. So landscape design done up front with green infrastructure that can capture and sequester carbon. Next slide. It can design for biodiversity. So look at the, the different layers in this. That could be the design along the streets, preserving the woodland and adding this where the street where the trees are being supposed. Next slide. For human health to increase the microbiome, green infrastructure is what we need for that, in addition to preserving what's there. Next slide. 30 seconds, please. So the Miyawaki Forest, which is what has inspired us. This is how Dr. Karen Mirawaki does it to protect and preserve against natural disasters. Next slide. So the, for the future of our children, for hope, the hope that they need, let's do, we can do this in smart green densification, combining the intensification with greenscaping to make, you know, get really creative with our development. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Austin. Ms. Fawcett. Mr. Chair, through you, um, I don't see any further hands at this time. I'll do another call to members of the public. If there's anyone else who has not had a chance to speak yet on this file and would like to do so, if you could please raise your hand and zoom now so that we may identify you. We have a, a couple more hands here, Mr. Chair. So we've got um, a further two hands. Uh, three hands. So I'll, I'll go to the next one if that's all right with you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think what I'm going to suggest, though, by my count, we've just heard from three people. So we'll finish these three folks and we'll take your last call there as the last call. Um, and then we'll go to Ms. Powder and then move into committee after that. So maybe I'll also say that if there's anyone else that wishes to speak from the public, please put your hand up at this point uh, because we will not do another round of public comment, but we'll make sure that we get you all in either way. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, next to speak is Vicki Schmolka. Thank you very much. Can you hear me and can you please put my slides up? Thank you. So I'm speaking in my personal capacity today. I live at 702 Newmarket Lane, which is in River Park, and I have two overarching comments I'd like to make. First is, this is an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application. So the developer is asking for a lot and you can ask for a lot in return. And I think you've heard a lot of people in the public saying that things need to improve in this application. The other thing I'd like to say is River Park is a very similar type of community with one entrance off uh, John Counter Boulevard. And right now, because of the third crossing work, we're discovering how compromising it can be when you only have one entrance to a subdivision. Um, there are only 144 units here as opposed to the 171 being proposed, but there's a lot of coming and going and there's only one lane of traffic right now. And there have to be two people on signs, if not three. So um, I think we can learn a lot from subdivisions like mine about how not to repeat mistakes. And um, that's what I hope planning committee will do here, send a message to the developer. Next slide, please. Um, there we go. So th there are a few things I haven't heard mentioned. And one is the industrial uses already on this site. There's a building um, behind the school, I think there's a commercial building. And then there is a bell um, center of some sort, uh, quite a large uh, brick building. And I think there's a tower, the, the middle arrow, there's a tower in the back, a communications tower, and of course there's a railway. And when I look at this map, I see a really natural way to protect the woodland that everyone is so worried about, which is to consider the planning boundary to be the same boundary that's used at the subdivision to the north. Um, the stormwater pond is supposed to be 1.25 hectares. That's almost three acres, I believe, and that's enormous and going to take out all the woodland that people are so worried about. So perhaps the message to the developer has to be build to the right of my little blue line here with, with intensification, maybe a little more density, maybe a little more height, um, but don't disturb the wetland and don't stray into an EPA area. Um, and I would note that the Conservation Authority has spoken against the stormwater management that's being proposed in their um, 
technical letter that was not on Dash that I had to request. Um, and actually the planning rationale wasn't on Dash either and I had to request it. So I'm a bit concerned about the city not having shared materials well here. Next slide, please. So one, one of the big questions is this development is actually putting houses behind existing houses. And this is a really big change for the city. Are we really wanting to see this kind of interior space developed, especially in an area that's EPA and not zoned for it currently? I know it's zoned residential, but that doesn't mean residential has to go there and it's not all residential. I also wonder about the road frontage. There, there isn't really, could you go back to the slide before, please? Sorry. I, okay, excellent. So, you know, in between the two arrows on the right is the station road entrance. And you can see that, you know, that's the entrance to the whole 171 units. And I'm really wondering if that's enough road frontage for a development like this. Next slide, like go back to my other one. So we have 171 units, more than 500 people accessing only through station road. And you've heard a lot about the traffic issues, but I just, there are other safety issues there. And I have already pointed out the industrial uses and their compatibility. The other thing I wonder about is this is really a privatized development. It's a condominium. Um, there's no plan to make the park public. Uh, there's no plan to have the municipality assume roadways, lightning, sewer. That's why I understand from the application. So what are the risks to the municipality when you have a subdivision like this that's completely private? What what is what is that? And are we comfortable with that? Is this kind of a gated community? Like, I, I don't know. I, I just, it, it's just odd. In my subdivision, the park is public. So anyone can come into my subdivision to, to use the municipal park. Um, and someone's already raised the issue of affordability, but I just want to point out that in my subdivision, a lot of the units are owned by investors and rented, and that actually affects affordability a lot. No one can buy into this market if, if they're really looking for a, a, a way in. It, it's, it's not really affordable. Next slide, please. Whoa, so this is what was proposed. I circled the trees that are proposed. Maybe we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the zero lot line is going to create a lot of stormwater, and it's not really clear where that stormwater is going to go. I thought I read that it was going to go right into the city system. I heard someone say earlier it's going to go to the stormwater pond. I don't think this is a really great way. The road doesn't seem to have that much room. I wonder why there are 300 parking spaces when they're only supposed to be 214, which is really increasing the hard surface spaces, 86 more parking spaces than required by, by city zoning. And when we're going the other way on parking in the whole rest of the city, um, and last slide, please, there's a proposal to reduce the length of the parking spaces. This is my neighborhood. This is what happens when you don't have enough space for parking. Um, you get cars right into this into the sidewalk so that's one of the mistakes i'm talking about thank you sorry to go right to my time you, you did that's totally fine i was just gonna say we'll pause you there but you're obviously welcome uh to share that slideshow for for the record and committee will review it and then we'll be on on the public files as well uh, in time so thank you for that madam clerk mr chair our final hand is diane kennedy uh, hello councillors um, most of what, oh, I live at 4,111 Bath Road, and my forest abuts the uh, west side of Collins Creek. These forests have been in the family for 170 years, so I can assure you that this is old growth. They have never been commercially cut. A uh, number of other things. Um, first of all, the, the uh, striation of the, the, uh, of the limestone that creates the water. Are you aware that we are on wells? These houses, we, uh, we do not have municipal water. And so um, I hope that when the subdivision works on this, that they ensure that these layers never get uh, squashed. This happened many years ago when they were uh, dynamiting the quarry, which is now the Gulf thing, and it affected our wells. So uh, you have to be very careful about that in the area. 
Um, the fish. Of course, there are salmon there. I've lived there for over 50 years and there are salmon going up those streams. Um, uh, sometimes they get caught with a little bit of low water towards the end of the year. I'm looking forward to the development because if it only takes 20 seconds to go into the traffic, it'll be a lot faster than what's happening now. Uh, I think that's interesting. And um, I guess most of what the other things I had to say uh, have been dealt with by other people. Um, yes, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. All right, Ms. Powder, over to you. Same thing as last time. If we can keep things efficient, that's great because we'll move to committee next. No, understood. Um, again, thank you for the round of questions. Uh, to Mr. Bell, we appreciate the feedback regarding the safety of the alignment at Station Street. We are proposing to widen Station Street and provide upgrades onto it. So we will definitely take that into consideration when moving on to that uh, detailed design. To uh, Colleen Murphy, uh, in terms of balancing the needs uh, for the many with the needs of the few, um, I understand completely where, where you're saying, and that's why we always like take consideration into existing residents and take their feedback and their recommendations and comments, and we incorporate that into our proposals. For us, the the few would be those who are unable to find housing. Like at the moment, it's people are struggling to find homes, and we we're passionate about about providing homes for people and building new developments and creating a space that people can call home, especially in areas where they're not typically able to afford. Uh, to Ms. Houston, Joyce, uh, thank you for coming to the meeting last week uh, at the public meeting. I, I appreciate all the feedback that you provided, especially about the, green, the gray base uh, development versus green. Something that I'm always looking into is fun city ideas, and that idea is where you put in as much green infrastructure into your projects and try to kind of soak in the water naturally and then it releases like a sponge. So something interesting is that we are going to provide street trees. We're providing a complete street cross section. So the idea of this is that it's going to be sidewalks on both sides and it's going to provide a landscape boulevard on both sides of the street. So we, we are looking into seeing how we can even preserve trees within the uh, backyards of future residences so that way they'll have a mature tree in their backyard and then the idea too is that you know people will be within 300 meters of, of a park and when people look out their windows there'll be street trees so people will be able to see trees uh, every time they look out their window and providing that that natural uh, landscape in this project is something that um, we're, we're very committed to Uh, to, to Vicky Schmoka. So um, another privatized development that's kind of similar to this is uh, Walnut Grove. They're also a condominium style development where they own their home and they share the cost of the of the maintenance with with their community. Um, I believe that their parks are also considered to be private and and so and so we're kind of trying to model this similar uh, around that project. Um, in terms of the industrial uses, uh, we did provide like noise studies to look into seeing how much noise would be generated from like that uh, Bell substation, I believe it is. And, and the noise study kind of came back saying that it, it was um, within the guidelines that are required. <coughs> uh, and then in terms of uh, the road. So yes, Station Street will be our, our main way in and out, but there will be two accesses into the subdivision. So one south of the Bell Building, and then there will also be one north of the Bell Building. Uh, and then to Ms. Kennedy, uh, I understand that a lot of the uh, single family homes in this area are uh, accessed through, does not have municipal water and it has um, well water. And I was reassured by our civil team that we would not be disturbing any of the well waters and, and that, you know, there wouldn't be any type of um, contamination or disturbance uh, that would uh, result from this project going forward. Um, I think that that was everything, and unless I missed anything. Thank you, Ms. Powder. And uh, 
committee can obviously underscore some of those questions or bring up new angles on them or anything additional as they wish. And we'll look to them to do just that. So councillors, uh, five minutes each and we can do multiple rounds as needed. And for members of the public, just to be clear on our process, councillors actually do get crosstalk opportunity with Ms. Powder and her team here tonight. Um, looking for hands. Councillor Sanic, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did just see one more member of the public that had their hand up, so we're not going to let oh. that person speak. Well, I'm, I missed it a few times tonight, and you've, you've uh, pointed that out, so I thank you for that. I can't see everyone. Madam Clerk, can you confirm that you see that on your end? Um, she just put down her hand. It was Norma McNaughton, if Ms. McNaughton wants to talk. If the hand was up after the last call and we missed it, obviously that's our bad, and I'd be happy to have that happen. Uh, Ms. Fawcett, I'm looking to you on that one because I can't see everything happening on the screen that others can. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, I have allowed um, Ms. McNaughton to um, unmute if she'd wish to. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you very much for hearing me. 628 Elmer Crescent uh, in Collins Bay. Ms. McNaughton, maybe it's just my end again, but I can't really hear you. Perhaps you could sit closer to the mic or turn your mic up. I, would, I will do that. Uh, 628 Elmer Crescent. Uh, I just had a comment. There was uh, two entrances and one, the, the southern one was Station Street and the northern one was north of the Bell Station. I am lived here 38 years. I'm not aware of an entrance on the north side of the Bell Station or the substation, I believe they call it. Thank you. Thank you for the context, and we'll consider that as we continue to move to committee. Sorry, Hank, did you want to ask questions at this point, or is that to alert us about Ms. McNaughton? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I would love to ask questions. So this is my district, um, and not only my district, it's just down the road from um, my sub, like the subdivision where I live, where I've lived for 24 years. So um, I have my questions sort of in categories. Um, the first one is um, the train tracks because this subdivision is right in, right along the train tracks. Um, it's very close to the train tracks because it's behind being built behind Bayview Farm, right? And I just wondered um, where does the eastbound train right now blow its whistle to signalize that it's coming to Collins Bay Road? Uh, I am not sure. I, I don't think I can answer that one. I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> where where it is currently blowing this whistle is to the west side of the current um, cell phone communications tower, which when you look on your concept map, it's right above road B. And road B is basically right in the middle of the subdivision. So uh, it's going to be very loud. It's going to be very loud because it's not just a couple of homes affected, right? This subdivision is 171 units that are, you know, the whistle is going to be blowing right in the middle of the uh, of the subdivision. And not only that, but this is this proposal is for cutting down 550 trees which um, those are only the trees that are greater than 15 centimeters diameter, which means that there's a whole lot of other trees that are smaller than that, that will also be cut down and trees provide great buffer to the noise. So um, there's concerns with putting so many homes right along the railway tracks, so close to where every train going eastbound, they have a sign, I don't know if everyone has seen it, there's a sign with a big W and it's to the conductor to blow the whistle. And so the berm that is being presented along, um, along the road there, uh, the lane, we call it a lane. Um, what's the purpose of the berm? 
So CN Rail requires that any new subdivisions adjacent to their rail line is to be set back 30 meters. So there will be no buildings that will be within 30 meters of, of the rail line. The berm will be a 2.5 meter uh, berm so that it helps with the noise attenuation. And also we're considering adding uh, a fence on top of the berm to kind of help provide additional mit mitigation. Okay, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So there will be a fence then protecting um, so that preventing people from trespassing over the tracks to keep people safe. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I want to ask this question to staff for the subdivision agreement that comes out of this development. Can we please put in a clause so that every homeowner who um, signs the subdivision, subdivision agreement knows that they live right next to the tracks that will be blowing whistles at the Collins Bay Road level crossing. And the reason why I say that is because these sort of things tend to get lost as homeowners come and go. And um, in 2019, I had a homeowner along Collins Bay Road who had just moved in and they did not realize that the um, tracks there were the main line. And they were saying the noise, right? We got a newborn baby, we have pets and we cannot stand the noise and they have since sold their house and moved out. So that is why I think it's very important for the subdivision plan um, to identify and make all homeowners aware that there is a line there and will be blowing the whistle. Uh, as one um, constituent just said earlier, 100 trains per day, don't know how many of those are eastbound. Councillor, I see Ms. Lambert has her hand up. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, yes, we've made note of, of that request, Councillor Osanic. Um, it's certainly something that we can include in um, a set of draft conditions uh, for, for that kind of clause to appear within the future subdivision agreement should this um, application move forward for a recommendation of approval. Thank you very much. Um, my next concern too is, um, the cell phone tower. So I know that um, the owners of Bayview Farm, they were at planning committee many years ago when the cell phone tower was being proposed because it was going right behind their property. I'm looking at the concept plan. It's going to be the pink units, which are called units D on the concept plan that will now be even closer than Bayview Farm, they will be even closer to the cell phone tower. So um, as part of the technical review, or can staff say that already um, that has been cleared by the regulations, which um, cell phone towers, communication towers are under federal jurisdiction. So are the units D, are they all within um, the um, setback distance required for a huge communication tower like the one on this property? Ms. Lambert, please. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, technical review of these applications is ongoing, um, and that's certainly something that we, we look to address through that process, and we'll speak to it through a future comprehensive report. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think it's our job as counselors to protect you know, the quality of life and the well-being of the developments that we're approving where, you know, future Kingston residents are going to be moving into. So that is why I'm raising those concerns. Also, everyone in council knows that um, we've had um, many debates over a train whistle ban. So if this development does um, get approved, I think this is um, committing the city one step further to, um, you know, implementing a train whistle ban, which this council knows is going to cost nearly $2 million to fence off the main line on the north and south side of the tracks to give the train whistle ban across the west end of Kingston. Good context. Thank you, Councillor. That's five minutes. We'll come back to you if you have more questions, um, but we'll stop you there for now. But Ms. Powder put up her hand at some point. Uh, uh, during, would you like to say something uh, through you to Councillor Stanek, I wanted to mention that in addition to having the, the train whistle as a clause in the subdivision agreement, this would also be included in the purchase agreements for the homes so that the residents are aware of what it is they're buying into. 
Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal, you're next. Thank you. And uh, both Councillor Sanic and the community have made a lot of very, very strong statements about both uh, wastewater uh, management and tree removal. And I'm looking forward to seeing that reflected when the comprehensive report comes forward, because in its current state, I'd have some hesitation in supporting this. And as far as the train whistle uh, on deed, uh, there's a strong, uh, a very strong precedent for that. Uh, over 50 years ago, when the city, when the then township was looking for city approval for uh, subdivisions close to the airport, we, uh, the city insisted that they put on the deeds a recognition so future, uh, future residents, when they bought the house, would recognize that they had no rights to demand alteration in the activity at the airport. And so there's a strong precedent for that. And I think it makes sense to do the same with, with the train whistles. So I look forward to those things being reflected in the comprehensive report. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Neal. And the comprehensive report uh, to segue, that's a good reminder that tonight, especially for members of public to keep in mind, we're not making a decision, we're just gathering and collecting information and having a small discourse, but the actual recommendation may come down the road. I've seen no other hands up. I'll give a final call for committee. Oh, Councillor Spell, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my question is, uh, it's a couple of technical questions. The first question is the open house that was scheduled for last Tuesday happened to fall on a city council event and there were many councillors that were interested in attending. And I'm wondering how that date was selected. It almost seemed it was done on purpose if you look at the comments you're receiving from the public this evening. I'm not so, sure that's a comment or a question to Ms. Powder or staff. Perhaps I'll whoever, look, I don't know who made the decision. Yeah, we'll look to Mr. Park for clarification on how that pre uh, committee meeting gets determined. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's, it's a meeting that is uh, coordinated between the applicant and between uh, planning services. Uh, it is an open house. No decisions are being made at that uh, open house meeting. Uh, the applicant presents information to the public, answers questions about their proposal, and uh, staff are only there to observe. Um, it, by no means, absolutely, was it scheduled to conflict with a council meeting. That was a total coincidence. And uh, you'd also have to take into mind uh, the attendance of councillors at these events, because if you get more than three, that can, especially from planning committee, could represent a quorum. So there are issues around that as well. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Park, uh, going forward, can you uh, review these public sessions and ensure they don't fall on council meeting dates when they're doing the planning committee? And we can work amongst ourselves to determine which councillors would wish to attend so there would not be an issue of quorum. Absolutely, Councillor Chappelle. We can uh, certainly uh, make that uh, 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 change uh, to make sure that there are no conflicts in future moving forward. Thank you. Um, the comments about uh, the fish uh, by Ms. Powder being that they were uh, not uh, germane to the, the salmon, not being germane to that creek, I, I just want to uh, alert her that uh, the biology of the salmon, I mean, there are rivers and tributaries all along the shoreline, even into Mapani, the Salmon River. If it wasn't in, in indigenous to the um, Great Lakes system, you wouldn't have creeks named the Salmon River. And so I just think you should be careful of what comments you make because there has been population 
being rebuilt because of excessive developments and shoreline degradation, which is why they do release salmon smolts into the water to try to recover the damages that were done in the past. So I just wanted to point that out. I, I, um, and the approach on that comment was a little frustrating for me. So um, a question I have is on the maps and the presentations, I was not able to delineate where the EPA zone was that showed that the significant woodland, I couldn't really delineate uh, delineate where that is. So when this proposal comes back, I would like to see some very specific lineage of where the conservation authority has said they, that this significant woodland is being impacted by this waste, by this water holding pond, um, because it's a bit misleading in the, in the way the presentation is made to show how much of this significant woodland is being impacted. So I'm asking Ms. Powder if, if she could commit to that. Yes. Yeah, we could definitely look into that and report back. Okay. Thank you very much. Just it helps the public because there's just so much information to go through. The other other um, issue that uh, I, I think was raised is is the traffic concerns, um, sidewalk concerns. Bath Road is becoming very very busy. I, 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 you know, it, it's supposedly a historic travel route. Route, route. Road 33 goes all the way. You can take the ferry across and go to Picton. So, I mean, there are some concerns that we were we spoken about the pressures of Amherst View next door, you know, looking for more affordable housing outside the Kingston footprint. So there's a lot of pressures. And so the traffic study that was done during COVID Again, I argued this with one of your previous uh, proposals um, that with a different project at 2274 Princess Street, that traffic studies done during COVID, in my opinion, in my own humble opinion, should not be considered valid by the planning staff or by a proponent trying to seriously look at a traffic study. We heard sort of tongue in cheek comments that they can't wait, that residents today uh, presented saying they cannot wait for this development to happen because it'll actually expedite their ability to leave their driveways. So, you know, it just, it, it just takes away the, from the credibility of your proposal when you have projects like this that have studies done during the COVID period. That's all. So are you asking that away. another study be done? Just to clarify that comment. Is that a question to have another study be done? Well, yes, I, you know, count, um, um, Mr. Chair, thank you for articulating my thoughts so clearly. Would there be consideration for an additional traffic study? Because it certainly was concerns raised by the residents. I believe I see Mr. Prince's hand up, not to jump the queue here, but if that's a correct person to respond. In. Thank you very much. Um, with regard to the traffic study being done during COVID, that is, uh, that is correct. However, I'd like to point out that the traffic data used for the study was co collected prior to COVID. And this is something that was reviewed with city staff to determine if the traffic data being used was appropriate. And that traffic was then adjusted um, based on when it was collected, in addition to information being collected directly from the school with regard to busing and parent pickup drop-off to determine um, to make appropriate assumptions for school traffic, because again, um, as school was out during COVID, there needed to be some assumptions related to that. However, the majority of the traffic used for this study was collected prior to the COVID period, and the COVID um, would not have affected the volumes used. Thank you, Mr. Prince. I appreciate the additional insight. Uh, do I have a little more time? Uh... About 30 seconds, Councillor. Okay, so my final, one, one of my final questions is, where is the natural gas line and will it be brought to this site? I couldn't figure that out. Is there gonna be natural gas as a heating source for these residential units? Um, Dan, could you please answer that question regarding the, the natural gas? Yeah, sorry. Um, if you look, 
at our drawing 1504 is the project number C001. We clearly show the existing gas line, which is in an easement, which um, I mean, if these, if these lots are to be serviced with natural gas, uh, it would most likely come from that gas line that's existing. Thank you for clarifying that for me and I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chappelle. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, just one second. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, so wave your hand and get a lot of buzzing and stuff, okay? I've had trouble with this. So, um, but in terms of speed, I'll, I'll do it differently. The, um, one thing that was confusing and was brought up, and I just want to get this clarified regarding runoff from the storm management pond. Um, does the water go runoff go into the storm water management pond, or does it go into the city sources eventually? Sorry, am I allowed to answer here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Dad>. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so the stormwater management pond, of course, all this design work is still uh, preliminary right now, but the stormwater management pond um, outlet, as you can see, is to the water course. So when these developments are looked at by government bodies like CRCA, um, Ministry, MTO will have comments as well on this. Um, the quantity and the quality of runoff is both assessed and requirements and recommendations are made by those governing authorities, which ensure that um, there are no negative implications on systems or water bodies that we're discharging to. And this development is no different than any other that our stormwater management for the development and our report will clearly indicate that those measures have been met. Okay, so what I derive from that is we is undecided yet. Like uh, I have to determine where where the runoff ends up. Yeah, uh, we will include that in our final report to make that more clear if it isn't already. Um, okay. As I said, it's discharged to the water course, so. If you use the MTO lookup okay. tool, which, okay. um, <laughs> yeah, okay. but we will okay. make it more clear for you in the report. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, it's just when I was reading the report, I, it, uh, it sort of hit me as well. The, um, as far as um, trees are concerned, I gather from the report that only 30 meters between the water course and the, of Collins Creek and the development is proposed to be left. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, through it's more in the concept plan, but I'm trying to determine the difference if there isn't. Uh, through you, through the chair to you, uh, yes, at the moment we are proposing a 30 meter natural setback and there won't be any uh, disturbance of uh, trees in, within that 30 meter. And are you, protect, are you infringing on the EPA? No, the EPA is within that 30 meter setback. There's yes. no intent to, to disturb the EPA. Okay. Um, I just wanted, and I'm, I'm trying to clarify things as perhaps you can appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is different remarks and different concerns. Um, now, one thing that struck me is rather odd, given that you're taking trees away and people are objecting that rather voraciously. Uh, um, when I look at the concept plan, I don't see a tree in every front yard. And uh, that strikes me as kind of odd, given mm -hmm. you know, about extreme heat and and uh, use of trees and forests and so on for ecological reasons. But the concept plan doesn't show that. In fact, there are buildings with no trees really around them. Um, the, 
there was also a conceptual landscape plan that was submitted to support this uh, development. Okay. There would be space within the front yards to plant trees. Um, again, we would be providing a tree landscape boulevard. So there would be trees and then there would be the roads which would separate people from walking um, adjacent to the road. So, so the intent is definitely to try to try to replant and preserve trees where possible. But you're also charged with replacing some, right? Yes, yes. Right. So one of the places I'm suggesting you do it, and that the staff should pay attention to, given the city strategic plan is in the front yards and the backyards. Okay, you talked about trying to preserve that, and that would be great. Okay, I think your reference was to the backyard so And your concept plan and your landscaping plan should be in sync. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Um, finally, I just want to comment about the salmon, uh, which was brought up by um, one of the first motions, I, the first motion I had passed at council when I was elected first, had to do with the province soliciting um, municipalities to support or not support uh, salmon reseeding in uh, water courses uh, along the North Shore of Lake Ontario, as Councillor Chappelle referenced. And um, so that affects us not only environmentally, but if we could revive the fishery, it would be good financially. And so it seemed to be a win-win-win situation. So I would ask staff to be very careful about this because we were talking about the salmon fishery that was largely extirpated and uh, environmentally devastated. And this is not a good state of affairs that we discovered, much to our pain. So I really think you should look at that and whether, you know, um, it doesn't seem that the, the observations of the nearby neighbors or even people in the neighborhood lines up with your study, okay? So that's something to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no other hands. Oh, Councillor Sanic, um, just before we go to you, Councillor Hill, you have the opportunity. Okay, so we'll go around to you. Councillor Sanic, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my next category of questions is regarding traffic. Um, so with this, um, next door to the subdivision is Bayshore subdivision. It's only 80 homes. And yet when it was built in 1986, it was a right-hand turn lane was built uh, for this subdivision. So the subdivision we're talking about tonight is more than double the number of units, right? It's 171 units. So can I just have um, the applicant confirm you're not planning any right-hand turn into the subdivision and why not? No, we weren't. Uh, we were looking for a feed, for their feedback from uh, city transportation and the MTO regarding if they're looking for any like turning lanes or anything along those lines. But but at the moment, we're not planning to to provide a, a right uh, a right lane into the subdivision. Okay, thank you. So for the minutes, I want it noted that please that um, I have a big concern that there's no right hand turn lane into Station Street, knowing that how busy my subdivision is with only 80 homes and, you know, uh, you have to slow down going into it. Um, you know, we already heard Station Street's really narrow. It might be widened. We don't know by how much and everyone's just going to tailgate rear end, you know, if there's not a right hand turn lane. And then that leads me to my next question of, um, where um, uh, Ms. Schmoka was saying that uh, there were some technical reports that were not on DASH or they just got posted to DASH just yesterday because they were requested instead of being on DASH all the way along. One of them was an MTO technical report. Um, it was just a letter, a two page letter, and it was um, written by an MTO planning intern. And um, she says, MTO has no concerns in traffic at this time, seeing the development has minimal impact on Highway 33. So my question to staff is, is this the only comments we're gonna get from MTO or 
are like, when are we going to receive um, something else from MTO? And is it going to be a more detailed analysis? And if that letter that's posted on Dash right now about the site plan, if that's the only letter um, from MTO we're going to receive, like what analysis did they do to base that conclusion? Ms. Lambert, I believe that will go to you. Thank you, and through you, uh, staff's understanding that the, the comments um, received to date represent the comments on the proposed applications at this time. Uh, they did have access to all of the uh, plans and reports that were submitted um, in support of the applications, including the traffic impact study. Okay, thank you. So. Um, like based on all the other um, MTO comments you might have received for any other developments, is this common that they give that responsibility to an intern? Okay, I asked staff then for when the comprehensive analysis comes forward, can we just get like um, further comments from MTO to ask them, um, what, you know, what, um, just for more details on how they came to the conclusion that they have no concerns. Like that's a pretty big blanket statement and they didn't give any supporting analysis. So I just wondered if for that comprehensive analysis, we could ask staff and or ask MTO. And if they say, nope, that letter, that's it, then, um, then we'll know. But for me, having an intern say that, it just doesn't seem right. Thank you, and through you, yeah, it's my understanding that it's a team of individuals from MTO that look at these um, uh, developments um, from a variety of areas of expertise, and um, it might be um, an intern authoring the letter, but all of the inputs are, are from the appropriate level of expertise. We have made note of your request, Councillor Osanic, and we'll fulfill that through any future reporting to this committee on this, these sets of applications. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question for you, Mr. Chair, is to the applicant. So yes, last Tuesday night was the um, public open house and I did attend and there was like lots of concerns with traffic. There was lots of talk about um, turning road B, which right now ends in a cul-de-sac to actually um, a right-hand turn in, right-hand turn out. So I just wondered, um, you know, has, are there any changes to what, you know, like officially has been the planning documents, which is what we see tonight, based on the feedback from the open house, is there any, any changes that you might see forthcoming from the comments at the open house? Um, thank you for that question. Um, we did, we have considered looking at trying to provide a, a, a new access on, onto the section of road, but, you know, we kind of went back and forth with MTO when we initially started this project, and they were pretty firm that they were not supportive of having a new access onto onto Bath Road. Their thoughts were that we're we're proposing um, the access. It was kind of where the uh, the Bath Road turns into a 60 kilometer road, because at the moment at Station Street it's a 50 kilometer road. But once you get past um, past the 4085 Bath Road house, it turns into 60. So so MCO was not supportive of having any type of new right of way access onto Bath Road. And so we were so we were required to work within like those parameters. Thank you. Um, my next category of questions are about the woodland. Um, so thank you for the information on doing the core sampling of the trees. Um, I would like to see that in writing. And so I will through city staff forward some specific questions about the core trees. And if I could get that in writing, just because I was hearing about those trees for the first time tonight, um, how it's like 70, we would need 70 trees and there was only 47. I just need that to sink in. 
Thank you. Um, for me, the woodland, it's not so much about the tree cutting, it's about the loss of biodiversity. And that is what climate change is all about, right? Biodiversity, trying to preserve biodiversity. And that is why forests are so important. And even with the 550 trees you're proposing to cut down that are greater than 15 centimeters of diameter, even if you were going to be planting new trees, for 550, you still will never get the biodiversity of a forest setting. And that to me is the ecological integrity. Um, that is what I want to see. I want to see that forest not be smushed down to just a 30 meter buffer. I wanna see that forest stay intact, right? Um, 30 seconds, Councillor. And then can I go into the next rounds, right? Because but I, I think that's fair. Minutes. You're the you're the district councilor, and I haven't seen movement from other folks. So we'll give you 10 minutes this round. That's fine. Okay, thank you. And um, I also want to see all of the CRCA comments, um, like their questions, their concerns about the environmental, the scoped environmental impact assessment be addressed. Thank you. Ms. Powder, perhaps you would like to comment on that. And yeah, Councillor Osanic will give you the next five minutes uh, right off the top here. Ms. Powder. Uh, yeah, we, I completely understand your thoughts um, in terms of the, the biodiversity. And uh, that's definitely something that we've been discussing with, with our ecologists. And it, they kind of explained to me, you know, that Kingston has about like the same type of biodiversity throughout the city. So, for example, on our site, there's a lot of um, what is it? Okay, on our site, there's a lot of like white ash, sugar maple, oak, white pine, and black cherry, and and these types of trees can be found also throughout the city and um, and like north of, of where this development is proposed. But uh, um, we'll definitely look into making sure that um, we work closely with CRCA um, just to kind of take in their comments and, and to see kind of where we could find that balance to ensure that we're protecting and um, nurturing the trees while also being able to provide housing for, for people. Thank you. Um, I have to make the comment that out of all the um, developments I've been on and planning committee over the last 16 years. I think this is the only one that had has a scoped environmental impact assessment instead of a full environmental impact assessment by the time the official public meeting is heard. So how are we as the public going to get a copy of the environmental impact assessment and when will that be ready? Uh, we are in the process of, of working on it now, and I will have to, to come back to you with a response regarding when, when it will be ready. Uh, I'll have to follow up with our uh, ecologist on that one. Thank you. I also want to point out that um, someone went across the railway tracks um, um, yesterday, and they just on the other side of the tracks, like your side of the tracks, they over um, overturned a log and a salamander was under there. <laughs> which is a species of concern. So there is definitely a lot of biodiversity in this forest. And also want to piggyback on the comments that we heard from one of the delegates um, uh, saying that um, it's old growth, 170 years, the forest has not been clear cut. And uh, again, that goes back to how I want to see those um, the, that carbon dating and then ask questions about that in more detail uh, through email writing back and forth. Uh, the CRCA um, identifies this, this forest as like a significant valley land. And that is just another reason why 30 meters to me is, um, is just not giving it due justice at all. And I think everyone should have on their conscience, if this forest gets cut down, is that something we're gonna be proud of to tell our grandkids one day that that is what we did. And so as what I was saying at the open house last week is that I am hoping that the applicant will have, uh, give, to give consideration to saving the woodland 
maybe narrowing down the stormwater management pond, making it deeper. Or um, we also heard comments at the uh, open house last week that haven't been heard tonight that we might not even need the stormwater management pond, might be able to do it through um, a bigger catch basin type of arrangement, but still have the density on the east side, right? Like around road B, you know, maybe the homes on road B on the west side of Bayview Farm, right? Like you have the homes backing on, single family homes backing onto Bayview Farm on road B on the east side, but on the west side of road B, have those townhouses to try to say like, instead of having townhouses going so far west on road E, just like we talked about last week, Ms. Powder, right? At the open house, that will preserve more of the forest stormwater management because you can get that increased density on the west side of road B or further on in block D closer to the communication tower. You know, we got to somehow work this. Uh, we got to think of the future and biodiversity saving that forest. So I see Mr. LeBlanc's hands up. Perhaps he wanted to comment to your stormwater question. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure who said the stormwater pond was not needed. Um, I would disagree with that. And I've never heard of a catch basin or seen one large enough that would handle this subdivision for both quality or quantity control. And if it was, it would be exponentially expensive. Um, so sorry, I'm not sure where that comes from. Uh, obviously, if a stormwater pond wasn't needed, we wouldn't propose one. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, we do need one. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. That was heard at the open house because apparently your ecologist had just taken the CRCA for a walk through the woods. I would agree, yes. Um, you're correct, Councillor Sanic, that we did meet with the CRCA last week and they kind of provided this recommendation that if we didn't have the storm pond that perhaps we could drain into the lake. And um, and we've been discussing that with uh, Dan and uh, Marie Jocelyn to kind of see if this is something that could be worked, worked through. Uh, thank you very much for that. And just a follow up to that then directly to Mr. LeBlanc, if I can, Mr. Chair. And that was also an idea I heard of um, making the stormwater management pond deeper instead of wider. Yeah, as we get into a more detailed design, we will, especially given uh, the comments from the public and the councillors regarding trees and minimizing the removal of trees, we will do our very best to not only size the stormwater pond um, efficiently for that space and manipulate the layout of it to preserve as much uh, natural space in that area as possible. Um, from a technical standpoint, I won't get too far into it. I'll leave that for the stormwater report and final design, um, but Hopefully that answers uh, it for now. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question about um, uh, about the woods and um, no matter what type of um, woods it becomes 120 meters wide, 60 meters wide, um, it's important not to have a trail through here. Uh, we don't have your ecologist on the line, do we? No, we don't. He's um, he's up north at a uh, at a project. Right. So I wanted him to verify that it's um, uh, once you put a trail through the woods, you um, you in you have the potential, high potential of introducing invasive species into the woodland, which will therefore seconds. affect and degrade the biodiversity of the woodland. So. I was talking to the CRCA, you know, like not having a trail through the woodland, right? And as far as the park goes, um, it looked in your concept plan, you have the trail going um, to the west side of the stormwater management pond and also the east side. It's important for that park only to be connected to the stormwater management on the east side, or sorry, yeah, on the east side. So again, you save the structural integrity, ecological integrity of the woodland on the west side of the stormwater management pond. We don't want more invasive species to affect the woodland. Councillor, I'll cut you off there because that's 10 minutes. Councillor Neal did have his hand up. And if people are still itching, technically we can go to another round. 
but I'm just looking to committee now. Councillor Neal, did you want to ask anything else? Yes, I do. Um, and this is kind of a follow up for what Councillor Asanik was talking about. Uh, uh, Vicki Schmolka, when she made a presentation, uh, commented on the fact that uh, we didn't have uh, any CRCA report, we didn't have uh, and other things. And so we're kind of hearing about the CRCA concerns secondhand uh, and through, with all due respect, through the eyes of the proponents uh, person. So could I get Mr. Park and Ms. Lambert uh, to comment that we'll make sure that there aren't any gaps in our in our uh, dash reports uh, well before the comprehensive report so that we can look look at it and the public can look at it in a comprehensive way. Through you, Chair, um, certainly um, comments from technical agencies are available to the public and they're usually available upon request and I have been circulating them to interested members of, of the public when they've reached out to me um, with environmental concerns around the development and requesting what, if any, CRCA input as we can so far. Post them on Dash so that people don't have to come, always come through uh, our staff to get that information. Is that is that accurate? With this request that I've received uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can offer to to publish those to to dash with the level of interest um, in the environmental aspects of this development. I can do that for sure. Right. Thank and you. the biodiversity, any reports that come in, and I don't know if CRCA have weighed in on that, but I'd be surprised if they don't have some comments to make about that as well. So thank you. <laughs> All right, Councillor Chappelle. You're on mute, sir. That elusive, Mr. Chair, that elusive mouse always seems to disappear when I need it most. Um, I'm looking at the site plan and I'm just wondering if the proponent can discuss how they, because it's a private, proposed to be a private, um, compound, so to speak. Can you discuss how you're going to address uh, snow removal? Uh, through the chair to you, Councillor Chappelle. Um, so the complete streets uh, design that we're proposing, it does provide for snow removal uh, on either side, I believe, of the development. Yeah, it provides for snow removal on either side, kind of within the within the uh, landscaped area. So if the clerk could bring up the, the very last slide of the presentation, it kind of shows what the complete street design looks like. So the idea would be that there would be restricted parking on one side. Um, this idea places residents at the top of the transportation hierarchy and it welcomes people of all like walking abilities. And the idea here is that, you know, there would be, um, there'd be sidewalks on both sides. There would be uh, a treed landscape boulevard. Um, with there, it would be welcoming to people who, who bike. Uh, and then again, there would be parking restricted on one side of, of, the, of the, the roadway. Um, looking at that uh, diagram it was very helpful. It just reminded me of another question I had, and that's uh, with regards to guest parking spots. Um, it wasn't clearly delineated for me. Are you intending to have guest parking spots for this subdivision? So I kind of thought the advantages of um, allowing the stacked townhomes to have a two-car parking driveway and also a two-car garage is that it allows for them to have any guests that come by to park on their driveway rather than having to find parking within the development. Whereas with the stacked townhomes without, um, without garages or, or car spaces, we did provide additional um, visitor parking for, for those individuals. 
And then again, with the single family um, cars, visitors would be allowed to like, park on their driveway or they can park um, on one of the uh, streets where it's uh, where parking isn't restricted. Now, um, I can't recall which resident spoke, but uh, certainly had some historical knowledge of living in the area on wells. And um, I'm very concerned about well water because we live on a fractured substrate. So if this development is to be brought forward and knowing that there's so many area of uh, residents nearby that have wells, what is the plan methodology for removing substrate? Is it going to be blasting or is it you know, um, back hose with uh, hammer drills, like what, what have you envisioned that far ahead yet to understand what would be required to make this development successful? Uh, at the moment, I, I have not envisioned that far. I'm not sure if Dan from our civil team uh, would be able to kind of provide what that construction would look like. But from my understanding is because that this project would be kind of serviced by city water, there wouldn't be um, any effect to groundwater wells. But I see that Dan has his hand up and would be able to kind of provide additional feedback. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, so I understand um, your concern. Uh, currently, the water that, or the runoff that falls from rainfall and such onto this area of property, some of it infiltrates, as I said, it becomes groundwater. People pointed out that it uh, goes through the substrated fractures. And as you add hard surface and it's now being collected into the stormwater system, and discharge to this water course. Um, with the restrictions and um, also recommendations by CRCA and other governing authorities, having no negative impact would include um, ensuring that we're not taking water away from this water course. It still needs to uh, function as it currently does. And so, as far as worrying about the wells, which at this point, it sounds like um, the groundwater people are concerned. It, it appeared that the pictures I saw someone post earlier um, were discharging to the water course, which is where the stormwater pond is proposed to discharge to as well. So we wouldn't be um, cutting that off completely as well as the hard surface takes away from the infiltration, but again, it goes through the stormwater pond and is released into the water course, at least at this uh, stage of the design. Okay, I, I just want to, you know, to knowing that it's because you're close to the shoreline, the strata of the rock formations is going to be a lot of cavernous areas. So if you do do a lot of blasting, that can collapse and impact someone, you know, two kilometers down the road or on wells. So that, just be mindful of that, so I ask. And that's all my questions are, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chappelle. So I'll do a final call for councillors. Alrighty, thank you very much. And that will conclude our public meeting, Ms. Powder and your team and all the members of the public. Thank you for your input as well. It is 8.41. I propose we take a nine minute break, bringing us to 8.50 before we move into the planning committee meeting. So we'll see everyone in nine minutes at 8.50.
Okay, it is 8.50 and I'd like to get underway. I see myself, Councillor Hutchison, Hill, and Neil. Madam Clerk, can you confirm that that will be quorum? Oh, I think Councillor Sanic is here as well, so. We are good to go, Mr. Chair. We're good to go. Welcome everyone, if you're just tuning in, Councillor Chappelle's here as well. Okay, full compliment, excellent. It is 8.50, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, this is number 14, 2022. And we're looking for an approval of the agenda as amended. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Councillor Hill move. Councillor Chappelle seconded. All those in favor? Excellent. That is good. Uh, next is a confirmation of the minutes from our previous meeting on Thursday, May 26. The mover and a seconder. Councillor Osanic moves. Councillor Neal seconds. All those in favor? Excellent. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, there are no delegations, no briefings. We have an item of business concerning 1102, 1106, and 1110 King Street West. And before we get into that, I want to recognize our colleague, Councillor Doherty, who's the district councillor for the file, uh, is with us tonight and more than willing, and we're grateful to have her participation uh, when the time's right. So, Madam Clerk, uh, with that, we will turn to uh, staff to conduct a presentation to kick us off on this first and only item of business. Uh, good evening, everyone. I trust you can hear me. Uh, my name is Mike Slaggy. I'm a planner with the city's planning services department. I'm here to present the staff's recommendation for the site plan control application for the property municipally addressed 1102, 1106, and 1110 King Street West. Next slide, please. Uh, to begin, I wanted to just do a quick overview of the site plan control process and the purpose of this meeting, of this meeting as it is atypical to the usual meeting process that comes before committee. Site plan control is a tool established under section 41 of the Planning Act. It provides the city with an opportunity to review and influence the technical and functional design of a given development, assuming it is permitted as of right through the established zoning bylaw. The intent is to permit the city to evaluate the site functionality, such as building placement, vehicular and pedestrian access, landscaping, stormwater management, and other such items, ensuring compliance with any and all applicable city standards and requirements, and to minimize any potential negative impacts of the development to the extent possible given the scope of the powers provided under Section 41. It must be recogni recognized that whereby the zoning provides permissions for various form and standards, such as height, density, and setback, the city is unable to further limit those permissions through site plan control. These applications are reviewed by a variety of internal and external departments and agencies such as the city's engineering parks and transportation departments who all review applications to ensure compliance with any applicable bylaws and standards and to provide any required conditions that are to be included in a future agreement. Upon approval of an application, a legal agreement is entered into between the city and the owner and ensures that the development complies with what was reviewed and approved through the site plan process. This agreement typically includes a number of conditions which the owner will be required to comply with. The owner will further be required to submit site securities in conjunction with the site plan approval, which are held against the property until such time that the works are completed to the satisfaction of the city. Unlike typical meetings before the committee, there is no proposal to amend any existing policies or bylaws. In effect, this is the realization of the development rights established through the zoning bylaw. In such instances, only the owner is provided appeal rights through the process as it is recognized that previous processes were undertaken to establish the permissions on the lands, and those included their own appeal opportunities when adopted by council. Next slide, please. Site plan control is typically delegated by council to the director of planning services to review and approve applications on their behalf. This is done through the city's delegated authority bylaw. This bylaw, however, does permit council to lift delegated authority and have an application be brought before planning committee, where it is felt that a project merits a greater forum for public comment and discussion on matters related to site plan control. This meeting is not a statutory meeting under the act, but rather a courtesy provided by council. Next slide, please. This evening, staff are recommending the committee approve the subject application in principle and direct any outstanding technical matters back to the director of planning services for final approval. After several rounds of technical review, only a single primary matter related to servicing remains outstanding. As with all other matters, the issue will require sign off from our technical partner, partner prior to the finalization of the site plan approval. 
Any comments received this evening from committee and or members of the public will be further reviewed by staff and considered to ensure that all matters of site plan control are adequately addressed. Next slide, please. The site itself is located on the south side of King Street West and includes the properties addressed, as I mentioned, 1102, 1106, and 1110 King Street West. It is made up of the former grain elevator uh, pier property, which extends into Lake Ontario. And, uh, it is uh, also into Cataraqui Bay and the elevator bay. Um, portions of the lot extend into the water. The property bisects and is located largely south of the existing townhouse development known as Commodore's Cove. To the east of the site across the bay are several high-rise apartment buildings as well as Lake Ontario Park. To the west is the DuPont and Vista Manufacturing Site as well as Utilities Kingston Wastewater Treatment Plant. Next slide, please. Before getting into the present application, I thought it, was, uh, it would be beneficial to go through a brief history of the various zoning approvals on the site to understand how we got to the permissions that exist today. In 1986, a zoning amendment was uh, approved which permitted the development of the site with 410 units to be located within the existing grain elevator building. Also, it approved a two-story parking garage which would be attached and form part of that existing building. In addition, 38 separate townhome units were permitted on the lands to a maximum of three stories, as well as the onshore facilities necessary for the operation of the marina, including associated commercial and restaurant, up to a maximum of 1,000 square meters. In, <clears throat> the amendment included the permission for the marina use in the waters west of the grain elevator and established an on-site parking required for both the marina and associated commercial use of one space per 18.5 square meters of commercial floor area. This amendment did not include any lot occupancy or density limits as these, are, these were controlled by the number of units permitted, which were largely located in the existing building, as well as the limited permitted area for commercial uses. Next slide, please. In 1987, a zoning amendment was approved whereby the previous approval was modified to now permit up to 343 units in a single new building, in addition to the already permitted 38 townhouse units. The commercial facility was maintained, but included permissions for a retail uh, convenience store for primary use by residents as well as marina customers. This amendment also notably removed the application of any side and rear yard setbacks and did not establish a height maximum. It did include, however, a new 210% lot occupancy requirement. Commercial parking regulations were maintained, but residential parking was now required to have at least 375 parking spaces located within a substantially covered or enclosed parking structure. It's also at this time that site, the initial site plan approval was granted and uh, building permits were given for the construction of the 38 townhomes that make up Commodore's Cove. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, in 2007, another zoning amendment permitted the establishment of those 343 units into three separate buildings. It also added the, uh, the option for retirement uses on the lands with a number of permissions specific to that land use. I won't go into them as they don't apply to the present application. In addition, a one lot for zoning purposes clause was included with regards to the site-specific lot occupancy permission and no minimum front yard setback was required. Next slide, please. This is simply another overhead look at the site plan for the uh, concept plan in 2007, which included the uh, two high-rise uh, residential condominiums and the nine-story resident, uh, excuse me, uh, retirement home above the garage. Next slide, please. These all led to the present zoning context, which uh, is now zoned largely a site-specific multiple family dwelling B3216 zone, which permits the high-rise residential apartment use, and where exception 216 establishes the various site-specific provisions I just laid out. The western portion of the water lot is zoned special water area P2217, which permits the marina use, while the southern and eastern portions of the water lots are zoned harbor open space and permits a variety of generally publicly public water-based uses. However, no development is proposed within these areas. Again, remembering some key points with the zoning, it includes no minimum setbacks, no height max maximums, and recognizes that the lands within the B3 zone continue to be assessed as a single development. Next slide, please. Moving now to the proposal, uh, there are many aspects to it, so I'll try to be brief, and if there are any uh, items that require further kind of clarification or information, um, that could be provided during the question period. Here you're seeing the overall development plan with access being shown off King Street using the existing main uh, central roadway to access the proposed de development leading to a ramp that will access the entirety of the property. Uh, also note to the west or at the bottom of your page is the 33 slip marina. Uh, this marina still requires some approvals from the CRCA, so it is not at this time expected to be uh, part of the site plan approval. Um, I will now move on to explaining the various components and try to build an understanding of the project. Next slide, please. 
Once you reach the development area, approximately 130 meters from King Street, the first two stories are made up of parking garages where level one is accessed from the northern end of the development, and level two is accessed from the east, just off the site access ramp. The garage extends to cover the entirety of the pier and a portion of the development lines. These two uh, garage levels contain 458 of the uh, 521 residential parking spaces, as well as all 343 residential bicycle parking spaces. The bottom left is the proposed commercial building, a drop-off space, and two loading spaces, which is uh, located at grade. Next slide, please. Now moving to what is considered the project grade. However, this is again above the parking structures. Uh, I will begin with the southern end of the pier. Here you can see the two proposed residential towers. Tower one at the south end is 23 stories high and it contains 167 units, where tower two is 20 stories high and contains 176 units for a total of 343. Again, both above the two stories parking. The buildings are set back above the garage, a minimum of five meters from the Western lot line and 14 meters from the Eastern lot line. The South Tower is set back approximately 20.5 meters from the rear lot line. There is also a 25 meter tower separation uh, between the two buildings. Each building includes loading spaces, and drop off areas for residential use. Also, please note the pedestrian walkway shaded in gray, which follows the perimeter of the pier. This walkway is a minimum 1.5 meter walkway accessible to the public through a public access easement. It will form part of the site plan agreement. This easement was part of the parkland dedication requirements resulting from the initial site plan application. This walkway includes various rest areas along the path, as well as a parkette at the south end of the pier. The walkway also offers a cut through just east of Tower 2 to connect to the west side of the pier. Next slide, please. Moving north is the enclosed parking area, which contains the final 63 residential parking spaces and is accessed at the southern end off the main driveway ramp. Here you have a better view of the pedestrian walkway as it links with the existing waterfront trail. Starting from uh, coming from the east, you have two options to either use the switchback ramp uh, to lead up above the parking structure and around the pier, or to bypass the pier entirely by using the uh, pathway that's located at the left-hand side of your screen and connecting down to the western end of the existing waterfront trail. Next slide, please. Finally, very briefly, the existing surfing par surface parking lot will be resurfaced for use of the commercial and marina uses, containing a total of 55 parking spaces. Initial designs did include a parking structure here, but that was removed, and all but four trees surrounding the parking lot will be retained. Uh, you'll be able to see the trees a little bit better in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of landscaping, the development provides a total of 2,310 square meters of landscaped open space, largely in the form of walkways, new planted and sodded areas, and hardscaping features. This is in addition to the existing 11,000 square meters of landscaped open space located within the uh, existing townhouse development, and together they equal 33% of the 33% uh, landscaped open space, 3% uh, above the minimum requirement. It's important to note that only landscaping located at true grade is considered uh, landscaped open space as per the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. Moving back to the pier portion. The development further provides an additional approximately 6,100 square meters of landscaping above the structured parking, again in the form of hardscape features, plantings, sodded areas, trees, rest areas, and walkways. As mentioned, this additional landscape is not included in the zoning assessment of the development, but will contribute to the enjoyment and functionality of the lands and provides aesthetic and environmental benefits. Next slide, please. Lastly, moving to the elevations and materials designed for the building, here's the elevation and profile of Tower 1, which is effectively the same for Tower 2. Uh, a variety of materials are used, including various shades of gray architectural planning, lighter gray bricks, and a variety of glazing. These materials, along with the various step backs on the upper floors, help to break up the visual mass of the building, while the thin profiles help to reduce the shadow impacts on the surrounding townhomes. Next slide, please. With respect to technical review, the application has gone through seven rounds of uh, review by internal and external departments and agencies. At this point in time, concerns have been largely addressed, with one item related to gas servicing still outstanding. The issue pertains to a budget amendment needed to perform the infrastructure upgrades to service this property, as well as the prison for women proposal. A report to that item is going before council on the 21st of this month. I would also like to clarify, however, that in saying matters are largely addressed, this does not mean that all uh, reviews are completed. There will be further review in the subsequent detailed design phase through the building permit process. Next slide, please. Throughout the application process, there was consistent correspondence from members of the public and con with concerns and questions raised. 
I expect many of those concerns to be raised this evening, so I won't dwell uh, on this too long, but just a quick summary of the primary areas of concern, which include compliance with the zoning, understanding the history and how the uh, current application meets those requirements, the impacts of the development on neighboring properties and wildlife, accessory parking structure, uh, or previously approved, uh, excuse me, previously proposed accessory parking structure and the tree protection within that area, walkway design and accessibility, emergency access to and through the site, st structural integrity of the pier, as well as impacts of construction. Next slide, please. Through technical review and based on the feedback received from members of the public through this process, several changes have been made that I feel are uh, noteworthy. It includes the removal of the accessory parking structure, as well as retention of all but four of the existing trees, those trees being removed for uh, required infrastructure work. In addition of an elevator, as well as an additional access to uh, ramps added on the west side of the pier, which allow for accessibility throughout the, the um, walkway along the pier, as well as the parking area above the parking structure, which was uh, initially left open, is now enclosed to comply with zoning and to improve visual aesthetic and reduce external impacts such as light spillover and noise. Initially, hydro wires or aerial hydro wires were proposed to cross uh, King Street to attach to, to connect with Hydro One infrastructure on the north side of King Street. Those will now be buried. In addition, bird friendly glass uh, will be employed following the uh, guidelines of the City of Toronto. The City of Kingston does not ha yet have its own uh, guidelines, so the City of Toronto is being uh, used. In addition, uh, finally, a maintenance and monitoring plan will be developed. Um, as part of the CRCA conditional permit and as part of the building permit phase in order to ensure that proper maintenance is done on the uh, infrastructure for the uh, foundation of the building. Next slide, please. To conclude, the application complies with the applicable zoning requirements. Staff are satisfied that the proposal meets the technical standards and requirements which apply and recommend that committee approve the application in principle with any outstanding matters directed back to the Director of Planning Services. Uh, next and last slide, please. Uh, thank you for your attention and time. Um, here, joined with city planning staff and legal services staff, as well as the CRCA staff planner, as well as members of the uh, project team, uh, the applicant team, to answer any questions as required. All right. Thank you, Mr. Zalegi. And for those of you who have been following us all night, I just want to make a note on process that unlike a public meeting, we actually start with questions from the committee and responses from staff and the proponent. But if you are here from the public and wish to participate, you'll have the opportunity to do so, but it comes after committee. So just reversing uh, the order, and that's how we do it all the time. Just a, a difference, technically speaking, between public meetings and these, uh, these uh, business items in the actual planning committee meeting. So uh, we will move to committee, and perhaps uh, somewhat untraditionally now, I'm going to actually start by asking uh, a question really quickly to staff that I think sets up everything that we'll be doing tonight. And perhaps uh, the planner who just spoke or the director of planning would like to answer. Can we get a further delineation between site plan and zoning? We're so used to using uh, a zoning mindset to our, our conduct here, but we're thinking only of site plan. So could you give maybe some specific examples of what then would be in order for site plan and what would be out of order? I see Mr. Barr, who's the manager of planning uh, and development appearing. So that's what I'm trying to hope uh, we can all kind of understand going into this committee and members of the public uh, in, in a little while. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there is quite a distinction between zoning bylaw amendment applications and site plan control applications. And tonight, what we're dealing with is a site plan control application that's been bumped up. Matters that are addressed through site plan control include items like uh, drawings that sufficiently display the massing and conceptual design of the building. It deals with the on-site functionality. So looking at things like the uh, access to and from the site for both vehicles as well as pedestrians, ensuring that there are sufficient facilities on site to handle items like parking uh, designs, um, uh, accessible parking spaces, uh, garages for you know loading and unloading of uh, uh, garbage that's uh, accumulated on the site that needs to be taken off. So this is really the technical implementation of looking at applying the zone provisions to make sure that a building that's there is zone compliant, but that we look at the, the fine grained details of the site. So this also would look at the servicing uh, connections for the site, making sure that there's adequate servicing to and from the site and how it connects to the municipal system. 
um, as well. So uh, there are specific elements that are outlined in the Planning Act, which uh, site plan control cannot do. And what site plan control cannot do is uh, limit uh, the density of an application because that's specifically regulated through zoning. So that's number of units, number of um, square meters associated with maybe a commercial operation or a residential operation, uh, as well as um, increasing uh, zone regulations um, requiring that beyond what is in a zoning bylaw. So if the zoning bylaw says it has to be back three meters through site plan control, uh, we can't regulate and enforce or require greater than that. Uh, so those are the matters that are uh, from a high level regulated under site plan control and how it differs from what we typically uh, hear and discuss through a zoning bylaw amendment application. Okay, thanks, Mr. Byrne. So with that as context, I'll ask committee and members of the public to keep that in mind as much as possible. And as chair, I'll try to find the balance that we need to strike here between hearing from people. Oh, I see a point of order already. Councillor Hill. Just in terms of, of one significant distinction is that this has already been approved by a former council. So the project itself in terms of approval, that's not something we can discuss tonight. We're talking about what the, the, the site plan, as Mr. Barr pointed out. So there's I know a lot of the commentary that came in was about approving or not approving this project. That happened back in 2007, and it can't be revisited by this committee. That is correct. And that's a helpful distinction. I think you said it better than I could. So uh, with that committee, uh, over to you for questions that are within order, within, within site plan. Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, uh, I, I agree with what Councillor Hill said, and I've gotten a lot of responses, uh, a lot of emails from constituents and citizens saying, how can you support this? Uh, we aren't being asked to support this as a project. Uh, the reality is there is no sunset clause on previous council's decisions. And so the, count, the council of the day approved this would it be approved today under our current zoning and current uh, official plan? Quite possibly, some would say probably not, but that's outside of our powers uh, to apply today's OP and zoning to a decision made by a previous council. Uh, I totally support Councillor Doherty having bumped this up which is the only method we have of taking a sober second look at the proposal before us. But like Mr. Barr says, we're limited to those things that are specific to site plan. So, uh, so as I said to a couple of people I received emails from, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> if this was before us today, I might, I might very well not approve it, but that's not what, what we're allowed to do today. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Neer. From a, a former longtime chair of planning committee, that's helpful to hear from you as well. So I appreciate that. Councilor Osanek, you are next on my list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few questions. And if they're not site plan questions, <laughs> just let me know, right? We don't do site plan questions very often. So um, I was happy to see about the bird glazing that's gonna be done on the glass. Um, I was really happy to see that. Now it says that um, it's gonna be the glazing for the first 12 meters. So how many floors, like how many stories would that be? Uh, this is Hamid Architects. Uh, so that's uh, about, uh, so if we take 10, uh, three meters per uh, per floor, so we have uh, four stories. Okay, thank you. I didn't know, so it was three meters for, for, yeah, uh, per yeah, floor yeah. thereabouts, right? Exactly, average, okay. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And then I see also six meters above any green roof terrace. So, okay, um, thank you for doing that. 
Um, and then this this um, building is being built um, basically like for like a 100 year lifespan, is it? Is that like so that we're approving it on this pier with all the really fancy engineering of the pier to withstand all the weight on the pier, you know, that this building's going to weigh and hoping that the engineering will last a hundred years? After you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's correct. The design intent is for a building to last a hundred years. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, monitoring and maintenance uh, plan will be a very detailed plan ensuring that uh, regular maintenance, regular monitoring and maintenance is, uh, is conducted over the, um, the foundational items. Um, just quickly, the intent of the building, uh, there is a structural engineer here later, uh, here that can speak to it uh, with more detail later, but effectively there will be new piles driven into the bedrock beneath where the existing uh, pier is. That will be built, um, up top of that will be a new uh, raft slab and that will support the building. And around that will be um, sheet piles and uh, refurbished um, uh, pier walls. Uh, and all of the uh, maintenance and monitoring, the monitoring maintenance plan is to ensure that all of the elements involved with that construction are uh, regularly maintained to, uh, to allow for a hundred year design life. Thank you. And- um, Councilor, sorry to interrupt you. I see Mr. Tao from the project team has his hand up. So we'll let him chime in as well. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. So just, just to maybe provide some clarity on that 100 year lifespan point, um, I think it's probably more accurate to say that the, the, the structure that's there and the design and what's going to be done to it would have a 100 year life um, without needing major rehabilitation. So at the end of say 100 years in theory, that's not to say that you couldn't rehabilitate the pier or the, you know, the structural elements. In fact, the pier has been designed with the structural elements such that um, interventions can be done over time to maintain it, um, to replace uh, components of the, of the pier. Uh, sheet walls, for example, can be replaced, the tiebacks, there's access points within the pier structure design to allow for inspections and, and re uh, replacement to happen. So uh, not to say, that, so not to say that this is, you know, a hundred year uh, life of the building, and then that's it. It's that's designed to withstand a hundred year life. So for example, the, the sheet wall thickness is designed to withstand the amount of degradation that would happen to a sheet wall over a hundred years through natural weathering and wearing that would happen. And then, you know, whether it's 75 years or 120 years, those components could be replaced. And then, you know, your life, the, the life of that component extends. So um, I'll, I'll say that we do have Stu Seabrook, who's the coastal engineer on the project, as well as representative from WSP, who's a project structural engineer. So they're able to answer questions in more detail uh, if needed as well. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I just want to go into this just a little bit, right? So, okay, 100 year lifespan. And, um, but at what certain points um, within that 100 years would major work be recommended to be done, like just for good practice, like 25 years? Like, can, can the place, you know, how like your car usually has a warranty for the first five years, but then after that, things can come and go, right? And maybe sometimes before, maybe sometimes later. So um, uh, like we all have the Champlain Towers in our minds, right? And so I'm just wondering like, what would be like if 10 years, 15 years, like when would the condo fees really have to start to, um, um, you know, accumulate to do some maintenance? Yeah. So I'll, it's a good, great question and, and certainly one that comes to mind with a site like this. So I'll start off answering, but then maybe other uh, Mr. Seabrook or uh, Mohammed from WSP can can chime in as well. So the as with any building, you know, regular maintenance happens and, and inspections happen, particularly through a condominium corporation, because there's requirements for there's requirements under the Condominium Act for inspections or for maintenance to be done and for regular reporting to be done to ensure that um, the condo reserve fund, which is funds that are gathered through condo fees, for example, that the reserve fund is adequately funded to make sure that maintenance can be paid for and that big ticket items can be paid for over the long term. 
And so to make sure that that fund is adequately funded, um, they have to do studies provided by engineers on a regular basis to inspect key components of buildings. In this case, because there's this structure underneath versus a piece of land, um, those components of the of the structure are included or would be included in that assessment that happens um, on a regular basis. Um, and so, for example, and I'll, maybe I'll look to Mr. Seabrook, but for example, the the uh, the shore walls, uh, depending on the thickness that's specified, you know, you can have a, a thickness of the material that's good for 50 years or 75 years or 100 years, depending on the design, depending on the conditions that it's in and the wave forces that would act against it, for example. So um, those are all cues, I guess, in terms of the inspections that would happen um, to look at. And, and there's a set of recommended inspection uh, protocol that has been provided by the applicant through the consultant team and reviewed by the peer reviewer to say every X number of years, um, a visual inspection should be done, measure the thickness of the shore wall, for example, including you know, going into the water, doing subwater uh, inspections as part of the, um, as part of say a five-year inspection program. So I see Stu has uh, appeared, so I'll maybe have yeah. to pass it over him. I wasn't sure when you wanted me to, to jump in there. Um, yeah, sorry, it, I guess in answer to the questions about the pier itself, we've looked at the steel sheet piles themselves in terms of the thickness that is residual at this point in time, having, you know, they've been in place for 30 years, at least, I guess, to date. And um, looking at typical corrosion rates that are um, expected for freshwater environments and the loads that would be expected on the sheet pile. And I've determined that there is sufficient, more than sufficient actually thickness or section modulus left in the sheets themselves for a hundred year reserve. There are other elements to the wall, the tie backs that um, basically hold the wall into the, into the pier itself, if you will. Um, those elements are elements that um, would tend to decay a little more rapidly perhaps than the sheet pile itself. Those have been or will be designed. There's a concept in place right now that they will be designed so that they are basically replaceable without excavation. They will be through the structure within sleeves so that um, at a certain point down the road, I would suggest maybe, you know, 25 to 50 year design life or something like that. Um, those items would uh, would be replaced um, along the structure as required. But as Mark noted, there's there's a program in place, or will be a program in place to review these every five years, and and the the pier itself in general, if you will, and anything that is identified as you know a minor damage area or a localized damage area could be repaired at that time if there's something that happens to a. A, a joint in the sheet pile or there's a, uh, some kind of impact or something like that. You can, if you look at the existing structure, you'll see there's some damage to the top of the pile along the east side. And those are expected to be impact from some of the vessels that have used it in the past or been mooring up there. So those will need to be repaired initially, of course, but anything like that that develops over time would be addressed as it comes up in these five year cycles. And those wouldn't be expected to be major uh, financial implications for localized repairs. Replacing tiebacks would be a fairly large undertaking. Um, and I guess the other thing I would add is that there's a rock berm proposed around the base of this sheet pile that will relieve a lot of the stress that is on that existing pile right now. They're fairly tall on the um, east side, perhaps nine, seven to nine meters at least. We're looking at a berm to um, minus 2.5 meters chart datum. So basically two and a half meters below the low water level uh, for the, the bay there, this berm would come up and that's going to help to um, retain the, the, the toe of the pile and will relieve some of the stress on the sheets themselves over the long term. So those are some of the, I guess, the design factors that have been taken into account to date to, to look at a hundred year service life for the structure. Thank you, and through you, yeah. Mr. Chair, um, if I could ask another question, um, I think the the raft slab base um, is a fairly new concept. If it's not, let me know. But um, how many? I, like, are there any other building? No, there wouldn't be any other buildings in Kingston that are even like this. Um, how many buildings in on like are they all in Toronto? Are there other buildings that have this raft slab base? 
let Mohammed answer that. Uh, it's Mohsen, I'm uh, from WSP Structures, trying to reply all the uh, questions on the structure side. So uh, uh, before I answer your current question, one clarification I wanted to make is that uh, the design life for the building structure, whether it's uh, in Kingston or or anywhere else in uh, uh, Canada, by code is defined to be 50 years standard, right? And that's what we target at, right? Uh, for the other structures, could be like sheet piling, as she was saying, it could be 100 years. So different elements would could have different design lives, but for the structure part, which is the main building, it's going to be 50 years. And that's what we are targeting. Regarding your concern of uh, an aggressive environment coming from uh, from the waters, from the lake or anything, there an initial investigation from the geotechnical has uh, come to us. And that has indicated uh, like very mild uh, traces of uh, such aggressiveness. Uh, what we do in structural design is that we increase our uh, uh, like uh, covers to the reinforcement and all that stuff so that it can survive uh, during the anticipated 50 year or so. We, it, it must be able to withstand that uh, aggressiveness before it reaches the, to the reinforcement. That's, that's, that would all be done for sure. Now, coming back to this question regarding uh, the concept of using raft and on top of the caissons, this is not a new concept. We have been using it extensively in so many different projects all over the world. What happens is that in this concept, uh, specifically I'm talking about the one which is being used in, uh, in this building would be that all the building load would actually be transferred onto the caisson, which would deliver it directly into the uh, into the rock, which is at the bottom of the lake, right? So the top portion of the uh, uh, rock, which is uh, considered to be a bit weathered, we would pass it through and deliver it to the uh, to such a depth in the rock where it can sustain without without a doubt. So that's that's one thing. The the role of the raft over here is to adequately distribute the load into the caisson so that none of the caissons would actually be uh, overloaded or so. It does not really, uh, we would not be going with a concept that the soil or the fill material within the bounds of the pier wall would actually be taking the load. So the soil which is present on top of the rock and the fill material is not really going to see the load coming from all the gravity load would actually just transfer to the to the raft it's not, not going to be the the fill material over there so that fill material is uh, technically speaking it's not really a supporting material the supporting material is the uh, is the is the rock underneath i think that that should actually uh, reply all the question if there is anything else i'm happy to answer thank you um Mr. Chair, do you want me to stop and then you'll come back to me? I have a You're doing questions. fine actually. I never count the time for a response in your in your time, so you actually have three and a half minutes left. Oh, okay. Great. Um a question to staff um about the pathway that goes around these two buildings. Um is it a public pathway and um is there going to are there going to be lights? Uh yes, it is a uh, a public uh publicly accessible um, walkway. It was required as part of, as I mentioned, the initial um, site plan approval, which included this easement, and it will be uh, included in the site plan agreement here as well. Um, in terms of lights, I believe there are lights around it. I'm just looking at uh, the electricity plan for it, but it will be uh, lit up at night, I believe, yes. Okay, thank Bye. you. And if it's publicly accessible, which is um, great news to hear that all of us can walk around. Um, if the pathway starts to get washed out, I don't know what type of material the pathway is going to be, if it's going to be asphalt, concrete, I don't know. But with all the waves, um, if it starts to get washed out, is it going to be, that means like it would be the city expense to redo the pathway? So um, through you, Mr. Chair, the height of the pathway is, is actually quite elevated above um, above the water line. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Seabrook uh, could potentially speak to this in more detail, but uh, 
based on the height of uh, where not only the the base the raft that you had mentioned earlier um, that is above I believe it's two meters above, above the high water mark um, and then above that you have the two stories of the uh, parking garage with their curtain walls so the pathway is for the most part above that uh, even so it's something like uh, I think it's 10 meters above the water line. Um, so splashing is not really going to, from overtopping is not really a concern at that height. Great to hear, thank you. Uh, one more question to staff on, uh, when we um, uh, vote on this tonight, site, this does not go to council, is that correct? That's correct. Um, it goes back to the director of planning through the delegated, delegated authority bylaw. Uh, it's not automatically approved. We'll still have to, if anything comes up tonight, there's still additional review that's uh, going to be done. And then of course, preparing the site plan agreement, ensuring all conditions are included, et cetera, and uh, acquiring site plan, uh, sorry, site securities before final approval can be done. Thank you. And I just have one last question. And it's about a concern that was raised by um, by a resident in our package. And um, it says that there's a real risk that the vibrations from the sheet piles and other piles will cause damage to foundations and other structural elements of the existing homes. And I just wondered, um, like what happens if the existing homes do get damaged? I know we have our city solicitor on the line or if um, like the applicant, like, I don't know who can answer that. Not seeing any hands. Oh, there's Miss Morley. Yes, please, after you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I'm a little slow on the unmute tonight. Uh, if there is damage that is caused by the developer to neighboring homeowners, certainly the neighboring homeowners would have a cause of action against that developer legally. Uh, the city would have no involvement in that um, liability or any litigation that would ensue. Thank you. So that's civil action, homeowner versus developer. Okay, thank you. I see uh, a hand, Mr. Sorty. Okay, we'll pause on that then and Councillor Hill, I recognize you next. Thank you, uh, through you Chair. I, I, I am kind of wondering about, and maybe you could, uh, um, uh, maybe through staff or I guess I'm, I'm, the fact that it's not service that the gas uh, um, servicing is not yet approved um, is surprised it would it surprises me that this would be here without that so I'm just wondering if, if staff could comment on on why we would bring this forward now without the servicing approval already in place uh, thank you and through you mr. chair um, you are correct, the, the servicing isn't currently in place, uh, though there is a report going to City Council next week from Utilities Kingston, uh, making an ask for additional funding within their capital budget to undertake the work that would make the uh, servicing to this site possible. So depending on uh, how Council votes on that, would uh, obviously determine if servicing uh, was available for this development down the road or not. Thank you. Do you have a supplemental Councillor Hill or you're good for now already? I don't see other committee members at this point. So Councillor Doherty, um, you're welcome to participate if you'd like as well. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity and, and for the questions that have already been asked. Um, today we received a notice, a tornado warning, and this is a structure that we have no experience with. You talked about, uh, we heard about the, um, the corrosion rate and uh, the kind of level of quality that we expected in engineering quality. But I wonder if you could speak to kind of what, uh, uh, what, like kind of what measurements are we using nowadays? Uh, and this this um, development is using is it is it using um, all the past experiences because things are changing when it comes to weather. We're experiencing much more extreme weather. It's only going to increase, and I don't remember receiving 
so many tornado warnings in Kingston. So I wonder how this these proposed structures would stand up in a, in a tornado. Uh, can I answer this? Yep. Please do. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have reached to a point in design now that we would be most probably engaging a wind consultant. Uh, we would be talking to the owner as well. That. I'm, I'm we're talking from an engineering viewpoint. The, uh, the wind tunnel testing normally accounts for uh, historical wind data and it also accounts for the trends which are coming in, in uh, weather pattern changes and all that stuff. So it's a comprehensive study which comes along and tells us that because of these study, uh, these wind patterns and all that stuff, what is at the end of the day uh, you can you can be exposed to. This is the this is the maximum possible extent of the like uh, study that can be done on a building. That this is this is how much uh, of anticipation you can do. Or like in terms of wind loads, this is how much you would be experiencing. And based upon those, the building would be designed. Uh, it is designed, uh, and the design is not only for the building itself, but it's also about regarding the different cladding components that these cladding components would experience this, this much of the pressures and they should be designed accordingly. That's how it's designed. Um, thank you for that. I just also would like to hear a bit more about what kind of quality of concrete will be used. Like we've had a few experiences of concrete rot in, in Kingston and that this property will obviously have more impact by the elements. So could you speak to the quality of, of concrete? Yeah, uh, the design code and uh, the, the concrete design code actually classifies provides uh, different exposure categories of uh, environment. And we have to uh, classify the structure uh, when it, uh, whether it's expo exposure from the ground or exposure from the airborne water or uh, whatever conditions you're uh, considering. So it has to be classified accordingly. And based upon those classification, the uh, it's not the concrete itself only, it's also the how we pro uh, provide the concrete covers and everything which would start changing. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a program under which we consider that this is where the building is going to be located. And this, these are the environmental risk, whether it is coming from uh, above, uh, above from the air or from the ground, or even from, uh, from the trucks, which uh, you're using for uh, sorting the roads and all that stuff. All of them are actually compiled through. Different elements are assigned different environmental categories, exposure categories, and we design accordingly that this is how it would be taken care of. Thank you. Sorry, I do have a couple more questions, if that's okay. Thanks. Um, so this, this kind of construction is really new to Kingston, and I just wonder if we have city um, inspectors during the construction process who have the skills to inspect the construction along the way. I see Mr. Barr has appeared. Thank you and, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think these are all very important questions when considering this development and everything and all the concerns that are associated with this, but I do wanna highlight that manners of construction and construction standards are not regulated by site plan control. Uh, these are all dealt with through the Ontario Building Code and our chief building official is not here tonight to answer these questions, uh, but um, if, if, if there isn't, adequate persons within the department who can um, evaluate something. They do have the ability to go out and, and find the expertise in order to be able to do that. Uh, but uh, our building officials do review high rise construction buildings throughout the city as we do have a number of tower projects currently underway. Um, so uh, I believe that these are important questions. They're just not necessarily uh, applicable through the site plan control process and will be dealt with through the the building code uh, review uh, should this building proceed through to the construction stage. 
Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do appreciate that they're not site plan controlled, but they're kind of going to lead to site plan control because I'm imagining what's if there is a crisis? What's if you all of a sudden have 400 cars trying to get out of, or maybe even more, because it's 400 units, so it could be up to 600, 800 cars trying to get out of there in case of an emergency. So how would the site hand, plan handle something like that? Thank you, and through you, uh, Chair, I see Mr. Tao has um, uh, raised his hand and unmuted his uh, mic here. I think we can probably both answer some questions around this, but the site plan control application is reviewed by emergency services, so fire and rescue, as well as uh, building um, uh, building services. Uh, and there is uh, material and application submitted in support of this application, including uh, a traffic impact study, all reviewing uh, key elements of the site to determine whether or not it meets applicable standards today. Uh, and the review has concluded that applicable standards are being met for the purposes of site plan control, uh, which has led us to where we are today. I am gonna pass this over to Mr. Tad to see if he has anything additional to add to this line of questioning. And I'll, I'll um, to thank you for the question, Councillor Doherty. And yeah, when you talk about um, unique projects, like there's, there's the high rise component, which I think you're right, you know, or Mr. Barr's right staff have certainly in the last number of years had more experience um, dealing with taller buildings. Um, but but certainly the peer component is unique in Kingston, I think. There's really only a couple other kind of developable peers. And so what hasn't really been talked about tonight so much, excuse me, is the conservation authority role in, the, in approving and development and then inspecting and applying their standards related to uh, hazards, uh, dealing with development in and around hazards. So, you know, water, wave uprush, um, erosion, those types of things. So this has gone through the conservation authority process and they have provided a conditional approval with you know, a long list of conditions, much of which um, deals with um, reviewing the detailed design. There is an independent peer reviewer, coastal engineering firm that um, reviewed that process and submissions as well and they would um, continue on and in, in doing peer reviews of the more detailed design around the peer um, and the structural uh, components related to to that so just to give you that understanding as well that the conservation authority who is an expert in um, waterfront development and and dealing with uh, coastal uh, coastal construction matters um, they themselves and also their peer reviewer um, is going to be part and parcel of the building permit review process as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we will have a second round of questions if folks would like, but I would like to ask if you so, Vice Chair Hill, could you take the chair, please? I take the chair and I recognize you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm wondering about the site in terms of the actual construction process. And how is it proposed that the pier, or maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, is it proposed that the pier will be uh, the launching place for the heavy equipment that will be needed to do the construction? So where on the site, essentially, I'm wondering, does the actual construction uh, get based out of? That's me, Mr. Chair. Zalicki, sure, go ahead. <laughs> you, Mr. Chair. Um, the applicant may be able to add more um, to this, but I believe the construction is meant to be done through uh, the King Street access down the main access road um, with, uh, I'm not exactly sure what they intend for staging, but I, I do recall seeing that there was no plans to do um, sort of, uh, I guess, water-based construction from barges. Uh, I don't know if any of that has changed, but uh, as far as I know, it's from the, from the site itself. Is there someone from the... Uh... Applicant side, like this, Mr. Tao. Yeah, I can speak generally, I guess, um, and then maybe the owner, who's um, or one of the owners' representatives, Mr. Sorty, if he wants to speak to it, because he's been more involved with um, some of the initial works, and they have hired a construction, an experienced construction management company who does these types of large-scale projects in in tight proximity in urban settings, for example, where we really don't have a lot of room for staging or um, dealing with e equipment or materials, excess materials. So, um, but generally, 
Um, and just to maybe take a little bit of a step back, provide a bit of um, context. So the intention is to build the project all at once so that you know, everything's mobilized at once. There's not you know, ongoing um, disturbance, you know, build tower one, and then five years later, every, everything gets disturbed again. When you build tower two, for example, it's intended to all be built out at once so that there's kind of that one time period where um, there's disruption. Um, and the intention is in terms of construction build out, I think it's you know, approximately 36 months, um, depending on, um, you know, turning on availability of trades, materials, et cetera. But the site, the subject site itself, just um, to, to reiterate, I think what Mr. Slaggy said, um, the parking lot, the surface parking lot that's there currently is actually part of part of the subject site, so the, the uh, pier site. And so that parking lot would be available essentially for, you know, construction site trailer, um, construction vehicle, uh, worker parking, um, some staging of materials and equipment. So there is that surface parking lot that uh, belongs to, to the project versus uh, it being like a visitor parking lot for the existing townhouses. So that would be available um, for an on-site um, place for, for that type of activity. And then the remainder in terms of the, the rest of the pier site, it'll, it will be dealt with, um, I guess, construction and will be staged up carefully. And that's why they brought on an experienced construction management company to, to deal with that because, you know, we're on King Street. There's not necessarily a lot of convenient places nearby to, to uh, put down or lay down large, large amounts of material equipment, et cetera. So um, that's certainly something that will be important. And, and that ties into concerns we heard about, um, you know, the townhouse residents and, you know, keeping them in the loop. So happy to discuss that too, if that question arises. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm oh, sorry, through you. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm glad, Mr. Tao, you brought that up actually, because that's actually where I was hoping to head in terms of what the interaction of this site is with the adjacent residents, particularly that center parking space that you've mentioned as part of the, the site we're discussing and also the road access from King Street, which I understand is shared between the townhouses and this site. In my estimation, it seems like the heavy amount of heavy traffic, um, as in heavy equipment, parking in that area, coming in and out, would actually severely impede residents' uh, accessibility. So could you just talk to us a bit further about that? Because I can't picture how that could be uh, compatible here. Mr. Tao? Through you, Mr. Chair. Or, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so it's certainly a, a, a somewhat unique situation when there's a single point of access. The driveway is owned, as with the parking lots, owned by um, the pier or part of the pier property. So the townhouses have an easement for access over it. Um, and certainly there's an obligation on the owner's part to um, you know, maintain access, for example, um, maintain services. There are um, some shared water sanitary services uh, that will need to be um, disconnected temporarily during construction while making um, some upgrades to some of that existing infrastructure. Um, and so it will be important for, and that's part of discussions we've had with the townhouse corporate, the condo corporation ready is the intention to set up essentially a liaison with uh, their point person um, as part of the construction management strategy and the construction phasing strategy so that, you know, they, for example, have a point of contact that they can go to. There's going to be clear communication in terms of providing um, their liaison with, you know, here's what's happening the next 30 days. Here's when there's going to be major occurrences happening on site. Um, you know, this is when we anticipate bringing in materials. Or this is when we anticipate there might be a temporary shutoff to services. And certainly that's going to be a, a critical part to ensuring that they can continue to to live and use their uh, residences as best as they can during the construction period so we've you know we've had that conversation we had a um, meeting with them with fcc 40 the condo corporation last fall um, they provided a number of comments which we uh, comments and questions related to a lot of this, this functionality and site mechanics work and we provided that response so those comments um, earlier this year. So the lines of communication are open there and I'm certainly um, happy to continue those conversations and dialogue um, once we get, uh, assuming we get approval and moving towards construction then we uh, have the, the impetus then to set up that formal relationship or liaison. 
Councillor Kiley? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hill, and through you. Okay, that's interesting to me. So with respect, I don't still quite understand how, even with communication, the actual space itself, like I'm thinking just being uh, a visitor to those townhouses in the past, how the type of equipment and materials needed for such vast construction would actually fit, like to be very basic about it. Um, so you mentioned that it would only take 36 months to do this, which being far from an expert on any of uh, this type of high rise construction makes me think that there would be significant storage in that staging area that we've talked about. So I, I'm not pushing you too hard here, but can you give a bit more detail to how that actually happens in such a tight amount of time and literally a tight space? And then I just want to uh, mention here too, I have a question for Ms. Morley later about the potential liaison committee, because I think that there's maybe a city angle if we're talking about shutting off services. So first, literally on the space though, for construction. Can I just get a clarification? Uh, I see a, a hand up from uh, uh, Sandro Sordi. Is, is he part of the applicant the ownership, group? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm part of the ownership. Sorry about that. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. I... Not a problem. My apologies. Thank you, councillors and all members. Uh, with clarification on staging, we will be bringing in barges if additional staging is required outside our ownership footprint. And that will be utilized to stage the heavier equipment, rebar, and other equipment that's required. Uh, barges will be brought in because it's most efficiently to bring in the cranes and all that. Once they are set up, the barges will basically be used to uh, to stage uh, material on an ongoing forward basis. Okay. Yeah. A bit helpful. Um, Councillor Carly, sorry. No, oh, sorry, Councillor Hill. Um, through you. Ms. Morley, I'm wondering about the liaison committee. Earlier to Councillor Osanic, you had mentioned that if any damage was done during construction, it would be a civil matter. But if it is concerning turning off city services or upgrading them, how does the city share liability if we approve this and that's bound to happen vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other residents? Like it, that seems a bit different than potential damage if this is something that will have to happen and we're agreeing to it. Ms. Marley? Thank you. And through you, Vice Chair, are you speaking about shutting off utilities intentionally or... Yeah, that's how, maybe I misunderstood Mr. Tao, but if there's this working group, for lack of a better word, between the condo corp, the construction uh, crew here, and then I presume the city, I recognize that in the process at some point, this will obviously have to happen, but does that then make us liable for uh, approving this? Should, should something go wrong? I'm, I'm thinking just off the top of my head, if the gas has to stay shut off for an unnecessarily long period of time during the winter for example, and, and heating becomes an issue for people who are living uh, adjacent to the site. For you, Mr. Vice Chair, so there are provisions in the Municipal Act that do provide for the disruption of utilities and they provide statutory defenses to municipalities and utility providers for any disruption in utilities. So something quite extraordinary would have to happen in order for the city to not be able to rely on those statutory protections. Okay, okay I'll leave it at that for now. That's helpful, thank you. And I return the chair. Perfect, thank you. Um, alrighty, so are there any final questions from councillors at this point? Seeing none, we'll move to the public portion then. A reminder, each member of the public will have five minutes to speak. We don't do crosstalk as we just did. We'll collect uh, comments and questions from five members of the public, and then we'll go to our staff and the proponent here this evening to seek clarification and answers. And every member of the public who wishes to speak um, please just put up your hand, which is at the bottom. I'm kind of taking the clerk's feel here. She can say it better than I can, but I will remind you that we need your full name and address, please. So Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, for those of the public who are still with us this evening, I will note that, Mr. Chair, we do still have 29 members of the public at this time. Um, if you'd like to speak uh, to the current file on the floor, please raise your hand in Zoom. Again, that's located in the center of your screen when you move the mouse over the Zoom window. Um, and Mr. Chair, I, I know that we have a number of um, speakers this evening as some presentations have been sent in. Uh, just to note to those individuals who have sent in their presentations, if you could please raise your hand in Zoom to add your name to the speakers list. That is how we generate um, the order um, of speakers. That would be appreciated. So Mr. Chair, we'll start with Rudy Wycliffe.
Thank you very much. My name is Rudy Wycliffe. I hope you can hear me. I'm not muted. I live at 1098 King Street West Commodore's Cove, Unit 9. Before I get into my slides, I'd, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the constraints or, or uh, caveats or scope that was, was set out at the beginning of this item. I, um, we certainly understand the limitations of the site planning process as they apply under the Provincial Planning Act. I would like uh, the, the committee, the chair, and, and the members of uh, staff and the developer, I'd like to point out that this is our one and only kick at this particular cat. So this is the last public input for this process period. I would hope you would cut us some slack in terms of some of the ideas that we, we are going to be putting forward this evening. And I would also like to suggest that neither the city nor the developer are limited by the Planning Act in accommodating some of our concerns. Um, so I'll go to my next slide, please. This site is an old wooden pier that is now eroded and damaged and is subject to wave action mitigated by a breakwater that nobody maintains. This will not be another hole in the ground. And the buildings as have already been noted are not limited by height under the, uh, the city zoning bylaw for this property. Next slide. As the only abutting property, we, the residents of the townhomes, have made our concerns known to the city since the initial application of this site plan in 2018. And I can, I can also say that we were involved back in 2007 and 2008, some of us as well. We asked our, our councillor to seek elevation of the site plan to planning committee. And we have followed very closely the conservation authorities permit process and applaud the technical conditions opposed upon the project. Next slide, please. We are not looking to stop this development, but to make sure it proceeds with the least negative impact to our quality of life during a prolonged period of construction. As suggested, uh, sounds like a minimum of 36 months. And I repeat the site plan as our last and only opportunity for scrutiny and input. Next slide. The access and many amenities of this property are shared between the townhouses and the pier property. The one private road access to King Street, utility easements crisscross both properties, irrigation and street lighting are in common. Next slide, please. There will be a prolonged period of construction, potentially 12 hours a day, six days a week for the aforementioned three years plus. We have to live through all of that. There is only one way in and out of, this, of these properties for the residents and for the construction related traffic. Next slide. This is a very small property as Chair Kylie has noted. We will definitely feel the impact of of construction at close quarters. There is very little room for worker parking, storage of material and heavy equipment. Noise, dust, vibration, and heavy equipment traffic will impact us constantly. Next. We, we have identified a number of actions to protect our homes, health and safety during construction in these last three slides that I have. Continuous access for emergency vehicles Mail, waste collection, and our own movement must be maintained safely. Next, we will be sharing our only access road to King Street with heavy construction equipment and traffic. Utility disruptions must be minimized. There should be respect for our private property, lawns, gardens, trees, and they, they need to be maintained in good condition. On-site security will be needed. And we strongly suggest that there needs to be a parking plan given the limitations in space. And the last slide, a pre-construction survey of our buildings condition and property conditions is critical. I was really pleased to hear from the developers team that the concept of a liaison uh, entity and ongoing real-time communications 
is a, a definite possibility. So, and with cooperation communications, the critical and the critical assistance of the city, there can be a safe and uneventful construction period. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and perfectly timed. I failed to give you a 30 second warning, which I normally do, and you were just, just right at five minutes. So I appreciate that. And going forward, I'll, I'll tell folks when they have 30 seconds. And thanks for keeping it within site plan. That's appreciated. Madam Clerk, who do we have next? Mr. Chair, through you next to speak is Nicole Florent, followed by Rosemary Kozak. I'm Nicole Florent. I live at 1098 King Street West, Unit 33. My contribution deals with emergencies, evacuations, safety, and security. Time is limited, so I will only highlight the more notable items as you have a copy of the full presentation, including the appendix. Next. I will underscore here that the proposed peer development is a narrow, finger-like property far into Lake Ontario, and it is surrounded by water on three sides. All of the property features described above have a significant impact on fire and safety emergencies, evacuations, and general safety issues. Next. As an additional consideration, I would remind participants of the eight buildings, high rises, except for one, along the Kingston waterfront, which have sunk or had collapse issues or developed water infiltration issues in their underground after the building's completion, with at least one of them still pumping out water to this day. Next. Future condo owners, current neighbors, users and visitors to the pier and other Kingstonians all depend on due diligence by the planning committee and the city council in the form of a long-term design and increased scrutiny to protect their safety, health and well-being, needs in times of emergencies, municipal integration, and to avert long-term financial debacles for all parties. Next. As you can see, many possible urgent situations must be considered and factored into the plans. Next. The diagram on the top left shows the waterfront trail in blue, the main access road and turnaround on the east side in pink, with the two towers A and B in the middle of the pier. At the pier end, the access road is narrow, only 20 feet wide, and it is unlikely that two of the wide emergency vehicles can pass at the same time. It is insufficient for the amount and frequency of traffic in normal times or during an emergency. The small diagram on the right shows the turning radius of a Kingston fire and rescue truck. You do the math as to whether the back of the fire truck would clip the building and how much scale will be needed to make the turnaround in that big vehicle at the very tip of the pier beside a 10 meter drop into eight meters of water. Next. If the North Tower experiences an emergency that is important enough to block the main access road, the South Building is completely cut off. Therefore, the occupants of the South Tower are not going anywhere anytime soon, and no one is getting in to help them. And notably, the ladders on Kingston's fire trucks only reach up to the seventh floor. Next. There are a number of potential threats which could require em emergency evacuation from the Twin Towers. Next. This slide gives you an idea of the magnitude and complexity of an evacuation procedure should one be required. The dual tower section of the single access road is 20 feet wide. Potentially, there could be roughly 500 plus people and 400 plus cars needing to get out quickly while at the same time, an army of emergency vehicles is trying to get in, intent on starting their rescue efforts. Next. To recap, there is no access road on the west side of the pier, ergo no secondary exit path. The access road and the waterfront trail are too close to the edge, and the turnaround at the tip of the pier is clearly an overreach in design. Note that the towers protrude far out into Lake Ontario, subject to winds that reached 90 to 100 kilometers an hour this year and created risks from flying debris and damage to structures. Next and final slide. This proposal, if approved, would impact many homes and many people in and near the complex, users of the pier and the waterfront trail, 
as well as all residents of Kingston. As in many community professions, the mayor and the councillors are ultimately accountable to and for Kingston citizens and residents. The Greek dictum, above all, do no harm, is definitely a consideration in a massive development project such as this one, not just for the five-year post-construction milestone, but at the 50-year mark up to the 100th. Next and end. The next section just takes you into the appendices. Thank you very much, Ms. Florham. Just under five minutes. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, next to speak is Rosemary Kozak, followed by John Vines. Good evening, uh, councillors. My name is Rosemary Kozak, residing at 1098 King Street West, Unit 14. I plan to present to you a brief overview of the conditional permit terms from the CRCA as they affect this site plan application. Because this site um, was designated as an environmental protection area, the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority had to be consulted and had to give permission for this application to go ahead. Next slide, please. The 36 Ontario Conservation Authorities have a mandated duty to protect watersheds, life and property from natural hazards and protect the environment for future generations. The CRCA staff refused the site plan permit that was presented to them primarily for the reasons listed on the slide. On appeal, the CRCA board approved the site plan subject to 14 conditions. CRCA must clear the conditions of the permit before the city grants a building permit. Next slide. The overarching principle um, of their conditions is that final engineering design details will be submitted to the city and CRCA for review and approval. Um, the staff report says most technical aspects have been addressed. What issues are still outstanding? Are they only CRCA conditions? On page 24 of, of the staff report, they say further, further study will be required to develop these detailed plans, which will occur through the building permit stage. And that's the stage at which the public has no input whatsoever. Next slide, please. Um, the monitoring and maintenance plan lists 14 items. These are the first Five, and I'm not going to go through every one of them except to mention a few things. Number two, the local elevation of the curtain wall, which goes, as I understand it goes around the parking levels to be assessed and inspected every five years. And then this has to go on for the hundred years of the design. The third item number three says the legal instrument is developed as requiring the legal owners of the development to carry out the MMP plan. Uh, eventually, the owners will be the condo corporation, that is to say the owners. Do these owners or prospective owners know about this at the time of purchase, that they will be responsible for all the monitoring, inspection and maintenance of all the key structural components of the development? These are all very different from a city lot situation, and there are many unknown costs in this unique site. Next, please. Uh, the next are items six to eight. Uh, I draw your attention to number eight about construction and the dewatering plan. Uh, in uh, information from the CRCA, we understand there's to be a sediment basin, a settling basin for dewatering that comes out of the site. Well, how is that going to be controlled? Where will that be? And where will the snow go? There, there isn't enough room for snow to be uh, stored or piled up on the site. Uh, the snow is supposed to be removed entirely because space is so limited. Next. Uh, the last six M&M um, uh, &M, uh, monitoring and maintenance plans uh, are, are well, I'll address the last one. The permit validity for five years from the CRCA with annual progress reports to be submitted to them. Item number 13 uh, lists further agencies who have to be, um, be uh, consulted with, especially as relates to in-water work. And on my final slide, 
uh, it's our recommendations to site planning that your committee and council that there be strict city enforcement and inspection of all 14 CRCA conditions, especially the geotechnical detail design and construction. That there is open community com communication, that the city be guided by its own waterfront master plan, which says that they're going to enhance and protect the terrestrial and aquatic environments. And importantly, again, that there is open public and timely reporting of compliance with all of these conditions to ensure the protection of residents of the proposed towers and city taxpayers from risks and added costs resulting from design, construction, maintenance, and inspection inadequacies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, that is three folks who've spoken, two more, and then we'll go to our staff and the, the team that's here with us from the owner's group to hear responses. So who do we have for the next two people, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next to speak is John Vines, followed by Rob Caldwell. Mr. Vines, whenever you're ready. Apologies, Mr. Chair, I'm just asking Mr. Vines to unmute. Okay, is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is John Vines. I live at 1098 King Street West, Unit 13. As an introduction, let us look take a look at the various buildings and facilities shown in the photo that are located around Elevator Bay, also known as Cataraki Bay. Top centre is the bay, Elevator Bay Pier. The dual towers will be located on the south end of the Elevator Bay Pier. Lower down in the photo is the breakwater that the tenuous wave from Lake Ontario. Note also in the photo the location of the settling pond from the city owned sewage plant, the front road short line and the city pathway adjacent to 1098 King Street West. These are all protected from Lake Ontario waves by the breakwater. My emphasis is on the potential 100 year wave threats to the dual towers that originate from Lake Ontario. Future residents of the dual towers will have to pay the costs of mitigation due to failure of the breakwater, the retaining walls of the pier, and the foundation that support the dual towers. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, we missed one of it. That's right. I've done that one. Let's go to the next one. The breakwater was constructed in 1930 by the federal government to attenuate the waves from Lake Ontario. The purpose was to protect the grain elevator pier and to calm, and to calm the waters. Sorry. To, put, to calm the waters of, of the maneuvering lakers and grain barges. A failure of the breakwater due to rock dispersal must be considered as a threat from waves to long-term stability of the proposed development and other structures bordering Elevator Bay. The owners of the breakwater, which is a bit of a problem because it could be the federal government, the provincial, provincial government or the city, which hasn't, we haven't been able to clear that one up, need to publish their plans to inspect and repair the breakwater. Riggs Engineering provided in the CRCA activities a wave analysis to CRCA in 2021. Solution, next one. Solutions from the SL Engineering port and recommendations included the CRCA permit f 19419 lo in early 2021, 
CRCA received a report from SJL Engineering that defined the threats from wave action and ice on the pier walls, recommended a way to rehabilitate and retaining walls of the pier, proposed the placing of an underwater rock berm around the periphery of the sheet piling, recommended ongoing inspections of the tower foundations and the pier walls throughout the 100-year life of the span of the development, and also recommended that there be a repair plan for the breakwater. Also included in the permit are conditions that the owners of the dual towers must follow to monitor and maintain the state of the pier walls and foundations for 100 years. Next, the last slide. One of the conditions that CRCA and the city have proposed in the site plan approval is that an ongoing five-year inspection and maintenance plan be established with the dual tower foundations and pier walls. This would be for the projected 100 years lifespan of the structure. The proposed 100 year time inspections, maintenance and associate, associated seconds, are unusual for a condominium high rise and are due to the unique marine location of the structures. Therefore, we ask that <coughs> potential owners of the dual tires should know before purchase if the required inspection and maintenance plan will appear and the ongoing potential costs. The owners of the breakwater need a plan to inspect and repair the breakwater since failure would impact on the maintenance of the pier walls and the tower fund. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vines. Yes, I'll interrupt you there actually at five minutes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Final person at this moment, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chair, uh, next to speak is Rob Caldwell. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your time this evening. My name is Rob Caldwell, and I reside at 1098 King Street West, Unit 8. These are, the, these are the topics that I will be addressing, beginning with the parking. Next slide. An, earl an earlier site plan draft submission for the Commodore's Cove neighborhood included a three-story parking structure built on the central parking lot plan of subdivision parcels 21 to 45. The current submission no longer includes this parking structure. That is good. Nevertheless, if the site plan is approved, we request it officially exclude the construction of any buildings in this area. The roadways at 1098 King Street West are private, but designated as fire routes. During construction, the fire routes may be blocked by trade persons, cars, and trucks, as there is no other parking available on site. We request that city police be put on notice that they must vigorously enforce the no parking on fire route bylaw. Next. The two-story parking garage with the third level, uh, uh, level on which the towers are gonna to be constructed uh, now includes a barn-like corrugated steel roof. So in fact, the top of that roof is equivalent of 30 meters, uh, sorry, 12 meters above uh, water or grade, and that results in a four or five story slab sided structure immediately adjacent to the townhomes. We request that the site plan agreement mandate removal of the roof structure. Next. City and Commoners Cove utilities are on land owned by the peer property developer but protected by easements. Staff estimates 3.6 million will be required to increase natural gas capacity. How much will the developer have to pay for the soft site work? Is staff confident other utilities, sewer, water, electrical have capacity? I raise that point because when the bylaw was improved in 2007, staff said there was sufficient capacity, including natural gas. A previous site plan included geothermal heating. Why has that, that alternative been discarded? We request that the existing easements be recognized and affirmed within the site plan control agreement and that the developer property owner also make formal commitment in that same document to not obstruct or otherwise fetter these easements. We believe that the cost sharing ratio for the expansion of natural gas capacity should also be stipulated in the site plan agreement. Next. Next. Landscaping of the Commerce Cove neighborhood is mature with trees and shrubs that have 30 years of growth. Many are planted along the property lines as it was an integrated development initially. 
In June of 2021, we requested the developer retain trees and landscaping on and near the property lines with Commerce Cove, which will avoid destroying natural greenery consistent with the city's policies of environmental sensitivity without hampering the developer. We would like the site plan agreement to include specific direction that these trees and shrubs with one, within one meter of the property lines be protected. This would seem a reasonable request given that the Commodore's Cove green space was included in the calculation of the 30% lot coverage permitted in the zoning bylaw for the pure property. Next. The $250,000 financial security deposit is completely inadequate to protect the city and its residents from the potential remediation cost or civil liability if something should go wrong with the construction of this $200 million plus project. We suggest that the financial security deposit payment be calculated on a per residential unit basis. Next. The staff report as part of the bylaw approval in 2008 contained 42 conditions. A number of those conditions have not been met by the developer and we would request that in the site plan agreement, the city should require that past failures in compliance be rectified. For example, the developer was supposed to pay for the upgrade of the King Street intersection, including the traffic lights. And yet we, the taxpayers did. Next and final slide, please. The 2007 bylaw approval stipulated that approval of the site plan be elevated to council. In 2019, Councilor Doherty requested site plan approval be bumped up to the planning committee. Planning committee should retain the right and responsibility of final approval to the site plan control agreement. Our recommendations. Do not approve in principle the site plan. 30 seconds, please. Planning committee should retain the right of final approval. Thank you for your consideration of these requests and have a good evening. Thank you very much. And thanks for your patience and me interrupting you. I just wanna keep us all on the same amount of time. So who would like to take the first crack at responding to the many points made? Mr. Zalegi, there you are, right after you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I will have the first crack at it. And uh, if I miss anything or if my colleagues um, want to supplement my answers and certainly the uh, applicant uh, team, they may have some responses as well. I welcome uh, their additions. Uh, with respect to the comments on construction, uh, co uh, construction conditions, uh, unfortunately, this is something that we are a little hamstrung under the site plan control, uh, the site, the planning act uh, in terms of uh, including new conditions under the uh, within the site plan agreement. However, um, we will look back to the um, uh, go back to the applicant in trying to uh, discuss a construction management plan and something that they can, uh, it would be something they would volunteer to do. Uh, but we're a little hamstrung by the uh, powers provided by various city bylaws and the, uh, the act. Uh, with respect to fire access, the uh, the, circul the application was circulated to the fire services uh, department. And I also recently had a conversation uh, with my colleague in fire services. Um, they confirmed that it did meet the, the building code and fire code requirements. Um, and to that, that includes uh, fire rating the building to uh, be able to contain uh, fires for a certain period of time. I believe it's uh, one hour per unit with automatic closing doors. There's uh, included a sprinkler system on top of that within the building. Uh, within, with uh, regards to access, the, um, the turnaround at the end of the pier is not actually part of the fire route. Um, the, the act, as I understand it, require, or the code requires a, at least one access to, uh, to access all buildings on the site, which is provided through that fire access route. And any route that is longer than nine, uh, 90 meters requires uh, turnarounds. And in this case, there are two turnarounds, one which is just to the um, north of the, of the development project where the commercial uh, property is. The other is the area between the two uh, buildings. So they don't look to take the, they wouldn't look to take the fire truck necessarily around that little loop at the end. They would be backing up and uh, going on a, a three point turn, I guess, uh, between those two buildings. Uh, in addition, uh, as I was informed, the uh, ladder on a Kingston truck actually reaches 10 stories. And this, so this is not a unique situation in terms of access to um, high rise buildings this is something that they are prepared to, prepared for. I don't know the details of it, but uh, certainly buildings over 10 stories exist in Kingston. And so uh, they wouldn't necessarily be relying on uh, that 
for, for fire safety. Um, I believe there was a comment on the monitoring and maintenance plan that would be made a, uh, a condition of the, uh, obviously that's part of the CRCA conditional permit, but that would also be integrated into the site plan agreement. And that would also be uh, as part of the future condo agreement so that owners would be aware of the responsibilities for maintenance of their properties, including the structural uh, elements based out of the maintenance and monitoring plan. Um, with regards to the CRCA conditional permit, uh, there is, as part of the conditions, regular reporting throughout the construction period. Uh, I believe it's once a year for updates from the uh, developer to the CRCA and city staff. Um, there was a question about what outstanding condition or what outstanding conditions uh, that were referenced in the uh, report this evening. As I mentioned, the main outstanding item is the gas servicing. Um, beyond that, there are continued uh, uh, analyses and reports that will be done through the detailed analysis stage. I recognize that it's not necessarily a public um, a public process. However, those reviews are effectively guaranteed by the fact that uh, the development must meet must meet the plans and the various codes that are enforced by our partner uh, agencies and departments. Uh, with regards to snow, uh, there is no snow storage on site. There is a um, going to be latent heat system which will melt the snow for the access routes and turnaround areas, uh, which will then be uh, dealt with as any uh, stormwater management um, or stormwater uh, water would be on site, which is directed to uh, internal uh, pipes and through a uh, storm scepter for quality control and then eventually uh, let out to the uh, to the lake. Um, the applicants, start, uh, Mr. Seabrook may want to add to this a little later, but in terms of wave issues for the break water, uh, I believe the report did assess a deteriorating condition of the breakwater and the effects that would have on, on the, uh, the pier itself. Uh, there's also a small breakwater at the south end of the, uh, of the pier within the property boundaries. Uh, I'm not sure, there may be some clarification. I thought maintenance of the, of the breakwater was dealing with that breakwater, not necessarily the one at the uh, end of the bay. Uh, but again, I believe the deterioration of that, of that uh, breakwater was taken into account in their uh, assessment. Uh, with regards to the surface parking area, <clears throat> where there is no more, no longer a building um, uh, proposed, the approval, if approved as is, would include the, the surface uh, parking area and any development would have to follow those uh, approved plans. So there would be no uh, ability to, uh, to construct a building in that space unless a site plan amendment uh, came forward at a later date. Um, all existing agreements on site in, uh, from conditions from previous uh, approvals will have to will remain with the lands and the owner will be uh, responsible for satisfying those conditions, maintaining easements or whatever other agreements that exist between the condo corporation and the subject site for the subject owners. Uh, the site plan agreement will also include a tree protection plan, which will identify all the trees that are, are to be retained. Uh, as I mentioned again, uh, there are four that will be removed due to uh, the infrastructure works, but that tree protection plan is included in the approval. And finally, uh, with regards to securities, there is an upset limit on the securities uh, through the uh, site plan um, uh, bylaw, uh, which limits it to $250,000 for on-site works. However, uh, there is the ability for the city to levy tax um, against the owner in the event of, uh, of a, uh, I expect my colleagues can speak a little bit more to this week, but against a, uh, a serious issue. <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost of words right now, but um, it's not simply the securities, but those are held against the property um, in the meantime, and there are other uh, tools at the disposal of the city um, beyond that. I think that's it for me. If my colleagues would like to uh, add to that, I welcome to. All right, I see another hand, Mr. Uliana. I also saw Mr. Park appear and then disappear. So who would like to take the, the next round? 
Yeah, I, I've unmuted, so maybe I can uh, I can speak to some of the items. Please do. Okay. Um, the uh, as you've heard, uh, the developer uh, and through our communication with FCC forty, uh, that's the uh, condominium corporation, um, and uh, following approval of the site plan agreement, we would be uh, going forward uh, with a liaison committee. Uh, between FCC 40 and the developer, because there will be a lot of items that will need to be worked out and sorted through and communications and, and understanding. And, uh, and uh, because we are sensitive to the nature of the concerns that they have raised, say, for example, access, maintenance of, or the level of maintenance of the access road until the project uh, has been built out and that whole access road is then finally rebuilt to finish standards. Um, what if there's a servicing uh, interruption? When, how long, uh, and so on. So yes, there are a lot of things. So that, that particular committee makes a lot of sense and the developer is, uh, is supportive of that. Um, yes, the CRCA board did deal with, with this. Staff had a technical reason why they could not recommend and, and told us that uh, the decision would have to be made by the board. And so we've gone through that long lengthy process and the end decision that you have is in front of you, which is a, a, an approval with a whole number of, uh, of, of conditions and peer review requirements. So, um, uh, and I believe that the city whether in whole or in part, I'm not sure until we see the site plan agreement will incorporate the, the, the items raised by the conservation authority. Um, as to ownership of future, um, not ownership, but notification of future ownerships. Um, in Kingston, in the past, uh, there have been cases where uh, notices have been put on title uh, in the deed in terms of things that will happen at some time in the future. Um, a case in point is, for example, the, the third crossing. Uh, the people who then live uh, uh, in the, who were bought in the subdivision in what used to be Pittsburgh Township, now Kingston East, um, in fact, had been advised on title that this would happen. Um, so uh, there's no reason why this cannot happen in this particular case in terms of Put, uh, advising people on title as, as, um, as um, su suggested. Um, the uh, gas, and there is a report coming forward, I believe next week, uh, I believe to council and uh, about the nature of expansion to the service. I do note that in 2007, when the forest group was doing the project, there was apparently capacity available at that time. And also there is an agreement on title that predates even that, goes back to the 1980s, which um, uh, uh, requires the developer to uh, let Kingston Utilities know when they are going forward with the project so that the gas, appropriate gas services can be assured and be, and be in place. So there's, there's a number of, of I mean, there's a history in terms of trying to work this through the system. It's unfortunate that since 2007 to now, this, this has arose, at least, at least from the developer's perspective. Um, and um, I think I'll now I'll pass it over to some of the other members of the team to deal with the, speak to things like the landscaping and the, uh, and the structural uh, um, uh, wave uprush and the breakwater issues. So, um, okay. And Mr. Seabrook, before you begin, I'll say about 10 minutes left and we'll move back to the public. So just keep that in mind, please. 10 minutes for this section. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll try to keep this short. There were a couple of questions that came up with respect to, I think, wave action and, and the condition of the pier. And so the plan is, of course, to, I guess, replace certain portions of the pier wall with new sheet pile, repair other areas, uh, rehabilitate, and, um, and provide some relief with the, the rock berm. So there is certainly uh, a, an, a plan to provide a very robust pier wall uh, to withstand the wave uh, stresses in this area. With respect to the, the offshore breakwater, yes, it does provide protection to this basin. 
because we really don't have control over the, re the repair or the maintenance of that structure, we did look at a considerable degradation of it with respect to wave action at the site. We assumed that it would be deteriorated to an elevation of 72 meters. Uh, just for reference uh, conditions, um, low water datum is 74.2. So that would be two meters below the lowest typical water that we would see in the basin. So that would allow quite um, increased wave transmission into the area. And we looked at our, um, our elevations and our structure with, uh, with respect to those conditions that we would uh, expect. Um, the, the point I guess to make here uh, related is the elevation of the structure itself. Uh, the existing pier walls are at an elevation of about 76.9 with the raft slab on top, sorry, 77 and change. With the raft slab on top, the top of the raft slab would be at elevation 78. And there is also a structural parapet wall that would take that elevation 78.95 roughly, I believe. Um, high water levels on Lake Ontario are on the order of 76 meters for the 100 year wave, or for the 100 year condition. Most of the shorelines in Kingston, you'll see these, um, these piers are on the order of 76.5 to uh, 76, even some of them that low. So they do get over top quite a bit. This structure will be well above that water level. And with those conditions in place, we have good protection against the condition, even where that breakwater is deteriorated to elevation 72.0 meters. And this, this also relieves the, the walkways and whatnot from from overtopping and, and the associated dangers. Um, I think that's, hopefully that addresses a few of those questions. Thank you, it does. And Mr. Cassie, I see your hand and we'll say five more minutes, please. Yes, uh, thanks. I, I'd just like to add uh, something to um, the comment from Nicole uh, Florent. Um, I know that Mike has uh, spoken about the uh, fire route uh, something to keep in mind as well is that <clears throat> we are dealing here with the, uh, the part three building, um, part three OBC building. So it's a non-combustible uh, uh, material. So going from um, concrete uh, slabs to uh, concrete cladding, uh, non-combustible insulation. So that's uh, <clears throat> probably something that will attenuate the 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 uh, the, um, the fear to uh, let's say you know. Imagine a, a catastrophic uh, fire that would uh, uh, prevent the fire trucks from or uh, people from moving from one part to another. Um, and uh, yeah, the other, uh, the uh, I'd like to <coughs> give my opinion on um, a comment from Rob uh, Caldwell, where he uh, <clears throat> where he uh, raised the issue of the enclosure for the parking, the surface parking at the third floor of the podium. Um, so uh, this is something uh, I am personally in favor of. I just want to raise this, uh, uh, um, my opinion. Uh, so we, uh, if, if uh, th this has been uh, required by the city based on, I believe, uh, 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 some uh, old uh, zoning where we require to cover all the uh, surface parking. So if we, if the city is uh, is willing to give us some leeway there to remove that structure, I think it would make the development a little bit better. Uh, where we have, you know, we will uh, we will uh, um, uh, we will enrich it with landscaping around all those parking spaces where we uh, we will create a more uh, friendly environment rather than having that uh, structure just for the sake of covering those spaces and uh, that's it that's that's all what i have okay thank you then final word goes to mr sorty i guess what mr cassie was saying was that the reason we covered that space is because it was a city requirement that told us we had to cover it our initial design was not to have that rooftop over that uh, uh, that level of parking, but we had to put it as a city requirement from an old bylaw that existed. So if, if the city and council is happy with having that removed, we will gladly more than accommodate the requests of our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thanks for the thorough responses. We will look to the clerk for additional members of the public. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, I will note that we just have two hands raised at this time, so I'll just do a final call. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak uh, to the application, if you could please raise your hand in Zoom so that we may um, know how many hands are left um, to hear from. Perfect. And while you do the final call, I'll look for a motion to extend the meeting till completion. It's almost 11. So, Councillor Osanic, moved by Councillor Hill. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, that's Councillor Chappelle opposed. Madam Clerk, we have two individuals only. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have three hands at this time. So we'll begin with Donald Beatty, followed by Dennis Friesen. Good evening, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Don Beatty. I live in Commodore's Cove, 1098 King West. If you have a, a hard copy of the presentation, you might want to turn to the last presentation in the copies. Uh, it makes note taking a little easier if, if you would like to do that. I'm going to speak about the need for formal liaison procedures in the peer project. Next, please. I'm going to suggest how to handle coordination of construction activity, potential disputes, potential damage to our homes. We are frankly concerned about foundation cracks from pile driving. This leads to requesting the city to add a condition at the site plan phase to set up a liaison committee with procedures as a condition of site plan approval. Next, please. Disputes always arise but success depends on how we handle them. This project runs right through the center of our community, so it's important to us. We can work with the developer in a collaborative partnership, but frankly, we worry about a David and Goliath relationship. Next, please. We need a three-way dispute resolution process. City, developer, and FCC 40 Commodore's Cove and I believe strongly it should be chaired by the city. If we have regular scheduled meetings, they will bring up issues early before they get big, but also a separate process for handling emergency situations. Issues will be managed as routine matters, not as exceptions requiring lawyers. At present, most of our communication with the developer is through his lawyer, I'd like to see something else, a regular working relationship. Next, please. Making it work means that each of the three has to designate an individual with authority to make decisions. Our suggestion, the developer site manager, a senior city official, and an FCC 40 director. Everything flows through the single point of contact, which means, for example, the developer does not get 10 phone calls about the same thing. I believe strongly the city needs to ensure that this liaison operates effectively. Otherwise, the developer may have little reason to take it seriously. Next, please. That three-way relationship can work if we start with mutual respect. And what keeps it working is regular communications. Things are always being brought up right away. It will evolve, we know that, but with any luck, the designated individuals will get to know and trust each other. Next, please. The benefits, those regular meetings allow fast communication, simple communication, here are four of the sorts of things that, that we would see the committee working with. And I can't straight stress this enough. A trusting relationship can be created. Next, please. Why should the city care? Well, there's a lot of precedent. Um, there are three examples here. And we have details about um, how those work. There, there is a 17-page agreement with one of them you might be interested in we'd be happy to hear from you. If the project goes awry, the city had better be there right away. The worst case would be a half completed building. Remember, this is the fourth developer to try. 
effective liaison will minimize the city's risk. Next, please. The last slide is the action plan. You'll notice that one word appears three times. The city to define the process in consultation. The city to require the liaison as a condition of site plan approval. If this is done, we all win. But in my opinion, only the city can make it happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. I should mention that anyone tonight who has given a PowerPoint, you're more than welcome to submit it to the city for official correspondence. And I will request as chair that they are circulated to members of the committee for uh, our own records and to, to have something that we can refer to if needed in the future. So Madam Clerk, two more individuals to speak and then we'll move to response. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you next to speak. I apologize, I just lost the individual's name. Next to speak is Dennis Friesen. Uh, good evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Dennis Friesen and I live at 1098 King Street West at Commodore's Cove, Unit 31. Uh, next slide, please. I want to speak to the impact of the Elevator Bay development on the Kingston Waterfront Trail, seen here passing through Lake Ontario Park. Next slide, please. At Commodore's Cove, the trail extends along the east and west sides of the townhouse complex in a six meter wide strip deeded to the city by the original developer. Next slide. Previous developers envisaged a continuation of this pathway around the perimeter of the pier with widths of three meters compared to the 1.5 meter wide pathway in the current plan. Next slide, please. Notwithstanding approval of the city planning staff and the accessibility advisory committee of the site plan before you, I hope to just demonstrate to you that the current plan has significant limitations in accessibility and safety, as well as utility to users. Next slide, please. This slide shows the elevator bay pier, townhouses, waterfront trail and site plan. KWD proposed to build to the water's edge on all sides of the pier. The trail segments at Commodore's Cove will be linked by a cross pier path at the north end and a perimeter path around the pier atop a two-story parking garage, three stories above the water. Next. And next. Our concerns with this plan are the following. Next, please. The narrow pathway puts passing or meeting other users dangerously close, especially where bicycles are involved. The crosswalk at the base of the ramp puts users at risk from cars descending at speed. Sharp corners are also difficult for cyclists and are especially dangerous when they meet other users. A stairway returns users to the water's edge on the west side, limiting accessibility for cyclists, wheelchairs, bushwalkers, and prams. The ramp to the perimeter is narrow and steep and three stories above the water. To return to grade on the west side, users must descend two flights of stairs or use an elevator, again, limiting accessibility. Next slide, please. The cross pier path shown here in blue, uh, for this, this the cross pier path, these issues can be resolved by, next please, installing a clearly marked full intersection crosswalk together with a speed bump at the base of the ramp. By widening the pathway, removing the sharp corners and the stairs, and replacing them with a broader pathway with angled corners and a ramp. Next slide, please. We also have concerns with the perimeter pathway. This is an elevation of the structure on the pier from the site plan showing the two levels of parking garage on top of which is the perimeter path and the access road to the tower lobbies. These are accessed by ramps. Next slide. The pathway is bounded by a barrier at water's edge and separated from the road by a curb. An adult cyclist typically sits almost as high as the barrier. With cars on one side and other users on the pathway, cyclists are at particular risk. Next slide, please. This elevation illustrates the narrowness of the pathway on the current pier apron. Next slide. We would like to suggest an alternative design that would resolve these concerns. That is, next, installing a cantilevered pathway at grade by extending the raft slab on which the entire structure is built by at least three meters over the water and possibly also repurposing this mechanical corridor. 
This would make the pathway accessible and safe to all users for all manner of uses, including angling at the water's edge as we often see at present on the pier. Next slide, please. This is how a cantilevered path at grade would extend around the pier. It would link at grade to the existing trail on the east side and the path at grade shown in the site plan on the west side. Next slide. Other high rise buildings in the city have setbacks that have purposely allowed for a broad pathway at water's edge, such as these along Ontario Street. Next please. In Portsmouth and on King Street West. Next slide. What will the waterfront pathway ultimately look like in, this, in the approved plan for the elevator bay. We at Commodore's Cove see many and all manner of users passing along the water, the pathway behind our townhomes. Will council approve a plan that offers a bare minimum in accessibility, safety and utility to those users? Where users are constricted to a narrow pathway with few opportunity, opportunities to linger seconds, fish, please. or otherwise enjoy the trail? where they are removed from the water's edge by three stories and perched dangerously above the water, where access is constrained to those who can maneuver at a steep ramp or stairs, or will the city mandate that the same standards of accessibility, safety, and utility seen elsewhere along the waterfront trail be applied to this site as well, if and when the site is, a plan is approved. Thank you for your consideration. Perfectly timed. All presentations and I have it right on, on the money in terms of timing. So thank you for that. And also to everyone for keeping it. It's been very productive and positive in that way. And I want to encourage folks uh, because it makes our job easy if we don't have to call too many things out of order and so far so good. And with that, we'll go to the final presentation from the public tonight, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Chair, last to speak is Vicki Schmolka. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the patience of the committee. And I have to say, I stepped away to do some work. So I might have missed some things, but I have three issues. One of them follows immediately on the presentation you just heard. It seems to me the city has just invested a lot of money in Lake Ontario Park and it's going to invest money in Breakwater Park, all of which are going to have three meter wide uh, multi use pathways. And I would like to understand whether council and this committee can say no to a 1.5 meter pathway as part of the site plan control process. I don't, I don't really understand that. Um, and because I stepped away, I don't know if anybody followed up on the bird strikes, but I didn't really understand the answer to Councillor Osanic's question earlier that it only goes up 12 meters or something. Why aren't all the windows preventing bird strikes? I mean, it seems to me this building is in a bird pathway we know migratory birds come into um, where the Rideau Trail starts at uh, the Marshlands Conservation Area in great numbers. So do they all fly only low? I, I, I'm unclear about that. And I'm wondering if while I was away, uh, someone raised that issue. It's, um, I, I, and again, does council have the right to say, you need to make this a bird friendly building from top to bottom and not only that small portion that was talked about. And the last thing is my obsession today is snow clearing because I live in a community where snow cannot be easily removed and where it has to be trucked out when it accumulates. And has anyone discussed what the snow clearing plans are for this property? And if I missed it, I'm really sorry, but I really worry that snow is gonna be pushed into the water, You know, snow that's full of brick and sand and oil from cars and salt from the salting of, um, the roadways and that's just not okay. So what, what is being done to manage snow removal? And those are all my questions. And again, I would really like to understand from, from staff what council's role is here in terms of, for instance, demanding the three meter wide pathway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Schmolka. And again, you took the time tonight and stayed with us for many, many hours, including the proponents, of course, who uh, we'll have a chance to respond, but first we'll look to our staff. And on my screen, I'm not seeing anyone pop up. Maybe I can't see everyone. Mr. Zalegi, there you are. Yeah. Please. Sorry, I was uh, just writing something down. Um, with respect to, uh, I guess, first, quickly, uh, with the snow clearing um, that was addressed a little bit earlier, there will be uh, heaters under a lot of the access areas. Um, that will melt the snow, which will then be directed toward the uh, general stormwater management uh, on site. Uh, so it's not necessarily a question of um, snow storage on this site as there may be in, in other areas. Um, with respect to the pathway, um, 
when this circulation, when this application first through uh, pre-consultation, but then through um, just general technical review, it was sent to our uh, parks department and they confirmed and agreed that the initial agreement that uh, came out of the site plan agreement back in the late 80s, um, the easement, the 1.5 meter easement uh, was in line with that agreement. Um, just for a little, uh, or just to understand collectively, at that time, uh, the developer uh, was conveyed, I think it was about 13% of the lands uh, to the city, which are the areas behind the uh, townhouses. Uh, that make up the pathway now. Um, there was also a half acre portion of land across uh, north of King Street, which were some wetlands which were conveyed to the city, as well as the access easement that uh, we are discussing today. Um, in addition, through technical review, the uh, Parks uh, Department, uh, again, agreed to and signed off on the plans um, as they are, are drawn. Excuse me. Um, in addition, uh, with respect to the proposal to uh, extend or cantilever the, um, the pathway around the, the property uh, that raises several issues. In part, um, it doesn't comply with the CRCA conditional permit. Uh, so they would have to go through that process again. Um, in addition, I believe there would be, considering where it was uh, located, there would be some severe uh, wave action issues at that height. Um, so I'm not sure it's, it's actually the best plan, even if it was possible, which in this sense, I don't, uh, I don't believe it is. It also encroaches beyond the property lines, um, of, of the owner's property. Um, so there are a lot of technical issues that arise from that proposal. Um, beyond that, uh, I believe that was it for me. Uh, I, th I know some of my other colleagues will respond to uh, some of the other items. Perhaps, Mr. Park, you'd like to take. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know some of the the items that um, have have been raised today. There was a question about, you know, what what the role of committee is. What can they do here? Uh, what's their ability? So, uh, if if we sort of go back to the beginning of what's it within the scope of, um, you know, the the permissions within site plan approval. Uh, for instance, the, the request about uh, put, putting in bird reflective glass. Now, it's, it's not a requirement under any of our zoning bylaw, but it's certainly if it was uh, a condition that a uh, committee felt they would like to see uh, implemented, then that is something they could send back as a recommendation to staff to say that uh, you know, bird reflective glass be requested to be a condition of site plan approval, staff would then be able to put that in, in the conditions of approval. Um, another one would be um, the ability for staff to uh, go, and we're already looking into this matter, of uh, seeing our ability to enter into, uh, have, have the applicant enter into a construction management plan uh, for the construction activities uh, during the, the period that construction is taking place in the site. So there's sort of two ways this can be done. I mean, the, the ones that we know that for sure we can implement, um, you, you can make those requests and we can just go away and do those. The ones that, that we're not quite certain of right now, for instance, the site plan, uh, sorry, the construction uh, management plan, uh, we may have to undertake uh, some uh, further research into that and either report back to you or uh, just communicate back to committee, yes, we were able to do that or no, we were not. So the option is there for committee on how they want to proceed with this under instruction to staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Park. So it's appropriate now if anyone from the proponents seem would like to speak. Actually, I'm getting corrected here because I see our solicitor, her hands up, Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, I did just want to make one quick point about the liaison committee. Legally, the city has no authority to 
enforce uh, a liaison committee or to require it as a condition of site plan approval. I think we did hear from the applicant this evening that they are willing to enter into that liaison committee, but that's certainly not something that the city would be able to enforce under the Planning Act. That's helpful, thank you. Mr. Tao. Yeah, I think staff answered most questions as so I was just gonna to speak to a couple things quickly. Um, with respect to the bird friendly glass and maybe Hamid can, can chime in here as well as the architecture. Uh, I understand that the proposed um, um, heights and the areas for which bird friendly glass is proposed is what's um, what originates of the Toronto Green Standard. So we're proposing to implement um, that, um, that standard, which speaks to that 16 meter height or the, the specific heights and locations. Um, but I'm not sure the rationale behind that, why that's the standard, if there's some sort of scientific reason behind it, but um, I understand that that is out of that, I think, bird-friendly best practices uh, glass document that is produced by the City of Toronto as part of their standard. So there seems to be some background to that, but if Mid wants to, if he knows and he's able to chime in on that, it's fine. Um, with respect to the pathways, so that, um, I guess I would maybe just split up the pathway into two sections. So there's the existing connection for the waterfront pathway that kind of traverses through the site and that will be maintained. And there were some good points that were brought up last year by FCC 40 with respect to some of those tight corners, stairs in a couple locations or one location. Um, and so we had communicated back to them earlier this year or late last year that those, um, there were reasons for it related to grading in those areas and getting some ramp grades that were accessible uh, slopes. But we did say that those are good points and that we would um, look at making some some of those changes for that connection that kind of goes through the site before you get to the pier. Um, and so I anticipate that we'll, we will hopefully be able to make some of those adjustments. Um, and I think that's the part of the pathway that would be more multi-use where you would have cyclists, for example, continuing to use that pathway, that portion of the pathway. Um, but then the pathway that goes out and around the pier, um, there are some limitations in terms of, uh, obviously it's a constrained space to providing wider than 1.5 meters for the entire length is challenging. Um, and it does kind of tie back into that five foot pedestrian pathway easement that was the source of um, why it was done originally. There is that agreement between the city and the landowner to do that. Um, but there is a, a, a much broader space at the end of the pier. So yes, there's a 1.5 meter walkway out and around, um, but at the end of the pier, there is a much broader space for the public to gather, linger, et cetera, if they would like. Um, so that's something that to, should be noted as well. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to touch on. So thank you. Oh, Hamid, I see is. Mr. Cassie, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, just to uh, to uh, chime in on the uh, the bird friendly uh, height requirement. There, the idea behind is the uh, is the uh, is the reflection of the landscape. So basically, the the reflection we see them up to a certain height, not beyond that. So it they make more sense up to a certain uh, certain height because that's where the you know the reflection of the trees of the surrounding environment that uh, the birds would be led to think that this is this is part of the landscape but it's uh, it's actually a glass so i think that's the 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 um the the idea behind uh, not requiring full height of the building just at a, up to a certain height and uh thank you All right, very good. So I see no other movement from uh, the, the applicant's team. Following our procedure, then, we do have an opportunity for councillors to ask additional questions before we move the motion on the floor. Uh, particularly, not to put her on the spot, but Councillor Doherty, you're here as the district councillor. I'm happy if you'd like to lead us off if you do have any other inquiries at this point. Thank you. Um... Um, well, I, I just want to thank everybody uh, in FC 4040 and who presented today and, and everyone actually who presented. There were a lot of incredibly professional presentations tonight with really well-phrased points and concerns. And the one that 
came up repeatedly is the, com the communication. So my question relates to that and what the next steps of communication are. We heard about a liaison committee um, and when, when, when can residents expect that uh, someone from uh, the development team would reach out to, to the condominium board? And so through you, Mr. Chair, so we, we do have, uh, we have been communicating with FCC 40. Uh, they had a, um, I'm not sure if they would call it a liaison group, that, but they had a group of uh, representatives from FCC 40 who had come together and um, with their lawyer, um, we had met with them last year um, and they had put together uh, a list of questions, comments, which we had provided a response back to. So I think those those lines of communication are open there. Um, I think for our part, um, at this point, we had responded to, to those comments and now really we're just waiting on site plan approval. Um, so should site plan approval be uh, granted, then at that point, um, there'd be the opportunity to, to reach out to them again and, and take up those issues. Because the next step for us, for the developer would then be taking these site plans and working on the building permit plans, which are the more detailed ones, which is the opportunity, I think, to talk about some of these things, talk about timing, et cetera, so. That would include some of the, the suggestions that we heard in Mr. Caldwell's presentation as well, right? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor. Anyone else at this point? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had one more question. Um, oh, so just yeah, um, through you, just going back to the snow removal and, and whatnot. So we have heaters and it melts the snow and that goes into storm water management system. Uh, because these towers are like right in the water, doesn't that mean that like the drain pipes would literally like go through the grates and into the pipes and directly into the water anyway? So like there's no there's no filtering at all. Like in my subdivision, the um, we have one stormwater pipe that goes into the ditches along Bath Road, right? So there's some um, a filtering capacity before it then lands into the big drain that goes under Bath Road into Lake Ontario. But because the piers are literally right in the water, like um, I think Ms. Smoka, like Smoka, she has a point that the water is like the snow is just literally going to turn to water with all the salt and any other grit and all that type of stuff directly into the lake when it goes to the storm pipe. So if Mike wants to answer, I, I'm happy to answer. Uh, maybe Mark, I'll, I'll just, you can supplement my answer here, but uh, in reviewing the stormwater management report uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Basically, there are a number of different items going on on the site. Um, the existing townhome development currently has uh, no quantity or quality control for their water. It either flows directly out through the pipes or if the pipes are overwhelmed, it goes overland right into the water. The um, pier, once it's developed, uh, there are various phases. Uh, again, this was reviewed and approved internally and matches with, I believe, the MECP requirements. Uh, but anything on the roadways, uh, which would be then melted down, which negates the need for salt um, to be used. So there's a, an obvious uh, advantage there, uh, would be directed to uh, the development piping system and catch basements, which would then lead to what's called a storm scepter. Um, it's just the, the name of it, I can't give you <laughs> much detail on it, but it then has a uh, quality control element to it, filtering, um, I believe it's called elevated quality, which is about 80% removal uh, of uh, materials inside and then filters out uh, into the uh, lake. Because it exists or located within the lake, there is no uh, requirement for quantity control. Um, and then I believe in major storm uh, events, there, if the sewer system is overwhelmed, 
it also has the same experience of overline flow without any control. Um, anything that is captured on the roof, um, I presume because of just the limited amount of, uh, of uh, material that gets mixed into the water, it goes straight down through, as you were saying, just straight through uh, the piping system and outlets into the, uh, into the lake without any controls. So I don't know if uh, Mark has anything to add to that, but in, uh, there is some quality control included with, uh, with the snow melting um, that would occur on site. Yeah, so the, thanks, Mike. And I think the only thing I would add is that it has gone through the CRCA process. So this is an area that the CRCA um, does review stormwater management. And so they have their requirements related to quality control for any waterfront property, which is essentially this as well. So yeah, anything that comes off of road sidewalks, et cetera, would be treated um, as with any other site um, for quality. Um, and part of the reason why the owner wants to use the snow melt system for all the roadways, including the existing main road, is to avoid or uh, limit the use of any salt on the site because salt um, is not really effectively removed through OGS units, through these oil grit separator storm scepter units. So um, by using the snow melt system, you don't have to use salt, which you know, makes it more environmentally friendly because you don't have to, you can't really effectively separate it before it goes into the lake. So that's why the snow melt system is also beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. All righty, thank you committee. So we'll move uh, to put the motion on the floor. And I see Councillor Hill, I recognize you right away, yes. So I just, I'm just moving the, uh, the motion. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. A seconder to get it on the floor. Councillor Chappelle. Okay. So we can have debate about that now. And there's Councillor Hill again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through your chair, I, I have a, a suggestion, but I just want to talk a little bit about, because I was really impressed with the, with the residents, uh, uh, comments. I think just like Councillor Doherty was, they really stuck to site plan. I was, you know, fairly, <laughs> I, I, I suspected that wasn't going to happen. I was really pleased to see that. And they also raised some, some really good questions. And uh, I know that um, um, uh, Mr. Park already spoke to a couple of those. And then we talked a little bit about the liaison committee. But we also have a big issue that's outstanding, and that's the uh, servicing and the, and the uh, gas. So what I'm suggesting, and I don't know if this requires a motion or not, but what I'm suggesting is that we, is that we recess this meeting until such time as we have the report that comes back to council uh, regarding the uh, uh, the servicing, uh, which would give uh, the uh, uh, applicant and our staff uh, time to, to deal with some of those uh, 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 good suggestions that came up tonight so that it could be incorporated perhaps into the report, uh, the final report that we would we, we would ultimately vote on when we when we uh, reconvene. So I'm, I'm suggesting that. I, I don't know if that requires a motion or not. I guess I'm, I'm looking for a little uh, guidance here from, uh, from the clerk. Sure, absolutely. Ms. Fawcett, I would like to know your take on that as well too. Is that an order or is it uh, a motion to defer or is it a pure recess? How does that all pan out? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I. I feel like on the spot, I'm not going to be able to give um, a full answer. My inclination would be that this should this item should be deferred and that we come back um, to deal with that. Should should the committee feel that that more information is required on the gas servicing and that a decision be made by council before they continue forward with the item? Um, however, if uh, you'd be willing to give me a five to 10 minute recess to further consider it, I, I can definitely do that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. We've also been sitting for another two and a half hours. So we'll recess for 10 minutes. Well, just, just uh, I, I just want, may, would it be useful if we just, is that something that, that the committee would entertain? Because if, 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 if not, then why do it? I, I'm definitely amenable to that as chair and I see lots of nodding and I think you made a good case for it already. So let's make sure that we're doing it right and okay. talk in 10 minutes, okay? So that's uh, 11.23. Thanks, Councillor Hill.
Okay, so it is 11.23. And I'd like to make the point that we always seem to get into the procedural weeds right as we're about to hit midnight. I don't think that's a coincidence, but it's important that we do this uh, within our rules of order and following the provincial statutes of the Planning Act. So I'm sure we can have a bit more time to question here with the clerk and the director of planning. We'll look to them, maybe Mr. Park to start if, if um, you're ready at this point or if we need five more minutes to sort this out. <clears throat> or Mrs. Clerk or Madam Clerk, you're here. It's, sorry, Mr. Chair, I just saw that um, Mr. Park just put himself on, on mute there. Um, we're going to ask for another five minutes if that's if that's possible. Oh, absolutely. Yes. OK, well, let's uh, just make it until 1130. Thank you.
All right, here we are again. So I think what we'll do is first look to, sorry, my screen is bouncing around with faces popping up. Little Hollywood squares action here. Where did Miss Fawcett go? Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, would you like to say anything additional at this point? Or I think it's appropriate if councillors have a few questions about the, the paths forward, if we could ask procedural questions, but you could maybe tee us up here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, I'm actually going to kick this over to uh, Mr. Park and ask that um, he provide uh, a little more context to the discussion before we get into any more procedural matters. Okay, fair enough, yeah. Okay, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, speaking to the matter around uh, UK and the report going to um, Council next week for consideration, um, to either defer or recess, and I'll let Elizabeth speak to those two processes in a second, is really not relevant to what's before committee tonight, because ultimately at the end of the day, in order for uh, this development to move forward, uh, several things have to happen. Uh, council has, would have to approve that, that funding for UK to do the gas line improvements. And that has to be in place in order for the applicant to pull their building permit, as well as an executed site plan agreement. So if, if, if it was deferred or recessed until council made its decision, it really doesn't come into play uh, to stop this. If, if council were to not approve the UK funding for the gas main, the project will not proceed. They will not be able to pull a building permit and it just sits as it is today. Okay, Mr. Park, I see Mr. or Councillor Hill. Um, yeah, questions are fitting. So, so because I think there's there's a little bit more to it than that, uh, Mr. Park, and I. So so yes, I, I completely agree that 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 couldn't we couldn't go forward without that. But but we've had some suggestions that I I'm not sure. And I guess I would I would again I'm going to defer to the clerk here. But you know if we we're going to incorporate these suggestions that came out tonight for you know I know we can't insist on a liaison committee. Uh, Ms. Morley already spoke to that. But there are some things that we th probably could sit down with the with the applicant and and kind of get sorted out, Be and that because that vote is is or because the vote around the servicing is going to come next week, it just gives us a little bit of latitude to kind of incorporate some of that into our final decision or whatever kind of, or even to draft an amendment that incorporates that uh, on the recommendation of of staff. And then we can do everything together at the same time. Uh, that's sort of how I, 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 I but I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't think we need to defer because I think if we, if we defer, then we have to go through all the processes of another public meeting, right? That's Where true. like, for example, had we not, um, had we not um, made the decision to extend the meeting, um, then we would have gone into, into a recess automatically, right? And, the, and at the request of the chair, we would reconvene. So basically what we're saying is at the request of the chair, we will reconvene as soon as the council's made its decision on the servicing. And then, and then hopefully staff, uh, and I, I guess we would be asking staff to bring back the uh, sort of the amendment that would incorporate whatever we can that came out of the discussions tonight, including actually the liaison committee. If the, if the applicant is, is in agreement to that, does that make sense? Um, it, it's certainly one way it could be approached. Uh, the other way would be to um, send the report back uh, to the director with the instruction that, um, you know, that uh, the entering into a site plan, uh, a construction management plan uh, be added as a condition. Um, you could certainly add that the approval of uh, the UK works be approved. Uh, prior to the, the agreement being executed, and that all the other matters that were raised uh, by points uh, by the, the speakers tonight be taken into consideration by the director when uh, preparing the final site plan approval. Can we do that? With, sorry, through you, Chair. Can we do that without without a, a, um, an amendment, or like can we do just do that as as giving offering direction? Um, that's my understanding, but I uh, motion is only um, would be necessary, I believe, if it's a zoning bylaw matter. 
you would just strictly do this as a direction uh, back to the director of planning services. Without need for further approval, I'll just jump in for clarification there, Mr. Park. I beg your pardon, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, without need for um, further approval, if we added that amendment. Uh, th that would be correct because you've provided your instructions. All right, I saw Councillor Neal's hand uh, raise a moment ago. Yes, I'm just curious, and this may be a question for Mr. Parker, or Ms. Morley. Um, is if we, if this fails to go ahead because council doesn't approve the gas, uh, does, is that, um, can that go to the tribunal for review? Or is that a totally different non-planning decision made by the city? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, that would be a totally non-planning related uh, decision made by the city because it's an infrastructure decision. Okay, that's that's um, good to know. More than you may wish to to add to that, but that would be my my understanding. Okay. Because anytime we can avo avoid the tribunal is a good thing. <laughs> Ms. Morley. Certainly the applicant would be in a position to appeal the city's failure to make a decision on the site plan application itself. But with respect to the infrastructure decision, that is not something that the tribunal would have jurisdiction over. I'm, I'm gonna ask another question of clarification then. If we were to amend, and tie in the UK approval, even to come back to the director and it were not to be uh, approved, the pipeline that is, does that mean the project fails in entirety or just this current site plan? The zoning would stand, but this site iteration would not. And if it were ever to come back, it'd have to be from square one. Is that right? If we amended the motion to include that conditional approval of site plan and it didn't go through? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that would be correct. Councillor Osanik or Chappelle, would you need further clarification on the different options before us? Okay, I'm going to ask one final question then. Um, procedurally, perhaps Mr. Park or Madam Clerk, if we were to recess, are we allowed to request additional information from staff without a formal motion. So if we recess under the understanding that we're waiting to see what happens at council and that additional information might be forthcoming about the potential liaison committee. Any thoughts on that? Because to be frank, I'm not sure how that works in terms of notification. If more information is coming about the file, we're going to make a decision on after we come back from recess. I see my colleague, Mr. Barr. Has oh, Mr. Time. Barr, thank you. Yeah. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. I can't answer the clerk related items, but I think one thing that's bouncing around in my brain tonight um, is a commitment from staff to address the items that have been raised this evening, specifically related to items like the construction management plan and liaison, uh, liaison committee and working to set those items up. So I don't think we need formal direction for some of these items, but these are something that staff can commit to through this site plan control review process as well in order to keep this application moving forward. But understand and hearing the resident concerns, we can commit to those items tonight and make sure that they form part of our approval process going forward so we can both keep this application moving as well as address the sensitive concerns that the residents have raised this evening about specific aspects of the future development of the site. Yeah, that sounds good. I guess what I'm wondering is how does the committee fit into that then? This evening, the committee would approve the recommendation that's on the floor and staff through uh, the final review of this application would commit to undertaking these items um, with the applicant in order to uh, address those specific items. So it would leave the committee and go back to the approval for the director, but with the understanding that staff would commit to these items uh, that we would bring them forward as part of the finalization of the site plan control agreement. And if council doesn't pass the pipeline, the site plan control agreement is scrapped and there only exists zoning. And should this one come forward again, it would have to come in years to come because it'd be reconsideration after it's failed. Thank you. And through you, Chair, uh, 
the, the, the agreement and site plan control agreement necessarily wouldn't be dead. They wouldn't be able to pull a building permit. So therefore they wouldn't be able to proceed through to construction and be able to get those permits that they need in order to construct the building. The applicants could go back and revisit to see if there is an alternative energy mix that they can use to facilitate construction of their site. Uh, but what we've heard so far is that the gas would be the important part to actually service this development. So the real crux of this at the end of the day, even through site plan control approval would be, um, you know, the inability to pull a building permit. So if appropriate servicing was not there, uh, they would not be able to pull that permit to construct this building. So uh, that is really the key crux of what we're uh, doing moving forward here. All right, so I'll give one last uh, opportunity for committee. Councillor Osanic, yeah, do you have a question? Right, so is this when, like, it looks like we're voting on this, right? And is this when I move the amendment for um, bird glazing glass requirement? I'm going to pause you for one second because it very well could be in that one second, but I'm just looking... I have a sense that committee is okay with trusting the director through this process with the things that we've heard tonight, taking staff on their word and knowing that there is that extra, the layer that Mr. Park has to ultimately approve. Councillor Hill. Well, would that not also include the bird glazing? Right, of the various issues. Okay, yes, yeah, so Councilor maybe I should just, maybe I should just clarify, so I'm not talking about just like the 12 meters. Um, what I wanna do is all floors, right? Because um, the residents have reminded me that we're on the migratory path, right? Uh, birds don't just cross and fly over Lake Ontario. They go through Kingston and around, you know, the east end of Lake Ontario or go through Buffalo, Toronto, going through the west end of Toronto and, or sorry, of Lake Ontario. And um, Kingston's like the far east end, like we got the migratory birds and these two towers are right into the water. Mr. Park. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. I think the way we can look at that is we will look at industry practices where uh, bird, friendly, bird friendly glass is already being used uh, in uh, high rise developments such as the city of Toronto where they do have guidelines as uh, one of the speakers uh, from the applicant side spoke to earlier as what has been accepted as the um, industry standard for the height that that goes in at and uh, that that would take into account the migratory birds in lakefront settings such as Lake Ontario. But we can certainly undertake to make sure the industry standards are being adhered to. Okay. Um... So I just want to put then in the minutes that, although we just heard 12 meters, the Canadian Standards Association 2019 is 16 meters, and um, New York City um, is 22 meters, or maybe it's the entire building. I was doing Googling during the break, and we have to keep in mind that the North American bird populations have dropped by more than 25%, and we're on the migratory birds you know, of just our common birds, you know, 3 billion of our birds, including common species um, are now gone. And that's just from bird, what is this? This is Ontario Nature. It just came in the mail to me this week, Nature Canada. They're the ones that are really pushing bird friendly cities. Okay, to answer your question though, Councillor Rosanic, I would say if you do have a specific number in mind because three numbers were just proposed, you would have to make that clear because if staff are looking at a different standard than you had intended. Yes. So I'm not trying to open the kettle of right. fish that is a thousand amendments, but if you do have something specific you're trying to, to say, um, you've said it officially into the minutes, I suppose, but just clarity is helpful. Right, all floors, because this these two towers are in the water and we are on the migratory migratory bird path of North America. So I'm gonna to look to the clerk then. Do we need to put that officially as an amendment?
Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, again, I'm going to defer to um, Mr. Park, who is the one who's responsible for the agreement, just to uh, see whether or not that is something that he can undertake, or if that's something that he wants to get explicit direction from the committee on. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair. It's something that we would undertake. Um, the one area I, I would ask that we uh, look at is um, trying to determine what the appropriate height is. Uh, to request it on the entire height of the building may not necessarily be the most practical. Um, I'm certainly willing to look at what the practices are across uh, you know, North America um, for those uh, standards. Um, and then I would be willing to implement those. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Neal. Yes, I know uh, Mr. Barr said we should just approve this. And if we uh, say no to the gas tomorrow, it's not going to happen. Uh, that um, if, if there's a specific recommendation, to facilitate this development, I want to, I'm quite happy to vote against it. And I'm just curious what the consequences are if, uh, if we don't support uh, the idea of approving uh, the site plan that's before us. Mr. Park or, or Ms. Morley seem to be asking lots of legal questions tonight, but. Thank, thank, oh, thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. I'll certainly respond to that and uh, Ms. Morley can um, uh, follow up with any comments. The applicant does have the ability to appeal the site plan application uh, to the land tribunal for uh, a refusal. So that, that is an option they could certainly exercise. Ms. Morley, did you care to add? So as Mr. Park said, the applicant would have a right of appeal to the tribunal. And I think it's important to point out what was mentioned by Councillor Hill earlier is that the zoning is in place for this development. What the tribunal would be considering is the plans and drawings of the development and whether to approve, approve those and what conditions to impose on those. So the tribunal would not be making a decision to not approve this development. In all likelihood, they would be looking at the plans and drawings and choosing which conditions should apply themselves. And they would be looking very strictly at the provisions of section 41 of the Planning Act, which outline a very exhaustive list of things that they can consider on a site plan. So it's important to know that you, through this process, you may obtain more conditions than you would otherwise get from the tribunal. Councillor Neal, did you have a follow-up or is that good for you for now? No. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to recap what I'm hearing, which is we have the director's word and we uh, know he's a man of integrity and it's on in the minutes and it's very clear in the recommendation and the process that we've heard outlined that he has one more uh, look at this, even though it's not a public process. We also know that the vote before council next week hinges this development on it. And, and perhaps I'll ask this as a question because I could be corrected if I'm wrong. Ms. Morley said at some point earlier in the evening that the city can't actually impose the working group as much as it seems advisable and all parties have expressed interest and the desire to move forward in a trusting and good way. But because we can't impose it, because the vote for the pipeline is coming up anyway, and because Mr. Park will see this through regardless, I actually think that voting on this now is not an issue. Initially, I thought that getting some of these additional considerations uh, formally baked in at this point would be helpful, but those three things actually taken together in my mind has kind of uh, swayed me otherwise. So unless other counselors have comment, I think we'll call the vote, but I will give an opportunity because it's on the floor for debate 
one more round. And I return the chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you. All right. So then we'll call the vote as um, initially uh, put forward in the recommendations in the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed? That's Councillor Osanic and Neil opposed, carrying uh, three to two there. All right, so I will grab my agenda back up. Um, I see no other motions. Are there any notices of motion? No other business. Note some correspondence, both the ones on the original agenda and the additional and the adds. Our next meeting is at 6 p.m. on July 7th. And with that, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Hill. Councillor Osanic, all in favor? Councillor Chappelle, are you opposed to adjourn? All right, okay. <laughs> Councillor Chappelle opposed. Um, but we still adjourn anyway, and thank you everyone for your patience and to everyone who participated tonight. Take care, bye.